What is web development? Web development is the ability to create a website for your laptop, tablet, or a phone. So typically we create one website that looks and acts well on all of these devices in the exact same code base. And this is called responsive web design. So whenever you hear the term responsive web design, it really just means the website looks good on a desktop, on a laptop, on a TV, on a phone, things like that. Now we write code, typically in English, but not always, that tells programs what to do. And there's a certain way to write code and it's a little bit different for each programming language. And those differences, those little style tweaks, like if we use curly braces or semicolons, things like that, that's called programming syntax. And so it's really just the, how do we write it? It's like writing apostrophes in English, apostrophes, periods, question marks, things like that. That's sort of English syntax. And in programming, we have sort of the same thing, uh, but it's not quite the same as like writing a paragraph. Now websites are made up of four main components. The first one is HTML. This is your bone structure of your web page. Every single site uses HTML. CSS, that's cascading style sheets. That's the part that makes your website look beautiful and full of color and have nice images and, and things like that. And then there's JavaScript, and this is the third component. And JavaScript is the interactivity that happens when you click a button or you type in a box and something else happens, some sort of event happens. So whenever you click on something or you type somewhere and, and you can see things moving around, that's JavaScript. Lastly, we have a server side component. And this is the hidden code that executes on a server when your browser loads a website. For example, you could use Python or PHP or Node.js. How to get into web development. So I get a lot of questions all the time, just because I teach so many people. But I also get these questions very often. These are probably the most common questions I get. First of all, is, is it hard to get into web development? Do I need to be super smart to start coding? Am I too old to learn how to code? Do I need a college or university degree? And is it expensive? So let's go through each of these one by one. Is it hard to get into web development? And the honest answer here is no, it's not hard. It's a lot like learning how to cook. You learn a thousand small things, but not one giant thing. Now it will take time to learn, but it's not going to be hard to learn. And you don't have to memorize the thousand small things either. You just have to remember how to find those answers on the internet. Do I need to be super smart to start coding? Honestly, no. Any normal person can do it. And that's what makes it so appealing to everybody. People think coders are as smart as Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. And honestly, that's just not true. We're not that smart. We just know how to use our tools really, really well, and we know how to find answers on the internet. So all we do is hop on Google when we get stuck and look for something. And someone else has probably ran into a similar solution or a similar problem and found a solution and posted on the internet. So we can leverage other people's experience there. Now, the brutal and honest truth about this, prof this profession, my profession, and hopefully one day your profession, is that honestly, you don't need to be very smart. And don't really need to memorize too much. You just need to know how to find the answers. Am I too old to learn how to code? I get this one a lot, and this one actually drives me insane. Okay, so I've seen students in their 70s learn how to code, and they've been doing it very well for several years now. I've seen people in their 60s learn how to code and get a job in web development agencies and succeed. They're doing very well. So in summary here, you do not need to be young to learn how to code. That is a myth. Next, do I need a college or university degree? No, that is not necessary. So even though college or university might be helpful to understand how computers work and how to get into computer science and some of the mathematics for like machine learning and stuff, when you're making a website, you don't need to know any of that stuff. And a good example is me. I taught myself how to code at the age of 10 in about 1999. No college would have taken a 10 year old. And today I've still not attended college or university and I've worked with big names like Mozilla, NYPR, the National Health Service, and NASA. So just think about that. You do not need a college or university degree. Lastly, is coding expensive? Now, coding is only as expensive as you make it. If you like the finest tools, if you like to pay for things, it's going to be expensive. But the truth is, most of our tools are 100% free. Web development education can be expensive if you attend a boot camp or if you pay for a mentor. But your best route is to take the inexpensive route. So take online courses such as this one, read blog posts and read tutorial websites. And if you have a laptop or a desktop already, really it shouldn't cost you more than about $100 to get into this. So what do you need to get started? Well, you do need a laptop or a desktop. 
No, you cannot efficiently code on a phone. I'm going to tell you that right now. A lot of people say or ask, hey, Caleb, can I code on my phone? And the answer technically is yes, but it's going to be very painful, very slow. It's not efficient. You won't be able to learn as much as you possibly can. So you need a laptop or you need a desktop. You need something with a full keyboard on it. Next, you need a text editing program. I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but these are always free. And lastly, you need internet access, and chances are you're watching this online, you're probably streaming this, so you likely have good enough internet to get started. What does it take to get into web development? First of all, it takes determination. Learning to code is not hard, but it's big. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say this again. You're going to be learning about a thousand small steps, and most of these you can Google. You don't actually need to remember all of them. But taking a thousand small steps, you know, again, it's not hard. It's just big. You'll need to learn how to deal with overwhelm. There is a lot to learn. And again, it's all small stuff, but it can feel very overwhelming just because there's so much of it. So don't try to learn all of it at once. Learn how to code in steps. Take baby steps. I suggest learning HTML first, and we'll get into this a little bit later as well. Support groups are your best friend. You do not need a personal mentor to start. Although if you have a friend who's willing to teach you how to code, that's fantastic. But honestly, you don't need that. Find a support group where you can ask questions without being judged. I recommend the Learning to Code Facebook group. It's free. It has over 55,000 members who can answer pretty much every web development question that comes to mind. And you can ask any question at all. All right, it's also going to take tenacity. You will have hard days. That's normal. It still happens to me, and I've been doing this for over two decades now. But you need to push through those hard days. Now, to do that, I suggest building a habit where you learn just three new things about web development every day. Even if they're small, useless facts, you're still building up that, that habit, that sort of ability to continue learning every single day, even when you don't feel like it. That's really, really important. Lastly, practice until it hurts. Practice, practice, practice. Like anything in life, coding is a skill that gets easier with practice. And once you have enough practice from tutorials and courses and other things, make sure you start working on your own ideas. Because if you solve real-world problems, chances are you have an idea that's tackling some sort of real-world problem, you'll run into real-world coding problems and their solutions. And that's valuable. That's what's going to get you a job in the future, is being able to tackle those kinds of problems and find solutions for real-life problems. Web development tools. First up, we need a text editor. A text editor is really just a special program that doesn't add like hidden data to your files. So if you ever use Microsoft Word and you can like put tables and stuff in there and you can embed images and stuff, we don't want any of that. That has extra hidden da data behind the scenes. We don't want that. Now, I highly recommend downloading and installing VS Code. It's free. It's popular. It's very powerful. And again, it's free. And you can use it on Mac, Windows, Linux, pretty much every operating system out there. Next, you need browsers. Different browsers render content differently. So if you can right now, I would highly suggest just pausing this video and going and installing Google Chrome. Download and install Mozilla Firefox. If you're on a Mac, download Safari. You probably already have it if you're on a Mac. Unfortunately, I don't believe it's available for Windows users, at least not at this point in, in time. And lastly, get Microsoft Edge. You want these four main browsers to test your websites on. Next up, you need a command line program. Now, luckily, every computer has a command line program built in by default. On Windows, your command line tool is called CMD, command. On Mac, your command line tool is called Terminal. And on Linux, your command line tool is called Bash. Lastly, you do need one more thing to efficiently learn how to code. You need internet access. All of humanity's knowledge is at your fingertips as long as you have internet access. So for that reason, it's important to have internet. We do a lot of searching for answers on the internet as well as web developers. We don't know all the answers. We don't memorize the solution to everything. We try to figure it out and sometimes we forget things. I even forget basic things sometimes. You just hop on Google and ask your question in Google or in a Facebook group. How websites are created. Okay, first of all, there's two sort of things we need to know. I guess we don't really need to know right now, but let's cover it anyways. There's scripting and programming languages. So a scripting language is like throwing instructions into some sort of machine, and it just sort of does what you want it to do. And that's very similar to a programming language. But a scripting language is kind of like putting popcorn into a popcorn-making machine, and it just like pops your popcorn for you. 
whereas a programming language is like being able to program the popcorn machine. Now we write all of our code in a text editor that satisfies the program's ability to read your code. And that program is your browser. So if we said right in here, less than b greater than hello world less than slash b greater than in HTML, it would look like this, it would be bold. This right here, this b and this b tells it to be bold. These are instructions for what your browser needs to do. Next up, you need a text editor. And again, you want one that doesn't add hidden data to your file. So don't use Microsoft Word or anything like that. I highly recommend downloading and installing VS Code. Again, it's free, popular, and very powerful. So if you haven't, I would really like if you could just pause the video here, go download and install VS Code, uh, because we're going to need it at the end of this course. Websites are created when we write code. So writing code is a lot like writing a paragraph. It just looks a little bit different. And we call this syntax. So you can still read the code, and it's like reading a different language, but your brain still understands what's going on. We follow rules that programs like a browser are looking for. For example, if we said b hello world slash b, or i hello world slash i, that's going to output hello world in bold, or hello world in italics. What you see and interact with on a website is really only made up of three components, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML and CSS are considered scripting languages, and JavaScript is an actual programming language. And there are some differences, but honestly, it doesn't really matter what those differences are right now. We can get into that at some point in the future. But pretty much every website uses these, these three technologies today. HTML files are saved with a .html file extension, CSS files are saved with a .css file extension, and JavaScript files are saved with a .js file extension. And for the most part, that's the biggest difference when it comes to just managing our files. It's just the file extension. As soon as a browser says, as sees that there's a .js or .html file, for the most part, it can figure out what to do next. And we write all of this in a text editor, and we just use different file extensions. Let's look at programming languages. When you hit a website, a server is sending you that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But the code that executes on the server can be a completely different coding language. It can be Python, PHP, Node.js, Java, C, etc., etc. It can be really any language, and you're not going to know what that language is. But we also write that code in a text editor. And again, the text editor could be VS Code. Now, one more component that we're not really going to touch on too much in this course is databases. So when you try to log into your website, or any website, your data is sent to the server, so that's the code that you cannot see, we call that backend code, and it talks to a hidden database. And that database is supposed to be hidden to keep your data nice and secure. These databases are what store your passwords, your usernames, your email addresses, which photos you up uploaded, which posts you liked, so on and so on. Basically, anytime it remembers that you did something at some point, that's being saved in a database. And a database is really just like the memory of a website. Code you can't see. All HTML, CSS, and JavaScript can be seen by your end users. So never store secrets in there. If you right click on pretty much any web page and click view source or go to, I think it's usually file view source, you can actually see the raw HTML, CSS styling, and the JavaScript. That's all considered front end code. And again, back end code is what runs on your server and you cannot see it. We don't have access to that but front-end code is completely accessible to your users. So again, do not put passwords or anything like that in there. No, no sensitive data, really. Front-end versus back-end coding. So I touched on this in the last video, but front-end coding is made up purely of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. These small files are sent to your browser, and your browser then reads them, interprets them, and then displays them for you. And if you right-click on any page, and select view source or inspect, you can actually see the entire front end code. It's completely available to you. Next up, we have back end code. Back end code is a programming language like Python, PHP, Node.js, Java, something like that. It usually produces some sort of HTML to send to your browser, but the logic behind the scenes is never actually exposed. Whereas with front end code, that logic can be completely exposed. You honestly don't really need to know too much of the difference right now because when you get started, the first thing you should learn is just HTML. So you don't have to worry about learning all of it. Just start at the beginning with HTML. Now, backend code is really useful for securely handling passwords, credit card numbers, and other sensitive data, things that you don't want to be present for anyone in the world to see. And backend code usually connects to a database where your data is saved for a period of time. 
This lets you log into a website like Facebook after, let's say, six months. Your login information was saved in a database. That data was processed using a backend programming language, and then all of a sudden you're logged in. There's a little bit more to it, but again, you don't have to be too concerned with that right now. Full stack web development. Full stack web development is front end plus back end plus a database. That's all that means. A full stack web developer can write front end code and back end code. So this usually means they write a lot of JavaScript along with a back end language such as Python. So in this example, Python executes on the server and JavaScript executes on the browser. And every time you hit a website, there is a server doing some sort of processing somehow behind the scenes. Now, one thing to note is a backend language can dynamically create HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as well. Let's talk about the stack. A stack is a term we use to talk about all the technologies that a company is using, and stacks can be different. So two popular stacks is LAMP and MERN. LAMP is a common stack. It's Linux, Apache, MySQL for the database, and PHP or Python for the backend. And MERN is another common one. This one is pretty much all JavaScript. It's MongoDB, Mongo Database, Express, React.js, and Node.js as the backend language. A full stack web developer is usually one who writes front end and back end code, but often doesn't have specialization in all areas. But they can do a little bit of everything. So typically, a full stack developer specializes in one or two languages, but can still work on other languages. For example, I specialize in writing Python, but I can also write JavaScript as well. Working with teams. Now this is absolutely vital. Web developers work with many other web developers these days. That's completely normal. So if you're trying to get into web development to avoid working with people, unfortunately, that's just not a reality anymore. That was normal 20 years ago, but not today. So being able to write code that you and your team can access and work on together is absolutely vital. In order to break into web development, you're going to need to know how to work with other people, and they're going to need to know how to work with you as well. Now, we use a program called Git. Git is a version control and collaboration tool that developers use to basically share their code and go back in time in case they made a mistake. Now, we tend to dump our code into a Git-based service like github.com, where other developers can download the code and make updates. GitHub.com and GitLab.com are the two leading Git websites right now, but there's also other ones out there like Bitbucket, but they're not as popular anymore. Now, once again, and I cannot stress this enough, but Git is a vital part of web development. Its importance is often undervalued, but I can promise you right now, you'll be using it with every single team that you work with in the future. And just to reiterate, the reason why it's so important is because you could write some code, and then I could write some code, and we could share it, we could merge it together, we could make one code base out of two different pieces of code on two different computers. So how it works is actually pretty simple. You can, let's say, code for like an hour, and you can save your progress in this thing called a commit, and then you can save it on github.com. Now, if tomorrow you realize you made a really bad mistake, and you want to go back to whatever you did today, you could do that with Git. Or if you accidentally deleted all your code on your computer, you would have a permanent backup. Now, this is called distributed software. And the nice thing about that is other people can pick up where you left off. So if you're working across different time zones, you can work on a particular feature, and a little bit later during the day, someone else can pick up exactly where you left off. Let's talk about open source. So what is open source? Open source code is code that people have written that they're literally giving away for free, or at a, bare, at a bare minimum, they let you see what the source code is, and they maybe have some sort of license that you can use their code as well. But you can still see the code. So a good example is with like backend code on a website, you cannot see what the developers have written. But if the code is on github.com, and it can be stored in this thing called a repo, which is short for repository of code, then you can see what they're up to. You can see all the code. You can see if there's any sort of security vulnerabilities. You can see what they're doing with your data. Now, open source is incredibly, incredibly important. Most employers like seeing that you can actually use Git and GitHub. And because most open source code is available on GitHub, that's kind of important. But you'll also get bonus points for open source contributions, meaning you wrote some code that went into someone else's open source project. And that's just called a contribution. And that shows future employers that you're able to work with other people, that you're able to follow other people's rules because maybe they have certain rules for their source code, and that you're able to use Git and GitHub. Lastly, 
open source is everywhere. So believe it or not, most interactions you've had on the internet are likely because of open source code. The internet's a free and open place where you can create and share pretty much anything with anybody. And web developers are the people who are often responsible for making that sharing possible. Do not reinvent the wheel. If you want to add a big feature to your future website, look for open solutions first, open source solutions. There is no reason you need to duplicate the effort that someone has already put in. Honestly, use other people's work if it fits your needs. That's why they open source their project really in the first place, is so that other people can leverage what they've worked on. So let's take a look at an example here. I'm going to close this down in just a moment and open up my browser, and we're going to take a look at slick.js. It's a common JavaScript library for creating amazing carousels of images. So let's see why this is important to leverage existing open source work. So this is just my browser, and I'm going to type into Google slick.js. And this is the first one we want here. The last carousel you will ever need. Now this is what a carousel is. Right? These could be different images. You could move multiple images at once, a responsive display, variable width. So if your images are different sizes, it will adjust automatically. It has adaptive height, has captions and stuff in there. You can actually see my even my arrow is moving so it stays centered. There's center mode, which is pretty nice. But if you needed to add this to a website, you could write this on your own, and that would be somewhat of a nightmare because these are not super easy to create. But if we go up to get it now, it says view it on GitHub. Okay, let's view this on GitHub. So I'm in just on github.com here, and I'm zoomed in, that's why it looks so big. And I click on slick, and if I go to slick.js, I can see all the source code. So there's 88 kilobytes of data in the source code, 3037 lines. Now, if we just keep scrolling, we can see that there's like a lot of logic, a lot of different things going on in here. But if we scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see there is 3037 lines of code. And if you use this person's code, you do not have to write 3000 lines of code. You don't have to put the effort in to figure out all the edge cases. Does it work on all the different browsers? Does it look great? Is it responsive? Do all the features work across every browser? Things like that. We know that this is tried and tested. We don't have to worry about this not working. So I'm just gonna scroll back up to the top here. Go back over to, ah, look at this. Uh, 26,100 people have starred this and there are over 5,000 forks. So 5,400 people have basically copied this code base into their GitHub account so that, that they can modify it. But again, the big power in open source is being able to leverage other people's code. Okay, let's get started writing some code. So in order to get started, we need to download a text editor such as VS Code. You're going to need that. You're going to need to download Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Apple Safari, or Microsoft Edge web browsers. Try to get all four if you can, but if you're on Windows, you probably cannot get Safari. Then here's what I want you to do, and I'm gonna demonstrate this in just a moment. I want you to open your text editor and create a new .html file. And then if you want to dive in from here and really get into all sorts of coding stuff, I highly suggest learning HTML first. It's easy, should only take you about three days to really understand how HTML works. And then you can play with CSS to make your website look beautiful. Uh, I've also got courses on both of these subjects. Do a search for Caleb Tallinn and you'll see them in my profile. So I'm gonna open up my VS Code. And let's just make this a wee bit bigger here. So if you open up VS Code and you don't have this, you'll probably see something along these lines. It might look a little different, different colors, because I have a specialized theme in here. But you can always go to File, New File. That's just out of my recording area, but it's right at the very top there. And it's going to create just an untitled document. And I'm going to zoom in. Now I'm just going to go to File and Save. And I'm going to save this to my desktop. I'm going to call this Hello World. Dot HTML. Now in here, all you have to do is type something like this. h1 hello world slash h1. Now this is HTML, and this is HTML, and this is just called plain text. So let's go ahead and save that file again. 
And let's go back to Firefox because that's the browser I was using. And let's go to, yeah, let's open a new tab. I might not need to open a new tab here. If we go to file and then we can open a file. And if I go to my desktop, we can see there's hello world.html. Let's go ahead and open that. And it says hello world in big letters. Now, comparatively, that's going to be hard to tell that they're big letters. So let's create a paragraph. Paragraph in here, slash P. Again, I just saved that. And if I refresh this page, paragraph in here, and hello world is in big text. And I'll zoom in again, and you can see the difference here. If you do that, you've effectively created your first web page. So go ahead and give that a shot. Remember, you need that .html file extension. It can be called really anything. It didn't have to be hello underscore world. It could be anything you want. Uh, just write something like this. You can even just literally copy exactly what I have written here, save it into a .html file, open up your browser, and then go to File Open, and it will show your website for you. All right, first things first. Let's take a look at what a browser is. So what is a browser? A browser is a program that asks a website for information. This ask is called a request. And when the request is completed, the website returns an answer called a response. It's a lot like when you pick up the phone and you call your mom or your dad or your best friend, they pick up their end of the phone, they say, hello, that's the response. Now the response has data in the form of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It can also include things like images and and other forms of data, but we're not really going to touch too much into what that is. But really, you just need to know that the response has this thing called a payload, and it sends back files. And then your computer downloads all of these little tiny files, and your browser is the program that reads them, pieces them all together, and makes your beautiful website. Now, when it pieces things together, that's called rendering. So it's going to try to render the final output. Now, there are four major browsers. There's actually thousands and thousands of browsers out there. But there's four major ones, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Apple Safari, and Microsoft Edge. But again, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of smaller, lesser known web browsers available. Your phone might even come with a different one that's not one of these four. What does your browser do? So your browser collects information, and its job is to display it. Now, when it collects information, it's actually just asking a server, hey, can I have some information? The server says, yep, you can have this information, sends the files, your computer then downloads them or your browser will download them, piece them all together in a nice way and kickstart all the code. And that sort of creates your nice interactive website. Not all browsers are the same. That should actually say not, not now. Not all browsers are the same. So what works on one browser may not necessarily work on another browser. So if you ever stumble on a website that seems broken in, let's say, Google Chrome, try opening it in Firefox or vice versa or Apple Safari or Microsoft Edge. Just try it in another browser because some, sometimes the rendering engines behind the scenes don't work the exact same. They're supposed to, but they don't always. Your browser's job is also to communicate. It's responsible for the communication slash transactions between your computer and the website. And again, it's like picking up the phone and dialing your best friend you need to wait for them to actually answer the phone, say hello, and then you can start a conversation. What are web requests? A request is simply asking for information. So web requests are when you ask for information from a website. You're simply asking for the files that you need to display the website. And often this is called a handshake. So let's take a look at how this works. It starts off by going to a website like google.com. Your browser then asks google.com for the data it needs to display the page nicely. Now this whole process is called a request, and actually when it sends you the information back, it's called a response, but we'll touch on that in just a little bit. Requests can have sizes as well. So a request can be literally any size. Google.com is a small request, or really any website. We're just going to the website and saying, hey, can we have the files? And then the website determines what it should send back. But that that first request, that first handshake, is usually pretty small. Now, if you load up something like Instagram.com, every image will be a new request. So as you scroll through your Insta feed, it's going to load more and more images, and that's going to be a new request every single time. Or if you go on Facebook.com, every comment you make, every like that you click, those are all requests. It's a different type of request, and again, we'll get into that in just a little bit. 
but all of those are called requests. Anytime you send a little piece of data to a website to either ask for information or even to ask to delete information or update information or to save information, those are all requests. And these are called request types. So sometimes a request comes in the form of asking for information. And this is called a get request. But it can also be in the form of asking to save information. Now technically, those are called post requests. There's also a delete request to delete information and a put or patch request to update information. And once again, a normal handshake is just a get request. That's the most common one. And this is actually getting into RESTful APIs. Now, if you're interested in APIs, I have a course on RESTful APIs. Feel free to go and take a look at that after this course. Now, one thing to note is that everything has to travel through the internet. Smaller requests and responses means less bandwidth. It means it can travel through the internet, through the wires that are sent all across the globe, through your Wi-Fi. It can serve that a lot faster because it's a lot smaller. It's a lot like this. Think about the last time you had to download a one gigabyte file versus downloading a one kilobyte file, right? The one gigabyte file takes a little while. It could take several hours depending on your internet speed, but a one kilobyte file, even if you have fairly slow internet, is still a very, very fast download. Requests are the exact same thing. The request life cycle. Let's take a look at how this begins. When you ask for information from, from a website, you're actually doing a lot more than that. When you ask, let's say my website, caleb.io, for information, there's a domain mapping behind it. So caleb.io actually points to an IP address, and that IP address connects to my server. So you're not actually requesting information directly from caleb.io. It's just sort of masking it so that you don't have to remember IP addresses. And then how it ends. The server is going to accept my request or your request. It's going to understand what it's supposed to output and sends files like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, all that other stuff that makes your website look good in this thing called a response. Lastly, the browser downloads these files and saves them onto your computer. And if it has to download it more than once, sometimes it'll just use the old, the old files, and that's called a cache. It's going to then piece all these files together and render your content. What? are server responses anyway. So a response happens when a server responds to your web request. A response happens after the request is made, so it always goes request and then response. And responses can be pretty much any format, but typically it's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or plain text or JSON for like an API. If you don't know what an API is, honestly, that's okay. You can just ignore that bit. But if you're interested in learning a little bit more about APIs, there are some cases where an API, also known as an application programming interface, will send XML or JSON formatted data. Now, typically, this is, it's kind of like plain text text. It's not really specialized markdown too much. It has some rules, but not too many rules. But the nice thing about that is because it's sort of plain texty, that means there's not much to interpret and your browser can deal with this a lot faster or your server even could deal with this a lot faster, and then render HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever it needs to do. Now often, JavaScript or a server programming language like Python is going to handle these API responses. Again, if you don't know too much about APIs, if you're brand new to web development, don't worry about this part right now. So as an example, when you load up Instagram.com, you're making a request to the website to load the initial data. As you scroll down, it loads more and more images dynamically so that the first request can always be small and fast. It'll, it really only shows you or tries to get like two or three images, but it's not going to save a thousand images or it's not going to ask for a thousand images because that's going to be really slow to load. Your request is going to be a pretty small request payload and that response is also going to be a fairly small response payload. And that just means that, for example, Instagram.com can load really, really fast. Now, as you scroll down the page, you're going to see that more images show up, and sometimes it's so fast you don't even notice. That second request, third request, fourth request, when you click load more on any website or you scroll down on Instagram, is usually an API endpoint that returns JSON or XML, and the reason is because both of them are a lot more lightweight than HTML. Then your browser reads the JSON response, for example, JavaScript takes over, and it says, oh, I need to display more photos, and it dynamically creates your HTML structure for you and adds it to the page. And as soon as it's added to the page, your browser then takes over for JavaScript and says, oh, I need to make another request. And then the cycle repeats. The server says, oh, there's a request coming in for this particular image. Serve that image. 
Now on the topic of images and other assets like images, each one is likely to be its own request. So the browser creates a new request for each image file to download. The server sends a request with the image data, and again, your browser then displays that image. Though technically there are ways to bundle responses together for a faster one-time payload response. This way you can just ask the server once and it will send all the images all at the same time so it doesn't have to go one by one by one. And again, that just makes that response payload faster. And the reason for that is because if you think about driving to and from work or to and from the hospital or to and from your house, there's a lot of travel time in the internet. And so if you can reduce the travel time and just carry all the images in one load, then it's going to be a lot faster. Interpreting HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So these are the most common response data types. So when you make a request and you get a response from a server, you're likely going to be getting HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Your browser's job is to download each one of those files. But the browser also has these things called engines. And so these engines have certain rules for HTML. They have different rules for CSS, and they have different rules for JavaScript. If your browser thinks it's opening a JavaScript file, it'll use the JavaScript engine to read and interpret and make your website interactive. Likewise with CSS and HTML. So if it realizes that there's a CSS file, a cascading style sheet file that is, it's going to try to interpret that and make your website look good. And so they have different purposes. Once all the files are downloaded, you know, as best as they possibly can, it's going to piece them all together. And again, it's going to try to display your website or it's going to perform a render. But at some point, JavaScript is going to take over the browser just because the browser has a particular purpose, but JavaScript also has its own purpose. So after the initial response is rendered or, or displayed in your browser, most of the time, JavaScript is going to take over. Not all the time, and sometimes there's some cooperation between JavaScript and your browser. JavaScript can tell the browser to make more requests on the fly by dynamically adding links, images, and other assets to your page or by directly communicating with the browser and creating a new request. So JavaScript can make its own requests, but your browser can also make requests too. Viewing your requests and responses. So to view any sort of request and response, you're going to need a modern browser. I recommend Chrome or Firefox for this. And then I'm going to demonstrate in just a second how I can see all the responses from a website like google.com. So you're going to want to pay close attention because you'll be trying this in the next video. So I'm just going to get out of this and go over to google.com. And so this is just the regular Google website. And what I can do is right click, go to inspect. And you're going to see these options in here. Now yours might be a light color mode. So I've got dark mode on. And this might actually show up on the right side or the left side. But either way, you're going to see sort of these options here. For us, we're going to want to go over to the network tab. And we're not going to see anything in here. And I have mine filtered by CSS already. Let's go ahead and filter that by all. And if you don't see anything, that's totally fine. This is going to process all the requests that are coming in right now from the time you open this to any time you close it. So let's go ahead and just click refresh. And we can see all these requests were coming in. And so there's a lot of different things in here. We have a document, which is HTML. We've got a PNG, that's an image. WebP, that's also an image. We have a plain text one in here. We've got a text HTML. We've got a script in here as well. We've got all sorts of stuff that we can see. And maybe what I'll do is I'll just make this a touch bigger. So if we wanted to see an image, we could right click and then go to open in new tab. And that's the image that it loaded. So we now know that Google made a request for its own logo. Let's take a look at another one here. Right click open in a new tab. And this is what's called a sprite. So it's one big image with all these little symbols in it. And then it uses CSS to sort of display the images, like just a particular part of it. So like just the notification sign. Now the benefit to doing this is it's making one request for the image instead of making one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, I don't know, 20, 25 requests for all these different images. It just has to do the one. And so that's significantly faster. And that's how Google loads so fast, is it really optimizes these request response life cycles. Now you can also filter by JavaScript. So let, let's see what happens when I type in here, K-A-L-O-B. And you can see in here that it's doing a search for Q is equal to K, Q is equal to K-A, Q is equal to K-A, 
L, and as it types, it makes a new request every single time. Now this is all JavaScript. This is not your browser. This is JavaScript doing this. And this is using a thing called Ajax or the Fetch JavaScript API. If you don't know what those are, that's honestly okay. We can look at just JavaScript requests. So these are the files that we requested from JavaScript. We didn't request any CSS at the moment. I don't know why that's, that doesn't seem right. I guess there's no CSS in there. That probably means if we go into here, right click and view page source, we're going to see all the CSS in here. And there it is. All the CSS is in the page. So it wasn't loading any CSS files. It came with the HTML document. Interesting. We can also see all the different images, medias, fonts, documents, web sockets, manifests, all these other things. Now we can also see, if I just go back to all, how long it took to get, what the file size is. We can filter by the file size here. We can see the biggest file here was the document itself. That's the entire page. It was about 61 kilobytes and it took 140 milliseconds to get. And again, the idea here is that I went to google.com. Google.com is going to point to some form of IP address. That's going to connect to some server that they have. That server is then going to say, oh, okay, well, serve this HTML document and serve all these other assets with it as well. And so essentially, I asked for a bunch of information. I didn't even know I was going to be asking for all of this, but I asked for a bunch of information from Google. Google determined what information it needed to give me and then as a response said, here, have all of these files in here. And that effectively is how you view your requests and your responses. Again, you don't need to use Google Chrome. I was just using Chrome because that's the tool that I like to use when I'm doing things like this. But you can also use Firefox, Safari, Edge, really any browser will be able to do this. Your project. So here's what I would like you to do. I want you to open your favorite browser. It could be Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge. Uh, load up my website, just as an example. Go to caleb.io, right click on the page and then inspect and then click the network tab and then refresh your page if you don't see anything like we did in the last video. And then I want you to be able to filter your responses by documents, so like HTML. CSS, images, or JavaScript, and just kind of see what kind of things my website's going to try to serve you. Find an image and then open that image in a new tab, and then take a screenshot of your network panel, just the entire panel, not the image itself, but take a screenshot of your network panel while it's open with all the different requests and responses in there, and share it in your project section. Now, don't worry, anything you're doing here is it's not going to break your browser, it's not going to hurt your computer, it's not going to do anything that you can't undo by simply clicking the refresh button on your browser. So feel free to experiment. It's completely safe to do this. Go ahead, give us a shot. Take a screenshot of your network panel while it's open, share it in your project section. And once you're done that, you have completed this course. Thank you for taking the time to watch this course. I hope you learned something new and exciting. Again, this is really important when it comes to web development. And if you wanted to learn more about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, APIs, anything, that, anything like that, always feel free to view my profile. I have courses on all of these subjects already. Thanks again, and I hope to see you in another course. Welcome to a beautiful VS Code setup. And so this is what I use in pretty much all of my courses, and I have had thousands of people now ask me, Caleb, what theme do you use? What plugins do you use? And I figured I would just make a course about it because I have a lot of people asking this question and it takes a lot of time to answer that question over and over and over again every single day. So first things first, let's go ahead and open up VS Code. If you don't have VS Code, make sure you download it and then open up VS Code. And so I just opened up VS Code and there's nothing in here right now. And so what I want to do is go to View and then Extensions. And so I'm on a Mac. Uh, this might look slightly different for you if you're on Windows, but it's going to look very, very similar regardless. And so these are all of my extensions that I have in here. And I'll go through a few of them. Uh, but first of all, your VS Code probably doesn't look like mine. Mine has this nice blue-ish theme to it. Um, so what you want to do to make yours look like mine is in your extensions, type in material theme. And go here. And you can see that I have material theme installed. And so you're going to want to install this. It might ask you to restart VS Code. If it does, that's okay. Just restart VS Code. Come back to this page. And then you can go to set color theme. And you can click set color theme here. And you can scroll through these. And you can see the different color themes that it gives you. 
And so some of these are kind of ugly, in my opinion, or way too bright. That's just way too bright for my eyes. Um, for example, I don't really like this one. Maybe you do, and if you do, that's okay. Uh, it doesn't have to, your VS Code doesn't have to look exactly like mine. Uh, but mine is set up to use Material Theme Ocean High Contrast. So not this normal one here, but the high contrast one. So you can see some of the darks are a little bit darker. So once you go ahead and get that set up, in the next lesson, what I'm going to show you is how I can get this little flame. Actually, that doesn't really show up on the first line, but this little flame. Every time I type, it gets that little flame above. I'm going to show you exactly how I enable that. All right, in the last video there, I said I was going to show you how I set up this little flame thing. Uh, some people like it, some people don't. If you don't like it, you can just skip it. Uh, but actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hijack this lesson, and I'm going to talk about uh, my icons. And so I have a nice little icon set here. And if I just open up a new project, let's open up this project called Watcher. And what I have here is on the left, and if I make that just a touch bigger here so we can see it, do, 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 do. Python extension was updated. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, so I have these nice little icons on the left here. And if I've got a JS file, it shows a nice JS file. If I've got an HTML file, it shows a nice HTML file icon. It shows all sorts of things in here. And so the way I do that is in my extensions, I can go to mat material theme icons. And so if you just install material theme icons, set file icon theme, uh, this should just work right out of the box for you. Now, if this doesn't, you might just need to scroll down here and look at some of the installation getting started. What are we looking at here? Do we have anything useful? Yep, activate your theme. And then you can uh, type icon theme. So if I hit command shift P, or if you're on Windows control shift P or Linux control shift P, and then I just type in icon theme, I can choose file icon theme and you can choose which one you want in here and it will eventually change if maybe if I do this is this going to change yeah this changes them for me and so what I like to do is I just like my standard material theme icons ocean and that just comes with this theme I just like that uh, so if you don't have the icons uh, you might want to get some icons. Icons look nice. All right, let's talk about extensions. And I have a lot of extensions installed. Actually, I went through my list of extensions and <laughs> I uninstalled a bunch of them because I just wasn't using them anymore. And so let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger so we can see this nice little icon here. Let's get rid of that dot. And so first of all, I use Code Spell Checker. This is really helpful if you're just trying to write comments in your code and you don't want to make typos especially if you have a modern workflow at your company or at the future company that you're going to work at. Uh, someone's going to review your code and say, ah, actually, you have a typo here, and it's just a pain in the butt to do. Uh, so Code Spell Checker helps me make sure that basically I don't have typos. Now, it's not perfect, but it works pretty well. Code Python iSort. This is for sorting automatically my import. So if I go over to Watcher and scroll up to the top, this could automatically import, or not import, but I sort all of these by default. And I don't have to worry about writing these in order, it just does it for me. Community material theme, yep, we already went over that. Or did we? Maybe we didn't. Uh, okay, so I don't think we did. Um, so let's maybe talk about that real quick. Uh, material theme, where are you? Material theme. I don't use the latest version because I don't like the latest version. I like an older version. Uh, it just gives me nicer colors, I think. So instead of using pink, it uses yellow. Um, I just like the yellow just because it's a little more in my face. You may need to, if you want to revert to an older version, uh, use community material theme. I use this thing called Django templating. So whenever you're working on an, a .html file, you can automatically change that .html file to a Django HTML file and it just gives you nice syntax highlighting. .env is for environment variables, it just gives you syntax highlighting for environment variables. Editor config is really nice, so if you have a new project and you just cloned it from GitHub for instance, you might have a .editor config file and so if it says your JavaScript files should have four spaces instead of two spaces, it will 
basically read that rule and it will honor it for you. So every time you hit tab, it's going to make two spaces or four spaces or whatever is set up in that editor config. And so you don't have to worry about writing different code from different people or having different indenting or, or spacing if you write Python. It just automatically works. I use Grammarly, the unofficial extension, uh, just to help me with some of my spelling again, just because, you know, you, you type tens of thousands of words a day probably when you start doing a lot of coding. And you just want to make sure that you're writing things that, you know, don't have typos that seem somewhat intelligent. Uh, just because at the end of the day, you might have a little bit of brain fatigue and Grammarly can help you with that. Uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, I actually don't use this, but I do believe it comes with the Python package these days uh, for VS Code. And so if you wanted to run Jupyter inside of VS Code, you absolutely could do that. I don't do that. I use Jupyter outside of VS Code just because I like the, the full experience. Uh, but you absolutely can do that. Um, and if you're brand new to Jupyter, I would recommend using it inside of VS Code. It's really, really nice. Markdown Preview. This just allows me to write Markdown. So like if I'm working on a Git repository and I'm writing uh, a readme.md file and I want to see if I've made any sort of mistakes or I want to see if it looks half decent, uh, then I could just simply preview my Markdown. And all the instructions are in here as well to, to see how to really make this work for you. Where are you here? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, it's the very first one. I skipped right past it. Uh, command K and then V or control K and then V and it opens a preview to the side, which is really nice. And it scrolls as you scroll down your source code as well. Material theme, we talked about that one. Material theme icons, we talked about that one. Power mode, this one is really nice. I really, really like this. I know some people absolutely dislike this one. So I'm, I'm going to do here is just close a bunch of these. And I'm going to show you what power mode is. So if I open up this file here called Watcher, and I just do a little bit of typing, you can see that little flame above my letters. And you can make that different. It doesn't have to be a flame. Sometimes, uh, I believe they still have an explosion setting in here. You can go through the settings and make it like an explosion. Yeah, or something like that. That's a lot of fun too. You can make it really big. You can make it really small. I personally like it just because it, it tells me where I'm typing. Where am I typing? It just gives my eyes a little something extra to, to, to look for. Uh, it's also good, I think, for a lot of my students who are like, oh, wow, I see this whole page of text here. Where exactly is Caleb typing? And so I can just do this, and it's another thing for my students to take a look at as well. So I really, really like Power Mode. Uh, but I know about 1% of the people who watch my courses absolutely dislike it. They think it's too distracting. Um, but you know what? That's only 1%, and Power Mode, I think, is a lot of fun. I use Prettier Code Formatter occasionally. Uh, I tend to use this on the command line a little bit more than I use in VS Code, uh, but you can use the Prettier Code Formatting extension as well. Uh, and I use the Python extension quite heavily because I'm a Python developer. And so you're going to want to get this. And yes, it is from Microsoft. If you think Microsoft is a junk company, well, they actually make some pretty good things these days. If you're a big fan of Microsoft, then you're going to love this. Uh, but Microsoft makes VS Code and it made the Python extension and it is really, really good. And you can see it's got over 30 million downloads. RST Preview is a lot like the Markdown Preview. It just helps me with RST files. To Do Tree is really nice. So if I open up watcher.py and I type something like number sign to do, do a thing, it just highlights it for me. So it's easier to see. So if someone else writes a to-do in their code and I am looking at their code, I can easily see what that to-do is supposed to be. And it just sticks out a little bit more. So it tells me what is possibly missing. Vagrant file support. This is just so that uh, dot vagrant files or vagrant, or not dot, dot vagrant files, but vagrant files file type uh, will have some sort of syntax highlighting. Um, I actually don't really use this anymore. So what I'm gonna do is just uninstall that one. I don't need that anymore. And Janeiro. This is a tricky one. I have no idea how to spell it, uh, but this is pretty good. Now, uh, this comes right from Sublime and uh, Scott Barkman, uh, a person that I actually know I used to work with. Uh, he ported this over from Sublime over to VS Code. And basically, what it does is it allows you to take little shortcuts. So, you know, when you have a new file here, and let's just change this over to a .html file. 
I can type HTML colon five, hit tab, and it does a bunch of stuff in here. If I change this over to a Django template, I can type block, hit tab, and it automatically creates the templating stuff for me. So that's really, really nice. I actually don't overly uh, use this too much. I use it for some of the shortcuts like, like block or some of the template tags, uh, but it's really, really powerful and there's a lot of different things you can do in here. So those are all of the extensions that I tend to use on a daily basis. Uh, sometimes I'll install the Docker extension. Sometimes I'll just remove it because I haven't used it in a while. Extensions come and go, but these are the primary ones that I tend to use pretty much on a daily basis. Okay, let's take a quick little walkthrough and see how we can utilize VS Code. Now, I actually don't use VS Code to its maximum capacity. There's a lot of things that VS Code can do, and I just simply don't need it. So I don't do a lot of things, but I'm going to show you exactly how I use VS Code. So first of all, you can go to View and go to your Explorer. And if you don't have something like this, what you can do is you can go to File Open. And you can open an entire folder. So instead of just selecting a file, what you can do is you can select nothing and just say open that entire folder. And that will open this Explorer on the left for you. And what this does is just it allows you to see what files are on the left inside of that folder. Up here, you can create a new file if you wanted to. You can create a new folder if you want to. Or, or what I usually do is I right click and I go to new file. And then I can type like folder name, folder name slash and that'll automatically create a folder for me new file txt and this creates folder name with a new file called txt in there uh, you can delete so you can just right click and delete or you can just select a file so let's select new file and hit command delete or control delete if you're on windows i believe and it will delete it for you as well and if i ever wanted to rename a file what i could do is just click on one of these files and instead of being focused over here i'm focused on the left and I could simply hit enter and rename this file. Rename this file, hit enter again, and it's renamed. And that just allows me to not have to use my mouse as much. You can refresh your Explorer. I have honestly never needed to do this, not once. And if you have folders open, you can collapse them. So let's go ahead and create a new folder with a file called test.txt. See that it's open here on the left. If you end up working on a larger project, you might have like 40. 50, 60 folders, and they might end up being open. If you want to close all of them, I just click that, automatically collapses all of them for me. Let's go ahead and delete that. In the next lesson, let's take a look at some of the file shortcuts that I like to use a lot. Okay, so I have some code here, and this is just some open source code that I wrote over Christmas of 2020, uh, just to make sure that a website is up and running 24 seven, and it checks every website once a minute. So I have a Python file here, and you can see my nice little icon there from my material theme icons extension. If you ever wanted to, you could, you could go down to the bottom, uh, the bottom right, and you can change the spacing to use either spaces or tabs, depends on your Python project, but most, py most Python projects use four spaces, and whenever you hit tab, it just automatically creates those four spaces for you. So if I go down here, there's nothing there. If I hit tab, one, two, three, four, and it creates four spaces for me at a time. You can change the file by clicking this uh, Python down here or whatever extension it says. If you're using an HTML file, it's going to say HTML. Uh, you can change whatever you want it to be in here. So instead of Python, if I said, oh, this actually isn't Python, this is actually Java, it'll change some of the syntax for me. And this is really cool too. Uh, I actually don't write Java. <laughs> so it says you want to install the recommended extension for Java. Uh, I don't, so I'm just going to ignore that. And I'm going to put this back to Python. And that just gives me nice syntax highlighting based on the language or scripting, scripting language that I'm writing, like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, Django, etc. Now, me personally, I don't use my terminal inside of VS Code too often, although you definitely can. So if you go to View, and you can go down to Terminal, you have access to your command line right here. So I can do ls-la, or if you're in Windows, I believe it's just dir. So ls-la shows me all of my files and all the good stuff in there. You can have multiple terminals in here as well if you wanted to. You can split your terminal, you can add a terminal, you can delete a terminal. This is basically the same as opening up command or terminal on your computer. Command if you're on Windows, terminal if you are on a Mac. 
or bash if you're on Linux. I forgot about Linux. Yeah, if you're on Linux, it might be bash. You can make it full-ish screen if you wanted to. It was still your file showing on the left. And you can close it down if you like. So I, uh, I don't tend to use that too often, uh, but I do tend to use that uh, when I'm recording videos just so that I can hit, uh, for example, control tilde. That's the number beside the one sign, this little guy right there, that weird icon or character. I'll record a lot of videos with the terminal right inside of VS Code so I don't have to flip between too many, uh, too many programs. Um, but occasionally I just I don't want to and I want to actually flip between the programs because I like using a raw terminal outside of VS Code. It just gives me a little bit more control and so I can customize that as well. Uh, but for you, if you just want it all in one view, what you can do is you can just go to View, Terminal, and you can have your command line available to you while you're writing your code. In the next video, I'm going to show you some of the shortcuts that I use. Okay, so when I'm editing a file, uh, you'll notice in a lot of my videos, I actually don't use my mouse all that much. Uh, and the nice thing about that is I can just keep my hands on my keyboard and I don't have to move around. So first things first is I use my arrow keys a lot. Up and down, left and right. When I'm on a new line, uh, on a Mac at least, I hit command and I can go left or right and just brings me to either end of that line. That just allows me to find, uh, not find, but to place my cursor somewhere closer to where I want it to be. So if I wanted to change this R over here, instead of pressing and holding my arrow, and then selecting it, what I could do is I could go over here and then I can hit option, left, 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 and this moves word by word and in, that's just a lot quicker than having to do this. Just waiting for it to go from the left or if I'm already on the far right, pressing and holding. It's just left, 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 shift, left, or shift, right to select a character or a series of characters and then you can delete it if you wanted to. Now there's a lot of indenting in Python and HTML and JavaScript and PHP and CSS and pretty much every programming language and scripting language out there. And so sometimes you want to be able to indent and outdent pretty quickly. So what I like to do here is on my Mac, I hit command and then one of these symbols. So either that one or that one. It's one of these two. So command, left bracket, out dense. Command, right bracket, in dense. And you can just keep doing this over and over and over again. And essentially this just lets you select a bunch of text and out dent or indent all of it all at once. So what I did here was I went to this line, went to the P, hit shift, down, 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 hit command, out bracket, command, in bracket, command, out bracket, command, in bracket. Now for in Windows, obviously you don't have a command key. It is likely to be control or alt for you. I actually can't remember off the top of my head. I haven't been on a Windows machine in a little bit, but it's going to be control bracket or alt bracket. Now another thing I like to do a lot is when I'm working with multiple pieces of code that are, are very, very similar uh, and I want to copy and paste a bunch of things, what you can do is you can select all of this and you can do control C or command C and that just copies it. And then you can do control V or command V as in violet. And that pastes the whole thing over and over and over again. But sometimes you wanna paste a whole line and I actually don't paste or copy and paste individual things like this too often. I tend to copy and paste an entire line. So what I do is I don't select anything on here and I just hit control C or command C and that secretly behind the scenes copies the whole line. And then I hit command V or control V as in violet and you can just hit paste over and over and over again and it will select all of that spacing plus the new line for you. So what I can do is I can go up here, outdent, indent, delete, and I just hit delete there. Um, another thing I like to do is when I'm on a line, uh, if I want to delete the whole line, um, just because my fingers tend to shift towards the left side of my keyboard a little bit more, I will hit command X or control X to delete an entire line. So let's say I wanted to delete line 27 here. I can just hit control X. I don't have any character selected. If you, if, you, if you have a character selected and you delete it, it's just going to cut that text out. So let's control Z or command Z to undo and control or command 
X. Don't have anything highlighted here. Just Control or Command X on this entire line. And it cuts that entire line, and then I can paste it over and over and over again. One more thing I really like to do is, uh, you know, if I'm on a line, if I'm in the middle of a line and I want to delete it, I'll just hit Command X or Control X and it deletes the whole line for me. Occasionally I don't want to do that. Occasionally I want to Shift, Alt, and then select multiple words. And then I can just hit delete and delete all of it all at once. And the nice thing about that is you're just hitting shift alt left, 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 and that deletes or selects all of it. And then you can just delete it instead of doing delete, 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 delete. It's just less keystrokes that way. Last but not least, I, I briefly went over this control Z or command Z or Z is going to be your best friend. And this simply undoes something. So if I went in here and I accidentally somehow deleted this and I don't remember what was in there. File.ent, I don't know what's going on there. I can always just hit Command Z to undo my latest work. And you can keep doing that over and over and over again. So I'm just going to keep hitting Command Z and you can see all the things that I've been doing in this video already. Last but not least, sometimes I like to go into split screen mode. So I click this little, this split editor. And this allows me to, uh, well, if I open up another file here, if I open up env.example, I can close that down and I can have my Python file on, on the left and I can have my .env file on the right. So if I'm reading through this code and I'm like, the Twilio SID is the config Twilio SID, what is that? I can look right over here, Twilio SID is AC and then a bunch of stars. And if you ever want to close it, you can just close all the files inside of that split and it goes back to normal. And you can split multiple times too if you want to, just like this. That gets a little bit hard. I actually don't split more than once just because I like a lot of real estate. Uh, I don't like my, my editor looking too crowded, especially once you add a terminal to it. It starts to look like there's a lot in there. All right, let's take a look at dealing with some new files. So first of all, if you open up a file over here, there's a quicker way to close it. So ideally, I don't like using my mouse as much as a lot of people do just because using your mouse is is slow you have to like you have to put your hand on your mouse you have to move it around figure out where it is then you have to like actually place it in here and believe it or not after eight hours of coding all day that can take a lot of brain energy out of you or what you can do is instead of closing it by clicking that x on your command or on your keyboard you can hit command w or you can go up to file close editor or close window uh, what i want to do is just close this particular file so I hit Command W. It might be Control W for you if you're on Windows. I just hit Command W. Closes that file for me. I can open that file again, and I can close it with Command W. Now, if I want to look for a file, I can hit Command P or Control P, and I can just type in a file name. And this just lets me look for things. So I could type in, let's say, I wanted to look for all my Python files. I could type in .py, and it does a search through all of my files for my Python files, and I could. Just Simply hit enter and it opens that file. So now I don't have to look through here because this takes a lot of time. I've, I've seen new developers spend hours out of their day just looking through files in here, especially on bigger projects. And they're like, okay, it's not in this folder. Where's watcher.py? Is it in another folder? No, it's not in there. Where is it? There's an easier way to do it. You can do a global file search with control or command P and you just type in your file name or a partial part of your file name. So I could type watch and it finds watcher.py for me. And that's going to free up a lot of your time. Uh, when we're creating new files, we can also go File, New. And that's fine, uh, but that's sort of the slow way of doing it. And again, that's using our mouse. What I like to do is, if you go to File, you can see File, New File. It's just Control or Command N. I hope it's Control on Windows. Again, it's been a little while since I've been on Windows. Uh, but Control N is going to create a new file over and over and over. And we can just delete these with Control or command W. Now, if I want to change this file without saving it, if let's say, let's say I've got some HTML in here. This is an H1. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. This is just HTML and it's all gray and we don't want it to be all gray. Let's say we want some syntax highlighting, which is going to basically select this and this and make the inside look like something different. We can save this as a .html, so file save or command S or control S and that's going to save this or let you save this file. Or you can go down here, plain text, and you can select your file. Again, you can do this with a shortcut or you can just go straight down to the bottom right 
It's not too often you're actually going to need to do that with your mouse go down to the bottom right because VS Code is smart enough to detect what kind of file you want. As soon as you save this as a .html file, it will automatically set this as .html. Okay, let's talk about views. So if we go up here, we can go to view and we can see all sorts of different things in here. Now, I honestly don't use too much of this. I really just use explore, search, and extensions for the most part. So this is my little sidebar here and I can get rid of this. Just snap it closed. And I can go to file and say explore and that opens that up. There are shortcuts for this as well. So if you want to open up your explorer for me, it's command shift E and that just opens it. So if I close this again, put my mouse right in the middle so you know I'm not doing anything, command shift E, it just opens it for me. There's also extensions, which we talked about at the very beginning of this, uh, this VS Code module or course or tutorial. And there is terminal. Now there's a bunch of other things in here and you can change your appearance, your editor layout. Oh, one thing I like to do with my appearance is I like to show my sidebar and my status bar, but I don't really like to show my activity bar or my panel. Uh, so if you just want to see what this looks like, it's just your panel down there. And that's where you can see like your terminal and things like that. I don't like too many things open. I like to be able to focus on the code. So if this ever gets closed and you're like, oh, I don't know where that went, you can always just go to view extensions or explore or search. We'll talk about search in the next video. I just tend to open up explore because that's where most of my files are. And that's what I want to be seeing is I want to see my files on my left. All right, so let's close this file and let's talk about search. So if we go to view, search, or command shift F, this is going to let me search for something in here. And I can search through all of my files or an individual file. So let's go back to our explorer here. And what I can do is if I open up watcher.py and click inside of here, I can hit command F. And this is just going to do a regular search for like the word client. And it shows me, it shows up three times here, one, two, three. But if I hit command shift F or control shift F, or just go in here and go to search. You can search for content inside of your file. So if I type in client, it's going to show me all these different things in here. If I do, let's just say A, it shows up with all sorts of things in here. And then I can use uh, files to exclude or files to include. So files to include, if I wanted to include .py files, I could do star.py and files to exclude. If I wanted to include all Python files except my watcher.py, I could simply say ignore watcher.py and it shows up nothing, it shows up with nothing. It also supports regex, which I tend to not use too often uh, just because you don't really need it. So if I'm looking for all instances of the word print, I can see that print shows up in my project through all files twice, watching and content. That's where it is, watching and content. If I want to see everywhere that I'm using the word config, I can just type config. And I only have one file in here that's using the word config, but it shows up five times. One, two, three, four, and five. And that is a really good way to look through all of your files for particular text. So this way you're not going through every file, command F, looking for a word, looking for a word, looking for a word. And so make sure you utilize the search functionality as best as you possibly can. It's going to save you a lot of time. So remember when you're searching in a file, you just command or control F and that'll search in the top right over here. If you're looking through all of your files, it's command shift F or control shift F and you can look through all of your files for a particular word. So let's say hash shows up with hash in here and all the different instances of where you can see the word hash. Okay. So I get this question a lot, almost as, almost as often as, hey, Caleb, what theme are you using? And that question is, how do I type in multiple places at the same time? And so there's two things I want to cover in this video is, first of all, I can click like at the very end of this line and then hit control and click. Or if you're on Windows, it's probably alt click or control click. I'm on Mac, so it's command click. And I think I might have said control at the beginning. I meant to say command uh, on Mac, it's command. On Windows, it's probably Control or Alt. Uh, and so I just click in all these different spots. And I can type something here. And it works the exact same way as your regular cursor. So I can select all of these all at once. 
and I can delete all of them all at once. So that's all there is to that. It takes a little bit of practice to get really good at it, uh, to know that you're writing the same thing in two different spots, uh, but that is a really good way of speeding up your time when you're coding. Another thing people ask uh, is, how do I select basically the next occurrence? And so if I type the word config, and let's say I had a typo in here, so let's just select all these, and I just command clicked on those. And if I type in is equal to, uh, no, that's not what I want to do, undo, con ifg. So let's say I had a typo in there, and I wanted to change all these. I can select that first one, and you can see these other ones are selected. I can go to selection, add next occurrence, which for me is command D. And that just adds that next occurrence. I can do it again, adds that next occurrence. So I don't have to double click on this, command or control or alt, double click on that, same thing, double click on that. What I can do is just double click this one, and if I know the next one is the one I want, command D or control D or alt D, depending on your settings. Uh, and then I do Command D again and select all of them. And what I can do is just delete that and type config in all three spots at the same time. Okay, so we went over a lot. Feel free to steal pretty much anything that I'm using. Uh, everything I'm using is completely free. Um, I'm not using any fancy fonts or anything like that. I just happen to find a nice theme that I really like that apparently a lot of other people like. So what I would like you to do for your project is to set up your VS Code to look like mine. And I want you to show me which extensions you have installed. So if I make this bigger, we can see these little icons pop up. So you should be using a different theme, not the default one from VS Code, but a different theme. Uh, I'm using Material Theme. You can use any other theme that you like. Uh, if you want to completely copy me, that's totally A-OK. -okay. Uh, and then I just want you to take a screenshot of your VS Code being open. It doesn't have to have any code open. Let's not save that. It doesn't have to have any code open. And just show me what kind of extensions you have in there. Uh, I would highly recommend that you get at least the Python extension. If you want some fun, the Power Mode extension, the Material Theme extension, the Material Theme Icons extension. And what else to get started? Maybe the Community Material Theme, if you want to use that one as well. And that's, that's about it. That's all you really need at the very beginning. Oh, maybe to do tree. This is a fun one. I like that one a lot. So go ahead and install a new theme and the extensions that you want, and then take a screenshot of your VS code and share it with a class down below. I want to see what you have set up and how you are using VS code. And it could be completely different. You could be using different extensions. You could be using a different theme. Or it could be the exact same. You could just literally copy everything I have. That is okay too. But make sure you take a screenshot of your VS Code with your extensions open. Take a screenshot of the whole thing and share it with a class down below. Thanks for watching this. I have been Caleb Tallin, your instructor. You're going to see a lot of different content from me. And this is the exact setup that I use. All right, let's take a look at what HTML is. So what is HTML? HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It's actually not a programming language. It's called a scripting language, but it's still absolutely vital to web development. And 100% of all websites use HTML. HTML is the structure behind every website on the internet. It's the backbone behind every single website. And then we layer code on top of HTML, but without HTML, honestly, there is no website. And this isn't an opinion, this is just a fact. This is how websites and the internet work. So the first thing you should learn in web development is HTML. Let's take a look at HTML versus HTML5. You will often see people say, learn HTML5, or HTML5 this, or HTML5 that. But HTML5 is actually the last version of HTML, and it will just always be called HTML5, and eventually it'll just be called HTML. So there's no HTML6 down the road. There's no sixth iteration of HTML. So whenever you see HTML5, you can actually think of HTML5 and HTML as the exact same thing, and that's because they are the exact same thing. Okay, let's take a look at getting set up. First, you're going to need a text editor. I highly suggest VS Code. It's free and it works on all operating systems. So before we do anything, let's make sure we have VS Code installed. And I'm just going to Google this, VS Code download, 
and it's code.visualstudio.com. And this is the text editing program we're going to be using in this course. Now, if you have already written code and you have a different text editor that you prefer, that's okay. But if you've never written code before, let's go ahead and download this program. So for me, in this course, I'm using a Mac. But it doesn't matter if you're using Mac or Linux or Windows. It's going to be the same program right across all three operating systems. So if you're on Windows 7, 8, or 10, make sure you download this one. If you're on Mac, download this one. And if you're on Linux, download one of these two. Once you have VS Code downloaded and installed, make sure you can open up your text editor, just like this. So yours is going to look a little bit different once you open it. Yours is going to be a different color, but ultimately it's the exact same program. Mine's just a different color because I like the accessibility behind it. I like being able to type stuff in here. And it's a fairly easy color for you to read on your screen. So yours is going to look a little bit different in colors, but the general layout is going to be the exact same. So make sure you have VS Code downloaded and installed. And once you have that, let's head on over to that next lesson. Okie doke, let's take a look at HTML syntax. Now the word I'm saying here is syntax. And all that means is the styling in which you write something. So English has particular syntax with apostrophes, periods, question marks, commas, things like that. It's like a, a markup for how we write a language. And writing code is no different. There are certain rules that we have in place. So first things first, let's go ahead and let's look at some HTML syntax. So typically it looks like this. We have some sort of element and it opens like this and closes like this. So each one of these is called a tag. This is an opening tag and this is a closing tag. And it always, 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 always has a less than sign. Then the word of the element, whichever element is, and there's lots of them. And then a greater than sign. And then to end an element, we do same thing. We open it. And then we say, actually, this is not an opening element. This is a closing element. We say that with a slash and then the word. And then we close it again with a greater than sign or symbol. Now you may have noticed that I put this on a different line. And that's actually okay. HTML doesn't really care about extra white space. So this does not really matter. All, this, all these extra lines between line four and line 11 it doesn't really matter, to be honest. We'll talk about that more in depth a little bit later. So this whole thing right here, that is called an element. Now inside of these elements, we can have text. So we could say some text in here. And what a browser is going to do is then say, hey, there's a particular element here and it's closing here. And whatever is on the inside, apply these rules to it. So whatever the element rule is, maybe it's bold. Make this text bold is what it's going to do. And we'll talk about bold in the future uh, as well. Uh, but right now, also, you need to know that element is not actually a real element. We're just going over syntax here, just so this makes sense in the next few lessons. The other thing that we can have are these things called attributes. And this actually goes inside of an element. So what I'm going to do is split this onto its own line. And that's okay. It's going to be, be basically the exact same thing to your browser because, again, it doesn't care about this extra space in there. So we have these things called attributes. And it goes attribute name is equal to and then you can either have two apostrophes like this or two quotation marks like this and then we could put some value in here some sort of text so we could say some text in here now we can have multiple attributes we can have let's say a title attribute and again you don't need to know what this is we'll cover all this in future lessons again we're just going over syntax here and this is an example of a second attribute second attribute here, we can have more and more and more. We can actually have unlimited number of attributes. Now attributes are just like elements. An element has a rule that your browser is going to read. So if this were to be bold, your browser would say bold this text. And just because I write attribute in here does not actually mean it's going to do anything. Now a good example of this, uh, because this is not actually valuable whatsoever, attribute is not a valid attribute in HTML, we could just write title is equal to and then whatever the title is. And title is actually a proper attribute. And you can add this to most of your HTML elements. Again, we'll talk about that in the future. You don't need to memorize all this either, because as you write this, as your fingers start to type more and more, you're going to become more familiar with how HTML works and how it looks. So the big takeaway here is this is your element. You've got an opening tag, and this whole thing is a tag. 
you've got a closing tag, and everything it encompasses is your element. Next, we have attributes, like the title attribute. And then so, so it goes, the attribute name is equal to, you need that equal sign. Don't add spaces before or after. Make sure it's all together. So you've got your attribute is equal to, and then either quotations or apostrophes. Now here's the catch, is if it opens with a quotation mark, it needs to end with a quotation mark. Otherwise, if it opens with an apostrophe, it needs to close with an apostrophe. And you can actually see VS Code highlighted this for me. It says everything down here is all the same. And that's called syntax highlighting. But as soon as I replace that quotation with an apostrophe, because this attribute needs to open and close with the exact same character, the syntax highlighting worked. Now, if your syntax highlighting doesn't work right away and you're following this video and you're trying to do what I'm doing, go down here and this is probably going to say plain text. You can click this and you can type in HTML and just click this one and it will change your syntax highlighting for you. So that's all there is to this particular lesson. You don't need to do anything at this point in time. It's just really important to know that this whole thing is an element. This is an opening tag. This is a closing tag. This is your inner content. And this fella right here is an attribute. Let that sink in for just a moment. Once you're ready, let's head on over to that next lesson where we talk about the base HTML structure of every page. Okay, let's take a look at the base structure of every single web page. So I have VS Code open here, and I'm just going to go to File, New. That's actually outside of my recording area. So it's just Command N or Control N or File, New File. And you're going to see this brand new file here. Let's go ahead and change this from plain text to HTML. And what we can do here is automatically fill. So we have a nice shortcut here, so we don't have to remember this. It's HTML colon five. And then if you hit tab, it should autocomplete for you using the Emmet abbreviation. You can see that on the right side of my screen here. So let's go ahead and hit tab. And it does all this stuff for me. Now I'm gonna go ahead and delete a few things just because we don't need it right now and it might be a little bit confusing. And I'm just going to change this indenting just so we can look at some nesting and I'll talk about that. I'll talk about that in just a second. But let's go through this line by line. So line number one, this is the weirdest kind of element you're going to see. You don't see elements too often starting with an exclamation mark. Doc type is the only one. So we're saying, hey browser, when you when you read this file, know that it's an HTML5 file. It's an HTML file. It's not a PDF. It's not plain text. It's not JavaScript. It's not CSS. It's not an image. It's not a font. It's not some sort of other document. It is an HTML page. So please render it like an HTML page. Next on line two, we have an opening tag called HTML. And this is where all of our HTML actually goes. And then on line nine, we're closing that tag. So we're saying everything in here is going to live inside of this HTML tag. And in VS Code, you can actually click this little arrow and you can collapse it, which is really nice. So if you ever have too much code and you're getting a little overwhelmed, you can always collapse your code. Next, we have two main parts to every single page. We have our head. Again, that's an opening head element, or a tag rather. And this is a closing head tag. And this whole thing is the head element. Now you can actually see that just like HTML, we have another element in here called title, but this one is nested inside of head and head is nested inside of HTML. And then we have a title element here that just changes the title of the page. So when you go to a web page, such as this one, when we downloaded VS Code a couple of lessons ago, it changes this title up here for you. That's what the title element does. Now you can have all sorts of things in your head, but you can think of the head element as literally the head on your body. It's your brain. It holds all this extra information. So it's not completely visual, but it does hold extra information. Now your body is just like the body that you live in. It is what people are going to see. So if I flip back to this page, just as an example, everything in here is part of the body. So everything that's visual, the interactive part of your web page, that is the body. And we're going to be putting most of our code in there. So let's go ahead and make an example here. And let's just write, hello world. And what I'm going to do is save this. So file, save as, and where should I throw this? Let's throw this on my desktop. I'm gonna call this hello world.html. 
I already have one, so let's go ahead and replace that. Now what I can do in my browser is, I get, again, I can go to File, but this time I'm going to go to Open File. So it's Command-O or Control-O if you're on Windows, I believe. Let's go to Desktop, and let's open up Hello World. And this is a web page. Now, if you're following this video, definitely feel free to pause at this point and try to write out the code that I have written in this video. It's not very much code, and it's really easy to write with VS Code. Remember, HTML colon 5, and then hit Tab, and that will autocomplete all of that for you. And then just write something inside of your body element. So I just wrote Hello World, and that showed up as text on my page. If you do that, save your file and then open it in your browser, and you see Hello World, then hey, congratulations, you have literally just made your first web page. So my suggestion is give that a shot because this is always really, really good practice, and this is really straightforward at this point. So yeah, my suggestion is give this a shot uh, once you're happy with your results, or maybe you don't want to give this a shot and you just want to move on to that next lesson. Either way, let's head on over to that next lesson together, and we'll get started talking about the title element. Okay, hello and welcome back. In this lesson, let's go ahead and talk about this fella right here, the title element. So in the last lesson, we created this page called Hello World, and I'm just going to delete this. And this is the page that we originally had, and it said document up there, right in that tab. So let's go ahead and refresh this, and we're going to see it just says the file name, and that matches the file name here. So hello underscore world dot html, hello underscore world dot html. Same thing, not really elegant, not what your users are looking for, not search engine friendly. But we can change that with a title element. And so I'm going to write title slash title. Let's go ahead. Mine's set to a Django template, but I want to change this from a Django template to an HTML file. So let's go ahead here and change this title. Let's say, hello from Caleb. And refresh. And you can always refresh with Command R or I believe Control R. I'm just using Google Chrome, by the way. It doesn't really matter what browser you're using. Uh, but you can just reload the page and it says hello from Caleb. And you can change that at any point in time. We could say hello from Earth. You could do file save or you can hit Control S or Command S, I believe it is. Yep, Command S on a Mac. I believe it's Control S on Windows. Just go ahead and save that file. Let's go back here, refresh this page. Hello from Earth. And so that's the title tag. Now, you should only ever have one title tag because it's only really ever used once. Having two title tags, your browser's not going to know which one to use, so just make sure you only have the one title tag. Now, the thing about this, this particular element, this title element, it has to live inside of the head element, and that has to live inside of your HTML element. So now we're getting into nesting. We've got this HTML element, and inside of it we have head, title, closing element, and we have body, content, closing element. And that's all there is to creating a title in a tab up here using HTML. Nice and easy. Once you're feeling comfortable with that, let's head on over to that next lesson, and we'll get started with adding some actual content to our page. So it doesn't just say hello world. It's going to say hello world and maybe a title. We could write a paragraph. We could have multiple titles, things like that. Okay, let's take a look at paragraphs and headers. And this is where a page is going to actually start to take a little extra shape here. So it's not just going to say hello world. Now, a paragraph, and like a lot of elements in HTML, is just a p tag. But because it's an element, it's a pretty standard element, we could do p and then we do slash p. And this is, again, this is just our syntax. This is our opening tag, our closing tag. And the whole thing together is an element. So P stands for paragraph, but we don't write paragraph. We just write P for paragraph. In here, we can either write some text here, or if you want to keep your code nice and clean, we can go ahead and put it on separate lines. So I'm just going to keep these on separate lines. I think it looks a little cleaner this way. What I'm going to do is type lorem, hit tab, and it fills my text area with a bunch of lorem ipsum Latin words. I have no idea what this means. Uh, but it's a common thing you're going to see in web development. So let's go ahead and save. So you can go up to File, 
Save or Command S or Control S on Windows. Let's go back to the page we're creating and hit refresh. And now we have this lorem ipsum text. Now let's go ahead and create a title for this page, a header. So just inside of the body, above the P element, not inside of it, but above it, we're going to write H1. And the nice thing about VS Code is when you write an element, whenever it says Emmet abbreviation, you can just hit tab. So I hit tab and it writes my code for me and then I can just write something on the inside. You can say welcome to HTML 101. Let's go ahead, save that page, flip back to our browser and hit refresh. We have this big text in here, HTML, welcome to HTML 101, and then lorem ipsum in here. Now if this looks smaller on your screen, it's because I'm actually zoomed in to 175%. Yours should look something a little more like this. I just made this bigger so it's easier to see on your screen. Now that's not the only size title we can have. We can have h2, h3, h4, h5, and h6 elements. So let's go ahead and create an h2 tag, and this could be like a subtitle. A Beginner's Guide to Coding. And so you can see I'm getting a little bit faster here, but the syntax stays the same. This is an opening HTML tag, an h2 tag, and this is a closing one. Again, you got that slash and then the element name, and that just says everything inside of here needs to be an h2 font size. And everything in the h1 between the, the two h1 tags needs to be super large. And everything between the two paragraph tags is your paragraph, just general text for the most part. So save that, let's flip back over here and let's see what an h2 looks like. It should be right between these two sections of text. And you can see it's a little bit smaller. Now what I would like you to do, for some hands-on experience right now, is create an h1, h2, but then also create an h3, create an h4, h5, and an h6. And again, all I'm doing here is typing an element name. As soon as Emmet abbreviation comes up, I can hit tab. And it creates the H6 element for me. So go ahead and take a look at what H1 through H6 looks like. Add some extra text in here. <laughs> LOL, BBQ. Go ahead and save that. And when you flip over this page and hit refresh, check out the different header sizes. And you might be a little bit surprised what an H6 looks like. White space does not matter. Now I mentioned this really early on, but white space does not matter. You can see that I actually have an element right here, an H2, actually this whole thing is an element, and I don't have any spacing or new lines or anything. It's just an H2 opening tag, a bunch of text, and then an H2 closing tag. But with a paragraph, I have the P element here, and then I've actually broken this onto a new line, added a bunch of extra spaces in here, and then at the very end, again, I broke it onto a new line, a bunch of extra spaces. Now your browser does not care how many spaces there are. It's going to try to condense it all down into one space anyways. So as an example, let's go ahead and add a space just after the word ipsum. I'm just gonna add a bunch of spaces. Now if we were writing a newspaper article, this would look terrible. It would be two words, a comma, and then all these different spaces. And those little dots that you see, after I highlight the space, that just tells me it's a space. That's, that's not actually there, it's just telling me there's a space. So let's go ahead, save that, head on over to your browser, and let's hit refresh, and we're going to see, as soon as I hit refresh, absolutely nothing is going to change. So let's reload this page. I can reload this 100 times, nothing looks like it changes. However, if we go, if we click somewhere on the page, we can go right click, view page source, and we can see all of our source code. And this is exactly what I've written in VS Code. And you can see that all the spaces are there. But your browser says, mm, no, you don't need all those spaces. Let's compress that into just one visual space. So white space does not matter. Another example here is I could add all these new lines and there's a bunch of new lines. You can actually see there's so many new lines that like I can't even really read the code anymore. And let's go ahead and add some more lorem in here. So lorem tab. And I should have two paragraphs, right? I should have this first paragraph, and I can get rid of this white space because it does not matter. I have three new lines, and then I have another paragraph. Now, 
intuitively you would think it would create two paragraphs for us. It's not going to do that. So if I save this, flip on over to the browser, what you're going to see is these are combined together. And again, it took all of those new lines and squished it into one single space for you. Now, if you want multiple paragraphs, what you have to do is you have to close this paragraph element. Let's close that paragraph element. And this creates its, one, its first paragraph. Let's collapse that and let's go up here. And we just have to reopen this. And I'm going to show you what I'm doing here in just a second. And so all I did was I closed that first element up here and I reopened a new one down here. So if we take a look at this together, we have paragraph one, paragraph two. They're not nested. It's not a paragraph inside of a paragraph. It's a paragraph and then we close it and then a second paragraph and then we close that. So let's go ahead and click save. And now when we refresh our page, we're going to see that this is actually two separate paragraphs, the way we probably wanted it to be in the first place. So the lesson here is white space does not matter. If you want to use extra white space, there are ways to do that, such as wrapping your text in different paragraphs or different H1s or different H2s. And as just one more example, let's, let's go ahead and let's see what happens when I put this is on a new line right in my H1, just to demonstrate that this is not specific just to paragraphs either. So I'm going to save that, go over here, hit refresh, and it's not on a new line. And again, that's because our browser does not care. Even though we've written the code that way, our browser does not care that it has this extra white space. So I'm just going to go ahead, clean this up, just delete that extra white space because I like my code to be nice and tidy. And this is what we're left with. Next up, let's take a look at nesting elements a little bit more. We've actually already been doing it with HTML, head, title, body, h1, h2, and paragraph. These are nesting, but let's get into some terminology. Alrighty, let's take a look at nesting some code. So we've actually already been nesting our HTML. And what that means is we have an HTML element, and then inside of that, instead of just regular text like we see with a paragraph or heading one, heading two, we have another element and then we can have another element. And this can go on essentially forever. Now, what I'm going to do is scroll down my page just below my two paragraphs that I have, and I'm going to create a new element called a div. Or if you want to use the Emmet abbreviation div, and then as soon as you see Emmet abbreviation over here, go ahead, hit the tab letter on your keyboard, and it fills it for you. Now, a div honestly doesn't mean anything. We'll talk more about divs down the road, but it doesn't do anything. Like a paragraph is going to separate your text with, for instance, a paragraph is going to separate your text here. It's got like a nice little spacing in there and then it creates another one for you. A div does not really do that. So let's go ahead and say this is a div element. Go ahead, save that, refresh our page. It's going to say this is a div element. And now inside of this element, and this is going to look a little bit weird at first, but we have a div element, and then we can have some text in there. We can have another div in here as well. We can say div, this is a nested element. And we'll close that one off as well. Let's go ahead and refresh this page. And we're going to see it shows up on the line right after it. But this whole thing is wrapped in one div. Now a good way to look at this is right click on your page, go to inspect, and I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger here. Whoops, that was too big. And let's scroll back down. And we can hover over the elements in here. And so this is our inspect tool. It is incredibly helpful. You're going to want to use this for pretty much everything front end related. So HTML, CSS, and JavaScript down the road. But for now, let's just stick with HTML. And what we have here is a div. And we can open up this div. And we can see that there's some text. And you can see that as I hover over it, it's actually changing what is selected on my page. And then we've got a child element. And that's what it's called. When it's nested, it's a child element. And that's on its second line. Now, we could actually go one layer deeper as well. So I'm just going to put this on a new line just to keep code nice and tidy. And I could do one more div. Or let's experiment and let's do a paragraph inside of a div. This is a paragraph. Go ahead, save that, flip on over to my browser, and I'm just going to hit refresh here. And you can see, as I hover over things, it's going to show me what exactly is selected. So I have a div element here, 
and it's selecting both the nested div and the paragraph. Whereas up here, it's just selecting the one paragraph at a time. You can see that as I flip between them. So here I've got the overarching, the container element called div, and then I've got some text, and then I've got another div, and then I've got inside of that div, a paragraph. You know, I've got text here, and then I've got a paragraph here. And you can actually see that that paragraph has a bunch of spacing around it, so it sort of bumps your text down a little bit. Now let's take a look at some terminology here. This one here, this is going to be your parent element, and this is going to be a child element. So what this typically looks like is you've got some sort of parent element, slash parent, and then a closing tag like that. And then you've got some sort of child element, and then you close that tag there. Again, it doesn't matter if you have extra white space. You can put that on multiple lines if you wanted to, which I'm actually going to do. And then we could go one layer deeper, and we could call this a grandchild, grandchild element, slash grandchild. And this can go on and on and on forever. So we can say, great grandchild. And it goes on and on and on. Now, the terminology is going to change based on what you're talking about. So if I get rid of grandchild and great grandchild, when we're working in here, this is our main element. Let's just call it child. And if we're talking about the element around it, the one that wraps around it like this, that's called a parent element. Now, if we're working on the parent element and we want to talk about an element inside of it, we would call it a child. Now, where the terminology changes is if we have grandchild element, and this is the one we're working on, this is our main element. Let's say we're talking with a coworker about this particular element. We would just call this the element, whichever one it is. Maybe it's a div. Child would then become the parent. Parent would then become the grandparent. And so it's relative, just like in a family hierarchy. Now, none of these are actually real elements, so let's go ahead and delete those. And just for funsies, let's go ahead and let's add an H3 element in here, just a little title that says, this is an example of element nesting. So I saved that file, and I'm going to refresh this. And let's close our inspect tool with this X over here. This is an example of element nesting, and this is all in one element. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to see why nesting is actually very, very important. Because right now, this was not very important. We didn't have to nest this at all. But we needed to know how this works in order to get to that next lesson. So in the next lesson, let's take a look at bolding, italicizing, and underlining your text. And then we're going to mix and match all three of them. All right, welcome back from the nesting video. Let's go ahead and actually create something applicable here. So I'm going to just make some space to work just because I like a lot of extra space. And again, white space doesn't matter. We know that, right? So let's create a new paragraph in here. And let's automatically close that paragraph tag. And in here, let's write lorem, hit tab, and we get some lorem ipsum, just like we've done before. Now, if we want to bold some text, you think it would be the word bold. It's not quite that intuitive, but it's pretty close. We just use the B tag. So we could do B, and let's bold the first four letters, or words rather. And so I've got a P tag, a paragraph, and nested as a child element is the bold element. And so I saved that, and if I go over to Google Chrome and hit refresh, you can actually see that my text here is bold and the rest is not bold. Okay, so this is nesting, and this is actually getting into something a little more interesting, a little more useful, a little more applicable to actually learning HTML. Next, let's go ahead and let's italicize. So italicize to make something sort of, actually, this is a good example. Whatever I did there made this italics. So it's sort of kind of handwriting-ish. Uh, let's go ahead and add an I element to these three words. And so if I refresh the page, uh, which ones do we have here? Culpa iustu, I'm not even going to try to say that, but it's these three words here. And if I hit refresh, we can see that that has now automatically changed. Lastly, we have underline, and really, it's the exact same thing. So you'd think it would be underline, but it's not. We use sort of shorthand when it comes to HTML, and we just say U. It's the U element. And again, that has an opening and closing tag. All three of these have opening and closing tags. So I'm going to save that, 
Come back here, hit refresh, and we can see this is now underlined. Now where this gets really, really interesting is we can create another paragraph and lorem, and you see how fast this is getting because I have that tab completion. If I wanted to make this bold, italic, and underlined, and let's just get rid of this, let's do only one line instead of uh, two or three sentences there, let's just do one sentence. I could say B, hit tab, makes bold for me, and then it wants me to, to put my text in here. Well, that's nice, but what I'm going to do here is just grab all of that. I'm going to hit Control X or Command X on Mac. That just cuts it into my clipboard. And then Control V or Command V, as in violet, to paste. And so when I save, refresh, we're going to see we now have a bold sentence. Now, if we wanted to make this italics as well, it's not bi for bold italics, it's just b, and then inside of it we say i. So then we can go over here, hit tab to indent that some more, and slash i. A one thing to note too is your text might actually scroll way off the screen over here. You can go into your settings and you can change your word wrapping or your text wrapping settings so that it breaks on automatically onto a new line. So you can see that this whole thing for me is line 27, even though it's spanning multiple lines. That's just so it's not one long line right across the page and I have to scroll left and right. Okay, so I added a paragraph, bold, italics. Let's go ahead, save and refresh. And now this is bold and italicized. So that's working out pretty nicely. Lastly, let's add a U element. And I just move that text up real quick. Go ahead, save that file, refresh, and now we can see it's bold, italic, and underlined. But there is a rule here. Your inner tag, your innermost tag, has to have an innermost closing tag. So if the last one you have is a U, the first closing tag is a U. If the second element that you have here is an I, the second last one is a slash I. Same thing with bold. So we start with bold up here, and we close, and you can actually see, and this is why I indented it like this, is so that you can see that these match up this way. You always want your elements to match up this way. Funny things can happen if you don't match your opening and closing tags. That's pretty important. So at this point, if you want to go ahead and give this a shot, let's try nesting a paragraph. So create a paragraph element, then bold your text, italicize your text, underline your text, and it doesn't matter if it's bold, italic, or underline, or, or any other order. It could be italic, underline, bold. It could be underline, bold, italic. It doesn't really matter as long as these match up. And then add some text in there. And I want you to make sure that your text is both, or not both, but all. It should be bold, italic, and underlined, and it should be in a paragraph element. Go ahead and give that a shot. Once you're ready to move on, I'll see you in that next lesson. Okay, hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about a div element. So what I want to do here is I have a bunch of code already, and I just want to collapse it so it's a little more readable for me, because this is getting fairly long. And get rid of that extra white space, just because I like my code being tidy. And if we wanted to, we could like collapse just the I, just the B, just the paragraph. But in this lesson, let's go ahead and talk about div. Div is a dummy element. And it actually doesn't mean anything. So like how we said P stands for paragraph, B stands for bold, I stands for italic, div is just a divider. And you can actually see that the MDN reference here from VS Code says the div element has no special meaning at all. It represents its children. It can be used with class, lang, and title attributes to, to mark up semantics, common, blah, blah, blah. That stuff's getting a little too advanced for us at the moment. But basically that first line that says the div element has no special meaning at all. That's important. It has no special meaning. Now what we're going to talk about here is A, div has no special meaning. This has no special meaning. But let's also take a look at how it works side by side because in this last lesson where we did bold, italics, and underline, we could use all three of these. And actually a better example is this one where we had a paragraph, but then we had bold and that bold text was beside the regular text. And then we had italics and that italicized text was right beside the normal text, and the underlying text, same, same thing over and over and over again. And this gets into this concept of block elements 
versus inline elements. So a div is a block element. And what I mean by that is if I just hit Command C or Control C and then Command V or Control V, I just copied that whole line over. And this is a second line. So let's go ahead and save that, refresh our page here. And you can see down here, it just says, this has no special meaning, this is a second line. And if I do this, right click and inspect. When I hover over the element, you can actually see that that blue line that goes right across the entire page, that is a block element. So even though it's only actually needing the, the space from this has no special meaning, you can actually see that it's taking up the entire line. That's called a block element. And you're going to see these all the time because it's, it's really good to know. Uh, the reason for that is because, for example, if this paragraph up here was not a block element, these two paragraphs would merge together and they wouldn't actually be paragraphs. It'd be one paragraph merged with the second paragraph to make one big one. That's not what we want all the time. And so the nice thing about this paragraph is also a block element is it's going to take up the, the full width of your screen. It's going to take up as much real estate as it possibly can. So let's go back to our code and let's even try to put these side by side in our code. So it's opening one div and closing it, opening another div and closing it. Let's go ahead and save that, refresh, and we're going to see that nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Literally nothing has changed. And that's again because these are block elements. So our browser said, okay, you have one element, it's closing, another element, it's closing. In the inspect tool, this is exactly what our browser sees. This has been fixed for us. So it's on two different lines. And again, they're both block elements, so they're going to take up as much possible space as they can, separated by the element itself. Now, this is a strange concept, but in the next lesson, we're going to talk about block elements versus inline elements and how you can use them sort of together and what the difference is. Okay, let's take a look at block elements versus inline elements. So far, we've been working with mostly block elements. Now, a block element is if I right click and inspect. You can see that it takes up the entire width of my page. Even though it's actually only using, what, 30% of the text, it's actually saying, mm, allocate the entire width of the page for this particular H2 element. Paragraphs are block elements as well. H3s, H4, 5, 6, even the H1 at the very top of the page. But what isn't is if we go down here, we have this particular paragraph with nested elements. Now, the nesting has nothing to do with it. What's important to note is that this B element for bold, it's not taking up the entire width of the entire page. It's actually sitting side by side with your regular text. And then we have italics, regular text, underline, and then some more regular text. Now, underline, italic, and bold, these are called inline elements. And all that means is they can exist side by side with other elements. Whereas paragraph, you can see that I only have text up until about here. If I hover over this, to the right of where I selected that text, it's still taking up that extra space. That's a block element. Now, you do not need to have inline elements inside of a block element, though typically that is what you're going to end up doing, but there's no rule for that. It's just this is an inline element, and we could put italics right beside bold, right beside underline. It doesn't really matter because it's, it's an inline element, so it's going to take up the least amount of space possible. Versus block elements, like down here, this div is a block element, this div is a block element, and it's going to take up the entire width. Now, a couple use cases is, you know, bold, italic, and underline, but also, if you wanted a block element, you could use a title, like an H1 through H6, and that's going to put your larger text on its own line. And so what's nice about that is we already have a title here, welcome to HTML 101. We've got a subtitle here using an H2 element. And then we have a couple of paragraphs. These are all block elements and this is what's making our page look nice. Now, if for some reason this bold were a block element, and I'm gonna show you what this is going to look like, but don't try this. I don't want you to try this because this is breaking out of the scope of HTML, but I'm going to show you what this looks like. Display block. So what I just wrote there, you don't need to try. But I changed it. I hijacked its default behavior to be block instead of inline. 
And you can see that bold is now on its own line. And this is why inline elements are very important because if you have bold on its own line, you'll never actually have the ability to select a particular piece of text in a paragraph and make it bold, underline, or italic. Now there are a lot of different elements out there that are inline, and there's a lot of them that are block. And so you're going to have to sort of discover these as you move through learning HTML. There's too many elements to possibly cover. There's probably hundreds of them. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to use a handful of them pretty much every single day. And you need to know the difference between a block element, like this one that I hijacked, uh, or an inline element, so that you can actually make your text presentable in a human readable manner. So that's the difference between block elements and inline elements. Okay, so the web is made of links to other pages. That's really all it is. So I have one page here, but what if I wanted to link to Google? Or what if I wanted to link to another page of mine? First things first, let's start off by using the most simple form. Let's just link to Google or Facebook or Instagram or something like that. So in this lesson, we're going to create two different types of links. The first one, and I just flipped over to VS Code here, uh, the first one is going to be a link just to Google. And this is an absolute link. The second one is going to be a relative link. So a link starts with the A element, and this stands for anchor. It's a hypertext anchor. We can see that over here. Thank you, VS Code, for filling that in for me. So we have an, an anchor tag, and this actually uses our first attribute. We haven't used an attribute yet. And that's going to be href, and that stands for a hypertext reference. And basically, this is how we're going to point to another web page. Now, it's been a little while, but an attribute is always the attribute name, equal, and then either quotations or apostrophes. They have to start and end with the same. It doesn't matter which one you use, but it has to start and end with the same. And let's go ahead and close this A tag. And let's say this is a link. And let's see what happens. When I go back here and refresh my page, yeah, looks like a link. But when I click it, it doesn't actually go anywhere. So what I want to do here is href is equal to, and I want the full link to any website, including the HTTP part. That's vital. You need the HTTP every single time you want an absolute link. So let's go ahead and go to Instagram.com. So all I did there was HTTP or HTTPS. Most websites have that S these days. Colon, slash, slash, and then the website. So Instagram.com. And actually, this slash isn't even necessary. Let's go ahead and save that and refresh. And when I go over here, you can see the link has actually changed to a blue because I haven't clicked it yet. And let's click the link. And look at that, it brought me to Instagram. So I'm going to go back. And maybe I don't want Instagram, maybe I want something a little less personal. Uh, let's go to Google. So go ahead, save, refresh. And you can see at the bottom left, it says HTTPS Google.com. Click that. And boom, it brings us to Google. And that's all there is to really adding a link to any page that you have. So again, it's the A element for anchor. The href attribute is equal to quotation and then your website URL, that link. Uh, and then some text. So we can say this is going to go to Google. And because that's going on to two lines in my editor, I'm just going to put this on two different lines. And again, white space does not matter. So it doesn't matter that I have all these different spaces in here. I can still go back to my browser, hit refresh. The only thing that changes the text, not the extra spacing. And so it changed the text. This is going to go to Google. And it does. Now, that's nice. But what if you want to link to your own web page? Well, that's a little bit different because you can see up here, there's no HTTPS. This is a file. And you could theoretically link to it, but you don't want to because, well, I'm on a Mac, so it starts with file. But if you're on Windows, it starts with C. And if you're on Linux, it's just a slash. So it's not going to work for everybody. And we need to make sure that works on every operating system. And the way we get around that is using a relative link. So a relative link looks almost identical to an absolute link or an absolute anchor. We can do a h r e f is equal to, we have our quotations in here, and let's go and say second page.html. We'll close that opening tag and say this 
goes to the second page. And we always close. Anytime we have text inside of an element, we always close it with a closing tag. And let's take a look at this. And we can see these links are side by side. So we know from the last lesson that these are inline elements because they work side by side, which means we could put them inside of a paragraph nicely. And when I click this goes to a second page, at the bottom left, you can actually see that it's going to users, Caleb Tallinn, desktop, second page, dot HTML. And this actually doesn't exist. So when I click this link, it goes to a 404 page. 404 just means your page doesn't exist. It says your file was not found, it may have been moved or deleted. Emphasis on that, if you're moving files from one folder to another folder, it may be moved or deleted. And basically it's saying that the file doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and make this file exist. I'm going to close this tab because that's not needed. And let's do this. I'm going to copy this whole page. And I'm going to go File, Save As. And wherever you have helloworld.html, let's call this one secondpage.html. Save. And so now we have a second page.html. And I can file open or command O or control O and open up hello world. And now we have two files side by side. So the second page one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete pretty much everything inside of the body. So let's go and delete all this stuff. Let's change the title to second page. And let's say an H1. This is the second page. That's all we're going to do. So I saved that. And when I come back here, this now exists at this file location on my computer. And if I hit refresh, it actually works. So if I go back, refresh this just for good housekeeping. If I refresh this and I say this goes to second page, it was 404 and it was saying there was a missing file or a missing page. Now it's not. Now it's going to actually load the page for me. Lastly, on our second page, let's go ahead and add one more anchor link back to our Hello World page. And let's say hello world.html. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is this is not an absolute link. It does not start with HTTP. It is not an absolute link. This just says go to this particular file, which happens to be in the same folder as second page. So these are side by side in the same folder. And it's going to say, oh, look for this particular file. So it's actually linking to another file, not necessarily a web page. And that gets a little bit into how pages are actually served on a server, uh, basically because a server is just someone else's computer. But this one could say, go back to home. Save, refresh. Let's go back to home. I'm going to make that just a touch bigger here. So this is our second page. Go back to home. And we now have two pages that link to each other. And if you give this a shot and you get this to work, that means you have successfully created a network of pages. You don't just have a web page now, you have a web site. Okay, let's take a look at opening a link in a new window. So we probably all know that you can control or command click a link, and this is going to open up in a new tab. And maybe we don't want that. Maybe we want to force people to, every time they click a link, open in a new tab, which could be the same as right clicking and open link in new tab. But if we want to force this on someone, we actually have that power. So I'm going to go over to hello world.html. And for Google, every time they go to an external page, because this is an internal page or a relative page, and this is an external website or an absolute link, we can say target is equal to, and this one looks a little weird. There's an underscore there, but target is equal to blank. And so this is our attribute is equal to apostrophe underscore blank is the value has to be that underscore blank. And then our closing attribute quotation mark. Let's go ahead and save that. And let's just refresh this page. And now it doesn't look like anything has changed. But when I click this, I'm not going to command click or control click. I'm not going to right click and click open link a new tab. I'm just going to click this link and it's going to open in a new tab for me automatically just like that, we now have two tabs. And so that's how you open a link in a new tab. All right, let's look at adding an image to our page. So for an image, we actually need an image file. And I like to go to this place called unsplash.com. And we can just use free royalty free images. 
and I just want any image. It doesn't really matter what the image is, although this one is pretty perfect. It has a laptop. That's pretty much what I want. Click, and I'm going to download this, and I'm going to download the largest one uh, that I want, uh, just so I can really make, um, I guess, a good example of this in just a second. Well, maybe not too large. That's a pretty big image. But let's download the large one. And now this is going to go into my downloads folder, and I actually want this to live beside my hello world and second page, and that's on my desktop. So I need to open up that folder and move it into my desktop, otherwise this is not going to work. So if I just copy this file here, go over to my desktop, paste it, and where are you? Right there. Let's call this Caleb's image. It's not actually my image, I didn't take this image. XPS took this image, but I'm going to call it Caleb's image just for the sake of keeping it simple. So let's go back to here, and then let's go, oh, let's close that, we don't need that open anymore. And let's go to VS Code. And now let's add an image. Now this is interesting because images don't have text. So does it need a closing tag? And the answer actually is no. So let's go ahead and create an H3 in here. H3, let's call this images. And to create a new image is the IMG tag. It's not image, it's IMG. Now if I close this, there's actually two ways to close this. So this is a self-closing tag, meaning it does not have slash image. That's not how this one works, because there's no text, there's nothing else to display. Instead, we're going to use an attribute. And so, we can just say, there's an image here, and you might actually see it close like this. This is called XHTML, this is an older way of doing things, and totally valid still. I write a lot of code this way because I'm a little older school, but it's still completely valid. Or you can just write IMG, and you want the source of the image, the SRC for source, is equal to Caleb's image, Dot. Now this is important, you need to know that file extension. And that file extension here was .jpg. JPG. Now if yours is uppercase .jpg like this, or like this, make sure it matches. It has to be perfect. So mine was not that, mine was .jpg. I can go ahead and save this, and let's scroll down to where it's supposed to show up, and we're going to see this giant image, and this is actually why I wanted this huge image here, is because this was a really large image. Now, cool, the image showed up, but it's just way too big. Now what we can do is we can add a second attribute. We can say the width is supposed to be, and this is going to be in pixels, let's say 500. Let's go ahead and save that, and what this is going to do is make that image a width of 500 and automatically scale the height for me. So if I right click and inspect, What's cool about this, it says width 500, but you can actually see as I hover over the image, it says the image is 500 by 281 by 0.25. Now, if we wanted to skew this, and I don't know why you would want to, but if you ever wanted to skew an image, you can add a width and a height. And you could say the height is going to be, let's say, 200. So this is going to look a little bit off now. You can see it's a little bit squishier. Let's make this pretty extreme and change the height to 100. So now we have. 500 by 100, if I hover over, you can actually see over in my viewport, it says IMG 500 by 100. Now, maybe we don't want to scale an image by its width. Maybe we want to scale it by its height. We ever, and there will be times where you want to scale an image by its height or just its width, one or the other, not necessarily both. So let's say for whatever reason we're working with a designer and the designer says, no, the image has to be a maximum height of 100 pixels. We say, okay, height is equal to 100, save, and let's go ahead and refresh. This is now a height of 100 and a width, whatever that automatically was, is 177.77 and our browser works that out for us. So just as a recap, we could say, we have an image element. There is no closing tag because, well, what are we going to close? There's no content to put between two tags. We're using attributes here. The source, the SRC, is equal to Caleb's image.jpg. And this could also be a link to a particular image on the web, web like http website.com slash image.jpg. It could be something like that. It can use absolute or relative URLs. And so we're using a relative URL. We have a second attribute, width is equal to 500, 
third attribute height is equal to 100, and this makes our really weird looking image. And this entire thing is the image element. Now there's a lot more we could add, and actually I'm going to add this in here anyways. Uh, two things. Let's go ahead, because this is getting kind of big. Let's throw this on separate lines, just because, you know, we can. Because white space doesn't matter. And let's add an alt. And alt is going to be the text that shows up when a screen reader is trying to read your image, trying to describe what the image is. Or if the text, or not the text, but if the image breaks, what text to show. So, show me. And let's go ahead and change this to dot missing dot image. So this is not a file on my computer. This is not going to work. This image is going to break for me. And you can see broken image and it says show me. That's the alt text. And if I just undo that, I'm just changing it back to my regular image here. The alt text doesn't show up. That's perfect. We don't want it to show up. We want the image to show up. But just in case the image doesn't show up, we have a fallback. So that's how we add an image. What I would like you to do now is add an image to your page, to your Hello World page. Remember, you can get any sort of images you want from unsplash.com and just use any image that you like. It doesn't really matter what the image is. Okay, welcome back. Hello, hello, hello. In the last video, we created an image. We used the SRC, width, height, and the alt attributes. In this video, in this lesson, what we're going to do is make this a link because if I go back to my page, I can't click that. It goes nowhere. And we need this to actually go somewhere. Well, we don't need to, but maybe we want this to. Maybe we want this to go to our second page.html. So let's go ahead and wrap our image in an anchor. So we say a h r e f is equal to, and I can fill that in in just a second. I'm going to select that. And all I'm doing is tabbing this in just because I am pretty keen on nice tabbing. And then we do slash a. So we have an opening tag and a closing tag, and that means it's going to go around our image. And then for our href, let's do second page.html. And that's going to go to our second page.html. And so if I refresh this, it looks like nothing's changed, but I can now actually click it. And you can see at the bottom left there, it says second page.html. If I click this, it goes to my page. Go back home, scroll on down, and now we have an image that goes to another page. Now, all we've really done here is nested an image inside of an anchor tag. And this is why nesting was really important to learn to begin with. We learned about images, we learned about anchor tags, and now we're just mixing the two together. So what I would like you to do is this exact same thing. Grab an image, whatever image from unsplash.com, make sure it shows up on your page, and then link to another page. You could even just link to google.com if you wanted to, or some other web page out there if you don't have a second page already built out. You can link to anywhere on the internet, your Facebook profile, your LinkedIn profile, anything like that. Alrighty, hello. Let's take a look at horizontal rules and line breaks. So first things first, uh, I'm going to work on one of the paragraphs that we actually have at the very beginning. We created these two paragraphs here. And so I've got a paragraph and I've got a second paragraph. And let's say I want some sort of line in between them. I have this thing called an HR, a horizontal rule. And because it doesn't take any text inside of it, it does not need a closing tag. Again, this is a self-closing tag, just like image. Let's go ahead and save this. And it should show up right in here. And so when I go and refresh, bam, there it is. It shows up right there. And a horizontal rule is a block element. It's going to take up the full width, as you can see. It takes up the full width, and all it is is a line between your text. So it's really good for separating headers or content or things like that. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you was a BR tag. So we have a horizontal rule, but we also have a BR tag. So let's say we wanted to separate this onto its own line, but not its own paragraph, but we wanted it to look like this. So our, we have our first line of lorem here, and then odio, sunt, whatever, whatever. Uh, is on its own line as well. Okay, so I just saved that and VS Code just automatically fixed that up for me. Uh, so if I go back to the page, nothing's changed. And again, be, that's because in HTML, white space is not important. Your browser doesn't care about it. What it does care about is if you want a new line, you can just type BR. And this is simply a line break. BR for break. 
And if I save and refresh my page, we're going to see that right here is going to be a new line, just like that. So this started a new line over here. And now we have a horizontal rule and a line break side by side. Or I guess not side by side, but you know, in the same lesson. Uh, what I would like you to do is give both of those a shot. This is super easy. Shouldn't take you more than about 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds. Create a horizontal rule and then create a line break inside of a paragraph. Let's take a look at HTML comments. So a comment is basically a piece of code you can write and that's not going to be executed by your browser. And it looks like this. So it's less than sign. You can see that all of our HTML elements look like that. One of those weird times where we actually see an exclamation mark and then a dash and a dash and then we can put our text here. And then it ends with a dash dash and then a greater than sign. And so if I save this and it typically so far, it would show up above my welcome to HTML 101 text. But if I go back here, hit refresh, it doesn't show up at all. However, if I right click view page source, there it is. So don't ever put passwords, secrets, credit cards, answers to anything. Don't put anything secret in there because it's not actually secret. It is 100% accessible to all of your users. So this is not a good place to write secrets. What it is good for is explaining what we're doing. So we can say, this is a tutorial. And let's maybe break this onto separate lines. This is a tutorial course on HTML. We are learning HTML from scratch. And so again, I can save that, come back here, refresh my source code. And you can see the source code has actually changed. Go back here, refresh the actual page, and it's not rendered. And this is called an HTML comment. I say this is an HTML comment. Now what's really cool about this is you can actually comment out existing code as well. So let's go ahead and comment this out. So let's do the opening sign. And you can see it turned all of my text gray all the way down to my page, to the bottom of my page. Uh, and let's go over here and close that. And you can see the syntax highlighting kicks in again, lets me know that things are working the way I want them to work. Save that. And because I have commented this out, it's still going to show up in the source code. We see it here, it's in the source code. But because it's between an opening and closing comment syntax, let's refresh and we can see that it no longer shows up. The browser says it's a comment, do not execute it, do not render it. It's really just a useless piece of text to the browser. It's more useful to humans than it is to computers. And that's an HTML comment. Now you're going to see some of these every now and then. It's not too often you see these, but when you do see them, just know that this is the stuff that's not going to show up when you load your page. Okay, let's take a look at lists. There are two types of lists. There is an ordered list and an unordered list, and we'll demo both of these. Now this is interesting because this is one of those elements that requires nesting. And again, it's important to know about nesting here. So I'm gonna throw a title in here called lists. Now the first one I want to tackle is an ordered list, an OL. Now we could say something in here, and let's preview this. Scroll down my page and it says something in here, but it doesn't actually know what to do. Um, it's sort of like a list, but if I wanted to make, make a second bullet point, this just doesn't work. What we can do is say, because this is a list, it needs a list item. And all I'm doing here is saying list item opening tag, list item closing tag, and now we have two elements that are nested inside of our ordered list. So save and refresh, and now it lists for us. One, two, three, so on, so on, so on. It counts for us. I didn't write one, I didn't write two. That's an ordered list. Now an unordered list, very, very similar, but it's not going to have the counting. It's just going to have bullet points. So I could do UL, and then I could do LI, and this is a list item. Hit tab because I have that Emmet abbreviation. Point number one, copy that entire line down to the one below it, point two, copy that entire line to the one below it, and I'm just using control C and control V, or command C and command V. And that copies my entire line for me. Let's go ahead and save that. And refresh, and we have bullet points. 
And so as we progress through HTML, you're getting a little bit more familiar with nesting and opening and closing tags and attributes and things like that. This is going to get a lot easier. And you've probably already noticed that if you've gone through all of the, all of the videos up until this point, that an ordered list, you already sort of know the syntax. You know that this is a nested element and that there's some text in there and that it has a closing and an opening tag. And then if we want another one, we just have another child element. So we've got a child li here, child li here, and the parent ol. And at this point, it's getting really, really easy for you to learn. And an example of that is the unordered list. So an ordered list has the numbering, obviously, because it's called an ordered list. But an unordered list doesn't have it. It just has bullet points. But the syntax is almost identical. The only thing we've changed here really is from ol to ul. And so you can see from here on out that learning HTML is just going to get faster and faster and faster. You're already learning all of the basics very, very quickly. So that's how we make a list. If you'd like to pause the video here, go ahead, hit pause and try this out on your own. Make sure it shows up in your browser when you're nice and ready. Let's head on over to, to that next lesson. Let's talk about CSS tags. So this one is really interesting. We've only actually dealt with one element inside of our head, but with CSS, we could, well, actually we could put it anywhere, but typically we put it in our head. And this one is a style. This is a style element. And what I'm saying here is CSS, and this stands for cascading, cascading style sheets. <laughs> there we go, cascading style sheets. And I can comment that out so it doesn't actually show up in the browser. Now, what's interesting here is this does not accept HTML. Isn't that weird? So we're writing HTML, but this does not accept HTML. And at this point, we're getting into this thing called CSS, Cascading Style Sheets, which is a way for us to style our page. What this does take is CSS markdown, markup. Yeah, CSS language. And this is very, very different. This does not look like HTML at all. And you do not need to know this for this particular course, but this is a good transition into what you would be learning next. So let's say we wanted to change the entire background color to black, and we wanted to change all the color, the text color to white. We can do that. We can say body, and you can see that this matches the element. And all we're going to do is an opening curly brace, background dash color and you can see VS Code is very helpful. It's helping me understand what I'm supposed to be writing. Change that to black. And then I can change the font color and you can actually see that MDN reference shows up, sets the color of an element's text color, white. And so this is going to select this element, the body and everything in it. And it's going to try to apply these rules to it. So if I go back here and hit refresh, check that out. Our page now has white text with a black background. Now, again, this is not something you need to know. And honestly, I would say don't learn it, but I needed to show you what this is because you're going to see this style element all over the place. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment this out as well. Refresh my page and bring it back to normal. Now, if you wanted to, by all means, give this a shot. Feel free to experiment with it but know that you still have a lot more HTML to learn. You need to learn how to add videos and audio and things like that. And you need to learn those things before we learn CSS, or at least you should. That, that's a lot easier to learn one thing at a time instead of learning two things at a time. But if you wanted to experiment, have some fun with it, by all means, go for it. But this is the style tag. This is your CSS. And once again, no, you don't need to know this. I just wanted to show you this. Just as a heads up, you're going to see this tag in the wild in other source code that you view, like on google.com, for instance, there's going to be some in there. Facebook.com probably has some. Instagram.com probably has, has some style elements inside of their HTML. So it's a common thing. And I just wanted to make sure you would be familiar with it. All right, we're done with CSS. Let's head on over to the next one where we learn basically the same concept, but for JavaScript. Hello and welcome to the world of JavaScript. Okay, so there are two things I want to talk about. One is how we add JavaScript to a page. There's a couple ways to do that. And the second way, or the second thing I want to talk about is do not learn JavaScript right now. It's going to be very tempting. You're going to hear people in Facebook groups and learning groups and LinkedIn groups and other courses saying you need to learn JavaScript. 
but that's not true. You need to learn HTML before you learn JavaScript. JavaScript is used to modify and work with HTML. And if you don't know HTML very well, you're not going to be able to learn JavaScript. So you need HTML first. That said, I'm going to show you how to add some JavaScript in here. So it starts with the script tag. And in here, again, because it's HTML, it doesn't really care about white space. However, we do not write HTML in here. We don't. We write JavaScript. We write JavaScript, or JS for short, in here. That is what's important. Okay? So always remember that. I see a lot of people trying to write like a div inside of their script and it doesn't work. And that's because anything between the two script tags here, the opening and closing tag, your browser thinks is JavaScript and not HTML. And that's important to know because if you've taken my other course about web fundamentals, there are different engines in your browser. You have an engine for rendering HTML, an engine for render rendering CSS, and an engine for rendering JavaScript. And it's saying, hey, use the JavaScript engine for this, not the HTML one. So let's go ahead and create an example here. Hello world. And you do not need to know this right now, but this is JavaScript. And all this is going to do is when I load the page, it's going to give me a little pop-up. So when I go back to my page, hit refresh, it says hello world. And then it shows my page. So it's executing the JavaScript and then the HTML. So that's one way. The other way you're going to see this tag being used is script. And what happens if I click this one? Oh, right there. That's perfect. Is instead of having all of your code in your page, you can have this code in another file like test javascript.js, and you don't need that in here. You can get rid of that, and that code can live in another file. And so all we're saying here is use the script tag. So, hey, uh, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, uh, there's a JavaScript that I want you to render in here. The source, just like an image, let's scroll back up just like an image src source is equal to and then whatever the file name is now this is a relative file a lot like this relative link so it should be in the same folder now if this doesn't exist nothing's going to happen if this does exist but there's nothing in there nothing's going to happen you actually need some javascript to execute and again that's not something we need to know right now but what i'm going to do is boom comment that out and that's just an html comment and that makes sure that my browser says, hey, anything between this opening tag and this closing tag or the syntax, don't render it. It's allowed to live in there in the source code, but do not actually execute it. And if I go back to Chrome and I refresh the page, that alert goes away. So perfect. Now, again, you do not need to know this. The reason why I wanted to show you this is because you're going to see scripts a lot. In today's modern web, there is a lot of JavaScript. And again, you need to know HTML in order to know JavaScript very well but you're going to see a lot of scripts all over the place. And so when you see this, just know that everything in between the opening and closing script tag is actually going to be JavaScript and not HTML or CSS. Okie dokie, let's take a look at one cool thing here. So while you're learning to write code, you're going to want to be able to share your code with people. And it's really, really hard to safely share this kind of code with people. People put their files in zips and then share them in Facebook groups and it looks really spammy and nobody knows if it's actually safe to download. And then if you have a question, your question doesn't get answered. It's just this whole thing that you want to avoid. There is a better way. So what you can do is you can go to codepen.io and I want to create a new pen. Uh, oh, look at that, all sorts of stuff. But I just want to create a regular new pen in here. And what this is going to do is give me HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to work with. Now, at this particular time, if you're taking this course, you probably don't need to know JavaScript, and you probably don't need to know CSS. You probably just need to know HTML. Now, in here, you can write anything. Hello, world. And it just takes a second, but it does. It eventually rent, it renders for you. Now, the thing is, you do not need your doc type. You do not need HTML. You do not need body. You don't need those tags. What you do need is everything between the body tag all the way down to the closing body tag, right there. So we can now copy, right click, paste, and this isn't necessarily going to show my images because while well, I'm saying, hey, CodePen, look for 
uh, not second page, but Caleb's image.jpg. And this is where the alt text kicks in. And so it can't find that because it doesn't know. It's a website. It's not on my computer. And so it's looking for Caleb's image.jpg on the server on someone else's computer. They don't have it yet, so that's not going to work. So just a heads up there. But, you know, as you're writing more and more HTML and CSS and JavaScript down the road, you can do all of this in a code pen. Now, the nice thing is you can name this. So, hello world. Let's go ahead and save that. And I just created a free CodePen account, by the way. It's completely free. You do not need to pay for CodePen. So please, while you're learning, do not pay for CodePen. You never need to pay for it. And you get this nice little link. And so if I open this up in another tab, I just copied and pasted that link. It shows up. And if I have another tab, paste it in there, it shows up. And what's really nice is it's saving all of your code. And so if you need to share your code in the Learning to Code Facebook group or in a project section on this platform, or really you need to share your code with a friend or a developer or a mentor or anyone whatsoever, even if you just want to show this off to your, your spouse, your friends, your family, you can just send them this link with all the code in it. This is a really, really good way to share your code. And it's a safe way to share your code. So people don't have to worry about downloading weird zip files or Google Drive or using Dropbox or anything like that. It's just simply CodePen. And tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people are using CodePen. It is completely safe. It's been around for a very long time. It's not going anywhere. This is a good service to use when you need to share your code. So when you're sharing your code, please share your CodePen link. Okay, if you need some extra support, I have a massive support group for you. So obviously you can ask questions down below. Please do if that's your thing. Ask questions down below. But if you want answers right away, like within minutes, sometimes even seconds, you're going to want to join some sort of support group. Now, learning HTML is actually quite easy. It's considered one of the easiest things to learn in web development. But that doesn't mean it's easy for everybody. And so if you need a little extra support, you can go to facebook.com and let's search in here for learning to code. And this group currently has 56,905 members. This is a group that I've created a long time ago. And again, there's 56,000 members in there. There's questions being asked all the time, people answering things all the time. For example, uh, hi, self coders. My name is Dragos. Uh, he's got a good question in here, 132 comments. If I keep scrolling down, uh, I mean, I participate in this. I mean, it is my group. Who here is interested in learning how web requests and web responses work? 59 comments. Can I posted that 11 hours ago? So there's a lot of discussion in here, but you can ask questions like, how do I make something bold? How do I make something italic? Why is my code not working? Then share your code pen link, please. Don't show a screenshot. Uh, I would highly recommend not showing a screenshot. I would highly recommend uh, not copying and pasting your code into the Facebook group, share it on CodePen, or with CodePen rather. So if you need any additional support, definitely, definitely join the Learning to Code Facebook group. It's completely free. You don't have to sign up for anything. It's completely free. It's just a, a nice little value add that I like to give to my students. But again, you know, even that's optional. You don't have to. But if you would like a little extra support with timely responses, that is a really good place to be. Okay, let's take a look at your project. Your project is going to be relatively easy. You don't have to do everything in here. And remember, you don't have to memorize everything we've written in this course. You can always just Google it too. So if you're like, oh, I know what an H1 is, but I don't remember exactly how to make a link, that's fine. You could Google it. You type in into Google HTML link tutorial, and you're going to find hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of pages that are going to show you exactly how to add a link. So remember, you don't need to actually remember all of this. All you need to know is how to find the answer. And that's honestly about 50% of any job as a web developer these days is just knowing how to find the answers, not memorizing them, but being able to find the answers. So moving on to the project here, what I would like you to do is I would like you to create a new .html file then I would like you to create a header, so like an H1, uh, 
subheader about like what you do, what you want to get into, anything like that. Add an image. And then, and lastly, add a link to your Twitter, Twitter, Insta, Facebook. It doesn't really matter. Just make sure you have at least one link. So let's do this. Create a 2.1. This would be a good time for a nested ordered list, by the way. 2.2. All right, so I just formatted that a little nicer just so that we could all read it together. So create a new HTML file. Uh, make sure you've got a header in there. Put your name in there, a subheader, a subheader like your title, your work description, favorite hobby, anything like that. Add an image of anything. I would say add an image of yourself. Uh, it's totally safe because it's just going to be on your computer. But if you would rather share your project with an image of something else, that's totally okay too. You can always go to unsplash.com and get a free image. Lastly, add a link to either your Twitter, your Instagram, or your Facebook, or just add a link to Google or something. The, the important part here is that you're going to add a link. So go ahead and give that a shot. If you ever get stuck, don't forget you can reference the other videos, or you can continue watching this video and I'll show you exactly how I do it. But I would like you to pause this video here and give this project a shot. Don't forget to share your project down below on this platform, if this platform offers that kind of feature. Otherwise, you can always share your progress with the Learning to Code Facebook group. So pause your video here. I'm going to give this about five seconds, and then I'm going to resume playing, and I'm going to show you exactly how I do this. Okay, so I'm going to create this project. I'm going to show you exactly how I do it. So first things first, new file. And I just did Command N, or you could go to File, new file. Save that. I'm going to save this to my desktop and I'm going to call this caleb.html because this is my portfolio page. This is what I want to do. I need that HTML5 stuff in here. So I don't need the meta. We didn't talk about that. That's a little more advanced. And I don't need lang is equal to English. Again, that's a little more advanced. We don't need to worry about that. I'm going to change the title to Caleb's page. And what did I need to add in here? I needed to add a header that's 2.1 in this list. So a header, h1, I'm going to put my name in here, Caleb Tallinn. h2, I needed a subheader. So let's put something smaller in here, like an h3, senior developer. And I am a premium coding instructor. That's my role in life. The role I have given myself. Um, 2.3, add an image. Okay, so I already know that I have one image in here. It's not an image of me, but it is an image. And this is from a previous lesson. So I can do it. image src is equal to Caleb's image.jpg. And that's just in the same folder as this file. All of this lives on my desktop. It's in the same folder. Alt, Caleb Tallinn. And I want to give this a width so it's not huge of, I don't know, like 400. Lastly, I need a paragraph, right? No, I needed a link, but also I'm going to add a paragraph anyways. I don't really want to write a whole paragraph, so I'm going to throw some lorem in here. Uh, and then I needed a link to, let's say, Twitter. So this link could just be an anchor tag. A H R E F is equal to HTTPS, twitter.com slash Caleb Tallinn. You can also find me on Instagram if that's your jam. And let's put at Caleb Tallinn. And that's all there is to it. So I can go back to my browser and I can go file, open file, and open up Caleb.html. Let's hope I don't have any typos in there because that's going to be a little bit embarrassing. And boom, there is my HTML page. I've got an H1, I've got an H3 for my subtitle, I've got an image, and I have some lorem text in there. I just sort of threw that in willy nilly at the last minute there, and a link to my Twitter which brings me right to Twitter. And that's all there is to it. So I went pretty fast there, and I did that on purpose so that you'd have to pause and, and you might have to think a little bit harder. I want you to really work at something like this. But when you're done, please share your progress down below. Lastly, thank you so much for taking the time to take this course. I hope you learned something great and fun and new. And if you ever want to check out any of my other courses, just hit the link to my profile on this platform. You can see all of my courses are available here as well.
including what to learn next, such as more advanced HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, PHP, a bunch of projects in between, all sorts of stuff. Thanks again for taking this course, and I hope to see you in another one. All right, first things first, we need to clarify a few things. So when we created a base structure in the HTML 101 course, and let's just change this over from plain text to HTML. And by the way, I'm using VS Code. If you're using a different editor, all I did was go to File, which is just outside of my recording area, and then New File. So Command N or Control N will create a new file for you. And it automatically thought it was a plain text file, so I clicked down here where it used to say plain text, typed in HTML, and selected HTML. And that just gives us nice little goodies like this. We can do HTML colon 5, hit Tab for autocomplete using VS Code, and it gives us a bunch of stuff in here. So I'm going to actually go ahead and delete some of this, and I'm going to call this HTML 201. Now, we learned at some points that we have a, a paragraph, we could put some lorem ipsum in there, and we could say, for instance, that this should be underlined. Something like that. Now, if I save this as, let's go in here and name this index.html, and I just saved that into a particular folder that I had called HTML201, uh, and I called it index.html, but if I open up Google Chrome, or any sort of browser, whichever your favorite browser is, you can go to File, and then Open File, so Control-O or Command-O, Go to my folder here and let's just open this up. And we can see that this, once I zoom in, is underlined. And that's cool, it does what we want, but unfortunately underline is deprecated. So it was okay to learn this a little while ago just because we needed to make that underline, but there's a better way to do this. And the better way to do this would probably be to add a span in here. And let's go ahead and change this to a span element. And all this is is a simple inline element. And you should be familiar with block elements versus inline elements at this point. And what we're going to do is work with this style attribute. And this style attribute allows us to write CSS. So you don't need to actually know too much CSS right now, but if you want underline, I would say maybe, maybe try to memorize this particular one. I tell people all the time, you don't need to memorize too much. I mean, you can always Google it, how to add underline using CSS. That'll work as well. So I'm going to do text-decoration colon, space, underline. Now, if I save that, go back to my page and refresh, it should look like nothing changed. And that's perfect. And I can always check by right-clicking and clicking inspect. And you can see in my inspect tool down here that there is, in fact, a span with text decoration underline. And if I wanted to, I can actually toggle that on and off now, which is really, really nice. So moving forward, whenever we use underlines, let's go ahead and use text decoration underline instead of using the U element. Just because the U element is deprecated, it's from old versions of HTML and CSS can now do this. And we prefer to use CSS whenever we can. Okay, let's take a look at internal links. So actually, let's, let's recap first. So how do we create a link? We create a link, and I'll make this just a touch bigger here. We create a link with the A anchor at element and the href attribute and that could go to http website.com go to website.com and this is just going to show us a little link up here and it's going to go to website.com whatever is on that site so that's how we create a link but what if we wanted to link to something else in the page so let's go ahead and actually make this page look a little nicer so let's say h1 Welcome to HTML 201. And let's create a link. And we don't know what this link is going to be yet, but we know it's going to say scroll to bottom of page. And we can get rid of this one because that's not necessary anymore. That was just an example. So now when I do this, I click scroll to bottom of page and it does nothing. It's because it's going nowhere. You can see that there's no href and there's no hyperlink reference. So let's say we have this really, really long page. And let's go ahead and copy this a bunch of times. And I don't really care too much about the formatting at this moment. I just want the page to scroll like this. And I want when we click the link to go to the bottom of the page and maybe have a link at the bottom of the page to bring us back up to the top. So let's do that. Let's say 
there's going to be, let's say like an H3, and we're going to give this an ID. And this is a unique identifier for this element. So it should never have two of the same ID in the same page. So let's call this bottom. And this is the bottom of the page. And when I refresh, you can see it just as the bottom of the page, nothing happened. The ID didn't do anything particular. But if we go back up to our link, we can actually type in number sign ID. Now, whatever that ID is going to be. Now, that ID that we wrote was bottom. Go down here, ID is equal to bottom. Save that. And I'm just going to refresh up here. And you can see my link actually changed color. And you can actually see it says index.html number sign bottom. And when I click this, boom, it brings me to the bottom. So it doesn't do a smooth scroll, but it does jump me to the very bottom of the page, which is actually quite important for long content pages. Now let's go ahead and create a link to bring us back up to the top. So maybe let's remove this as an H3 and let's make this a little more hidden. Let's create a div in here. And you can see we're going to be getting a little more advanced with this. ID is equal to bottom, but we know IDs can or should be completely unique. So let's go ahead and get rid of this one. We can actually get rid of that whole line. And let's put a link in here that's going to go back up to the top. Back to top. Now, because this is an internal link, this needs an ID somewhere on the page called top. So let's scroll back up to our code here and let's give this an ID of top. And let's refresh our page and give this a shot. And that zoomed way out for me. I want to zoom back in. And this should scroll me all the way to the bottom. Boom, just like that. Or not scroll, but jump me to the bottom. And this should jump me back up to the top, just like that. So now we have internal links. What I would like you to do is create a page that's long enough that you actually create a scroll bar here. Or what I did was, because this page actually wasn't very long, you can always just open up your inspect tool. And if you shrink it, or if you bring it up high enough, it'll sort of shrink your viewport and you'll have a scroll bar and you can test it out that way, like this. Go ahead and give that a shot. Once you're ready, let's head on over to that next lesson. Let's take a look at favicons. Favicons are these little icons that show up right next to your page title. Now we don't actually have a favicon set. Uh, we have a title, which is cool, but what if we want something a little bit custom? We can actually add that as well. We can customize it to be whatever we want. Now, typically, it should be an image that's 32 pixels by 32 pixels, so it's pretty small. I'm not exactly going to follow that rule because I know it's going to shrink it down, but if you want it to be properly sized, maybe have proper translucency or transparency or anything like that, then, yeah, you're going to want a 32 by 32 image. Uh, but I'm just going to use a random image that I have from the Coding for, uh, coding for Everybody branding. So... Let's open up our code here. And in our head, what we're going to create is the link element. And we can do link colon favicon. And it gives us all sorts of stuff in here. Now, by default, it wants us to use a .ico. That's an older format. We don't have to do that. We can use, let's say, a .png. Now, this is just like linking to an image or a CSS or a JavaScript file. We actually need to make sure that this works. And you'll notice that we're using three attributes here. So we've got the link element, we've got the rel, or the relation, like what is it? It's a shortcut and it's an icon. A hyperlink reference to wherever that image is going to be, and then the image type. Now we don't want the image type to be X icon, we want the image type to be PNG because I'm going to be using a PNG. Likewise, if you're using a JPEG, it would be JPEG. Alternatively, JPEG with an E, but we're using PNG. Now it's at this point, I might actually want to use my editor a little bit more. So what I would like to do is instead of just having one file open, I'm going to open this whole folder. I'm going to go file, open. I'm going to go to my desktop where this folder is. And I only have index.html in there. Let's go ahead and open that. And it really looks like it didn't do a whole lot, except added this explorer bar. Now, if that explorer bar does not show up, you can always go to, where are you? It's somewhere in here. View, Explorer, right there. View Explorer, that'll always turn it on for you. So let's click index.html, and this is just the page that I was working on. And in here, I also want some sort of image to link to. So I'm going to open up my finder. I'm going to copy this particular image. I came prepared to this lesson with an image. 
called Coding for Everybody Favicon.png. I'm just going to copy that entire name. And you can see as I copied it into that folder, VS Code was like, oh, there's a new file. Okay, let's, let's put that in there as well. Now we can preview it. So this is what the image is going to look like. And all I have to do is because I copied that file name, I'm just going to paste that file name. And we're not using slashes or dot dots or anything like that. We're, we're not using this or let's say favicons. We're not doing anything like that. We want to make sure this is in the same folder as our index.html just to keep this simple for now. And you can tell it's in the same folder because we're in the HTML 201 folder over here. And there's index.html and coding for everybody favicon.png. Let's go ahead and save this. And let's refresh this page. And you can see that favicon now showed up. Now, if you're using another browser and it does not show up, that could be because of one of two reasons. There's a typo and you haven't actually added the image properly. I'll show you how to debug that in just a second. Or there is caching. And I know browsers like Microsoft Edge like to cache pretty hard. Uh, so you might actually have to do a hard reload or open up another browser uh, just because your browser is going to try to get this, this image once and then try to cache it for a very, very long time. Now, if this doesn't show up for you, let's go ahead and do this. QWERTY doesn't show up in there. And you can actually see with my inspect tools open, there's one error. If I go over to my console, you can see network error, error file not found, and it's looking for QWERTY coding for everybody, favicon. Uh, da, 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 dot png. And that just simply does not exist. So if you open up your inspect tools and there's a typo in there or the file doesn't exist, you'll see the error right there. And I'm just going to undo that. And there we go. We have a favicon. So if you're following along with me, what I would like you to do is find a small little image, something like this, and add it as your favicon to the page that you're working on. All right, let's talk about something that's kind of complex and kind of tricky because this one is going to trick a lot of people for a very long time, uh, including myself. And I'm talking about pathing. So we've put everything into one particular folder right now, but what if we wanted another folder? What if we wanted to move our favicon into a folder called images slash favicons? And we could just click and drag that right in there. And so we've got a folder in here called images and then another folder called favicons and then a file in here called coding for everybody. So in that last lesson, we created a favicon. But when I refresh the page, we're going to see that we get that error file not found. It does not exist because it's not in that same folder anymore. It's not in the same folder as index.html. But what we can do is we can say, go to the images folder, slash, the favicons folder, slash, and then our file name. So let's go ahead and save this, or refresh anyways, and uh, yeah, that shows up for us. So that's pathing. That's how we get into a path. So we just said folder name slash another folder name. And by the way, don't use spaces. I know a lot of Windows users like to use spaces, but in things like this, do not use spaces. It's a lot easier if you use underscores or dashes, but please don't use spaces. You're going to run into a lot of problems. Uh, so folder name slash folder name slash, and then the file name. Simple as that. Now let's go ahead and add an image uh, into the just the images folder here. Not the favicons folder, but just the images. So let's go ahead and go to unsplash.com and let's get an image of a computer because we're working on computers. Good enough. And let's download this one for free. Let's get the small version of this one because that's all we need. I would like to say thank you to Glenn. Karsten's Peters. This is a sweet photo. Thanks for letting me use it. Let's go ahead and show this in the finder. And I'm going to open this up. I'm just copying this file. Let's go ahead and throw this into here. And I'm going to rename this to computer.jpg. And in my editor, you can actually see this turned into a proper folder now. Now there's subfolders in here, but in images, I've got a folder called favicons and a folder, or not a folder, but an image, a file called computer.jpg. Now I'm going to get rid of a bunch of these P elements because well, we don't really need them. And we're going to make this page long anyway, so that internal link to the top and the bottom of the page is going to work perfectly fine eventually. Probably not right now because the page is kind of short. But let's go ahead and add an image. 
and that src is going to be images, that's the folder name, and then the file name is computer.jpg. Let's give it an alt, computer, and that's it. So if we go back to our page and we refresh, we can see this image shows up now. And that's in the images folder. Now, again, if that doesn't work for you, uh, let's just make sure that you always have things typed properly. It is case sensitive. So if your folder is called images lowercase, do not write images uppercase. That's just not going to work for you. So let's do images uh, break me and let's refresh. We can see the alt text shows up there and in my console, you can actually see error not found. So that's pathing into a folder. Now let's say someone goes into the, the images folder because we can do this. We know that HTML 201 is a folder. We also know that images is a folder. So let's do this. Let's go to slash images. And we can actually see that we have favicons, a folder, and we have computer.jpg. But let's say we actually wanted something to show up here. What we can do is go into our images folder, create a new file. We want to call this index.html, and that just means use this page by default. This is the default page that your browser is going to look for. So even if you don't land on this page, it's going to try to use this page anyways, just by default. Uh, my VS Code is set up to use Django templates by default, but let's change that to HTML5. And let's do HTML colon 5. Images folder is going to be the title name. And in the body, let's just say, hi, 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 hi. All right, so I just refreshed the page there. We have this index.html file, and it's not showing our page by default, but this is a good practice because once it gets onto a server, index.html is going to be the page that shows up by default. So it's going to look just like you clicked into it, just like this, but it's not necessarily going to say index.html. That's not a thing you need to really remember at this point in time, but it is a cool little thing that you can do with live servers, live websites down the road. So now we have this index.html file in our images folder. Let's link up a page. So let's say h3, this is the images folder, and let's create a link in here, an anchor link with a hypertext, hypertext reference. And we're going to use a relative page. So we're going to say go up one folder, and that's how we do that. We go dot dot up one folder. If we needed to go up one more folder, because this is already in the images folder, we need it to be outside. We could do dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash. Every one of these you can actually see is going up a folder in my computer. Now I don't want any of that. I just want up one, and I want to be able to select not the images folder but index.html, and that's going to be referencing this one here. The naming gets a little bit confusing because we have two index.html files, but that's okay. And VS Code was smart enough to figure out what we were trying to do. Go back home is what I'm going to say in there. Let's refresh this page. Make this just a bit bigger. And we can go back home, and when I click it, it goes back to the HTML 201 homepage. So that's pathing in a nutshell. To move up a folder, use dot dot slash. To move into a folder, you don't use the dot dot slash, you just specify the folder name, slash, subfolder name, if there is one, slash, and then your file name. And that is pathing in a nutshell. Okay, let's take a look at tables. Tables are wildly important to us right now because they're going to enable us to actually create some sort of layout for our page. Now, admittedly, layouts aren't really created with tables anymore. This is a very old way of doing things, but because we don't know CSS and we don't know JavaScript yet, this is the only way that we have. And that is 100% acceptable because even though we're going to be using tables in a way that's not really used anymore, we are going to be learning all about how to use tables properly because they're still used for things like feature sets or pretty much any government website because they all still use tables for some reason. Yeah, so tables are still used. Emails use table, tables all the time. It's a really important skill to have. So I'm going to go down here, and in this lesson, I'm just going to show you how a table is created, but we're not actually going to do anything with it yet. So don't feel like you have to code along with me. So a table is a table element, just like this. And inside of this, we have table rows called TRs, or I can do TR and then tab. We can have another table row, TR tab. And then inside of each table row, the cells are called table cells or TDs, table data cells. Cell one. And let's go in here and do TD. 
sell to. And by the way, if you're sort of just new to this this course and I'm going a little too fast for you, what I did there was I could type in table and because it's an HTML element, I can type in table and as soon as I see that Emmet abbreviation, I can hit the tab key on my on my keyboard and it just creates it into HTML elements for me. So now we're getting into some nice nesting and in HTML 101, we learned all about nesting. So we know that this whole thing is going to be a table, including the child and grandchild elements. This whole thing is a row, including its child elements. And this single element here is going to be a cell. And this one is going to be cell two. And if we just refresh our page here, scroll on down, we can see cell one, cell two, nothing fancy really happening there. It doesn't look like anything's happened, but what if we give this a border of one? we now actually have a table. We can do more with this too. We can say the width is going to be 100%. And it takes up the whole thing. Uh, we could add another cell. And this one's going to be cell 1.2, I guess. And we could add cell 1.3. And we can go up, so on and so on. So anyways, we're going to get into this in much more depth in the next couple of lessons. But I just wanted to quickly show you that this is how we create a table. Let's take a look at table rows and cells. So to create a table, we do this table slash table. And that is all we really need to do to create a table. But inside of a table consists of two primary elements, a table row. And that's what TR stands for. TR is equal to a table row. And inside of each row, we have cells or table data cells. So a TD is equal to a table data cell and so let's do td tab and let's create our first cell first cell here and let's flip on over to our browser and just hit refresh we're going to see our first cell well, we can't actually see it we can inspect it if we wanted to and we can see that we are in fact in a table and our browser is smart enough to say hey there's actually supposed to be a body here so wrap the trs in a t body so this actually goes one level deeper so it goes table T body, TR, TD. Now, I don't have to write the T body because I'm assuming that everything that I'm writing is going to be in the table body anyways, and the browser is making that same assumption. So we can shortcut it that way. Now, to see our progress, I always like to throw a border on here and then just get rid of that border later. So let's do a border of 1 and a width of 100%. Let's refresh, and now we can see we have our first cell. And if we go ahead and add a second cell, this is going to be side by side, which is something we weren't able to achieve with block elements in HTML 101, but now we can. And we can keep doing this, so on and so on. So instead of second cell, we could do third cell, and we can keep adding more and more and more. Now I'm going to get rid of that third cell. I'm going to copy this whole thing over. Actually, I'm not going to copy it. Let's write this out by hand, because this is good practice to write this out by hand. TD, row two, cell one. And if I do another TD, hit tab, row two, cell two. And there we go. We have first cell, second cell, row two, cell one, row two, cell two. And that's how we create table rows and cells. Now, what I would like you to do is give this a shot. I want you to create a two by two table. Create four cells. So you have two rows, two columns and four cells in total. Go ahead and give that a shot. Once you're ready, let's head on over to that next lesson where we dive a little bit more into tables. Let's take a look at merging cells and rows. So this gets really, really interesting and it's not actually super intuitive at first, but it gets a little easier the more you do it. So in the last lesson, we created a two by two table, two rows, two columns. In this one, we want to create a three by three. So I'm gonna do a table here and I want to see my border. I wanna see my progress here. And I'm going to change that width to 100% because I wanted to take up as much space on my page as possible. I don't really want to leave any extra space off to the right. Now, for good measure, we could always do AT body if we wanted to. I didn't do that in the last lesson. I talked about it, didn't do it. That's okay. I'm going to do it this time just to show you that we can do it. So we've got a table row here. We know that this is going to be our first table row. Second row. Third row. And all I'm doing is hashing this out. I'm roughing this out. I'm making it a little bit easier to work with. And now I need, because I have three rows and I need three columns, let's go ahead and create TD, one, 
two. And all I'm doing here to copy the whole row is Command C, Command V, or Control C, Control V. And I'm going to select all of that, copy that, paste it, and paste it in there. So let's go ahead and take a look at what our table now looks like. We've got row one, row two, row three. Or actually, those are columns. I got that backwards. So column one, column two, column three, row one, row two, row three. Now, there's a way to merge cells together. And we can do this actually in a very interesting way. We can do col span. So column span is equal to three. So we have to take a look here. How many columns do we have? One, two, three. We can span three columns. But let's go ahead and save this and see what happens. This number one in row one takes up three spaces, but now there's two more cells in here. Now, if you ever see something like that, you can safely delete those extra cells because they're not needed. We said cool span of three, so take up three column widths. And then we also had some old HTML in there. We just got rid of that. When we refresh our page, we're going to see that row one takes up three columns now. Now, let's go ahead and merge this one and this two together. No, let's not do that. Let's do this two and this three. So we need to go down to row two. So we've got row one here. Let's do row two. And we want to merge these two together. So we can say col span is equal to two because we want this to take up all of number two and all of number three. Let's go ahead and save that, refresh. And now it's taking up that extra spacing as well. Now let's go ahead and merge this one. So row two, cell one and row three, cell one. Let's go ahead and merge those together. So we can actually row, we can merge pieces of rows together as well. So in here, because we want to merge downwards, let's do a row span of two. And let's see what this looks like if I don't adjust this. You can see it displaced another cell, which is not what we want. So we still have one, two, and three in row three, and we don't want that. Let's go ahead and just delete that row one because we've got, we've got a one here, and we have a one here. We don't need both of them. Let's just, let's just delete this one. So delete, save, go back to our browser, refresh, and look at that. So we've got three column widths in our first row. Over here, we've got two column widths. In here, we have two row heights. And we do that with these attributes called row span and call span or column span. Now, this is going to be really important to your final project. So what I would like you to do is give this a shot. Do exactly what I did. Create a three by three table and then start merging rows and cells together and see how it displaces the cells and then try to delete the proper cells and just make it actually work the way you want it to work. Go ahead, give that a shot. If you get stuck, don't forget, you can always ask questions down below or in the Facebook group called Learning to Code. There's over 56,000 members. We can help you within just a few minutes of posting a question. Go ahead, give that a shot, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a look at table widths and cell widths. So I'm gonna delete that table from the last lesson create a new one. And let's give this a border of one. And let's just create some default content in here. We've got a table row, table cell, cell in here. Standard table, we should be somewhat familiar with that by now. So if I go over to my browser, and this is from the last video, if I just refresh, I've got a cell in here, it's not taking up very much space, maybe I want it to take up 50% of the space on this page. And so if I just zoom out, you can actually see it's super, super tiny. And what I can do is I can say width is equal to 50%. So far, I've been saying width is equal to 100%, and it takes up all this width through here. But now I'm saying actually only take up 50%. And I can go into responsive mode here, and I can see that as my page gets smaller, so does that table. Now, that's actually super, super hard to see because that's super, super tiny, but it is becoming smaller and smaller. So it is maintaining that 50% width. And all I did there was click this little icon in Google Chrome, and that sends me into responsive mode. So you can see how things are going to look like on tablets, on mobile, things like that. Now, I'm just going to zoom back in here. And let's change this back to 100% because I want to use more width so I can take up more real estate just for demonstration purposes in the video. It just looks a little bit better. Uh, you don't have to follow exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to add a second row in here. And let's say I had a cell in here and I didn't want it to take up exactly 50% of the table. 
So what our browser here is doing is saying, hey, there's a table. It's 100% width. There's two cells. 100 divided by 2 is each one is 50%. That's all it's doing here. But let's say I wanted that first one to be smaller. We could say in here, width is equal to, and let's give it a 20% in here. Now, before I show you what that looks like, I also want to mention that you can get rid of the percent sign and you can do this in pixels as well. Now that's a little bit harder, it's a little more hard-coded, not always what you want. Percent is usually what people are looking for. But you could also say, instead of a width of 100%, you could say a width of 500 pixels. But I'm going to stick with percentage for now. So I save that, refresh my page, and you can see that this cell actually got smaller. Now you're probably thinking, well, what's, what's the use of that? But if I do this, I can do a new table row, a new cell in here, and I can do col span of equal to, it's supposed to be equal to two, so it's like there's two of them, but it's going to be merged together. Welcome to my website. And in this one, the one where the width is only 20%, we could say something like h3, let's put this on new lines so we can read it, h3, navigation, and in here we could do h3 content let's go ahead and refresh this and we can see welcome to my website that's like the title of my page we've got navigation so we can make a list of links in there and we can put some content in here so now we're working on an actual layout now what i would like you to do is create a table and with just one particular cell i want you to tell it exactly how wide it should be give it a width and as a recap, all we did there was add the width attribute to either the table or the cell. In my case, I did both. So the table is 100% width. And I, then I said the cell should be 20% of that table width. Okay, let's take a look at table headers. Now this one's actually super easy because we've been using the TD element for table data cell. Let's go ahead and use a table header. And all we do here is TH. And I'm going to change this to an HTML file. TH represents a header cell in a table. Let's go ahead and change the closing tag as well. And you're going to see from the last lesson to this lesson, this is what it used to look like, and this is what it's going to look like as soon as I hit refresh. It's now centered and bold. That's a table header. And that's really all there is to it. A table header works the exact same way as a table data cell. The only difference is instead of TD, we said TH. That's it. Nice and short. Once you think you got a hang of that, uh, let's head on over to that next lesson, and I'll meet you over there. Okie dokie, welcome back. Let's take a look at inline CSS. Now, we actually already covered this in the very first lesson, where we said style is equal to text decoration underline. We can do that on pretty much every single element in the body of our page. And by body, I mean the body element. So any element in here, we can add that style attribute to. So let's go ahead and create a div. And in here, let's give it a style attribute and let's change a few things. And I'm just going to give you a little glimpse into CSS. So let's give it a padding of like 40 pixels. Let's give it a font color of white and a background color of, let's say, black so we can read it nicely on the screen. And in here, I can say lorem tab. And that's all I'm going to do. So you can actually see the, the syntax here. And at this point, I probably don't need to explain this syntax to you anymore, but just for good housekeeping, let's go through it anyways. So I created a div space. Style is the attribute is equal to, and then I have everything between quotation marks. Then I've got a CSS uh, declaration in here. So this whole thing is a declaration. You don't need to remember the CSS part, by the way. But this is a CSS declaration. We're saying add padding 40 pixels to the top right, bottom, and left. Change the font color to white, background color to black, and in between each of these declarations, such as this one, we have a semicolon. So it's a little different than HTML, but still very, very readable. And this whole thing here is called inline CSS. So let's go back to our page, and I'm going to hit refresh. And look at that. With just a little bit of effort and knowing just a tiny amount of CSS, we were able to create a padding in here. So we've got spacing here, over here, over here, and over here. We change the background color to black and the font color to white. We can also right click inspect. And if I click on this particular element, 
We can toggle these on and off. This is what padding does. We can change that padding to be higher or lower if we wanted to, which is what we're doing here. And all I did was click in there and I hit the up arrow or down arrow. You can also type if you wanted to. Uh, if you wanted to, you could scroll all the way down in this little window here and you can see that it'll tell you right away that there's a padding of 40 on all four sides. And that is inline CSS. That's really all there is to it. And we can write all of our CSS in there. Now that's actually not a very good way to do it, but occasionally you're going to see that that's actually going to be required. And this is just something that you should be very aware of. Now, this CSS, again, at this point in time, do not feel like you need to know this. After, you, after you're finished HTML 201, this course, definitely feel free to pick up CSS. I have a course on CSS called the CSS Masterclass. It's a huge, huge course. It goes through everything you could think of. Uh, but for now, let's just keep focusing on HTML. Now, if you want to follow along and do exactly what I did, go ahead and pause the video and give us a padding. Remember, it goes whatever we're trying to change, colon, space, and then a value, and then a semicolon. And then what we're trying to change, like the color, colon, space, and then the value, and then a semicolon. And that's how we put three in a row like that. So feel free to give that a shot or not. And when you're done, when you're comfortable, when you're ready, let's head on over to that next lesson. All right, as we dive more and more into HTML, we're going to end up, we're going to end up transitioning a little bit more into CSS. And in this lesson, I want to show you exactly how we can do that uh, right away. So in the last lesson, we looked at padding color and white background. Uh, white color and background color of black. Now let's say we wanted to add that to another div. And so we could write another div in here and we could fill this with some lorem ipsum and then we would have to copy and paste this. Like that. Which is not a big deal, but if we have that 20 or 30 times and then we have to make one change to all of them, so let's say we needed to change white to blue and change white to blue here, we have to do that 20 times. And that gets really... Well, for lack of a better term, it gets really irritating and it takes way too long. And there's a better way to live your life. So I'm going to, first of all, create another div here. And these could just as easily be paragraphs. And let's go ahead and see what we have on our page. We've got a lorem ipsum, a lorem ipsum, and a lorem ipsum. So we've got one, two, and three. Now let's say I wanted to apply this styling to this third one, but not the second one. What we could do is we could actually pull this style attribute out into a style element. Now it just happens to be that they're named the same thing. You can't necessarily pull an attribute name out and turn it into an element and just hope that it works. But in this case we can, so it's just coincidence there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of that, delete it, come up here, paste that in, my style. And so this is not going to do anything, but what I'm looking at here is reusability. So I have this div and I have this div and I want to be able to give these three attributes, these three CSS attributes to both of them. And we can do this with a CSS class. And we can say class name here. I'm just going to select those three, move them back up, put them in there. And so this syntax looks a little weird. We're not going to spend too much time here, but the class starts with a dot, then the name. There's no spaces or anything in it. It is case sensitive, curly brackets, and then the stuff we put inside of our style attribute that we now put into a style element. And what we can do here is I'm going to copy this, but first and foremost, I want to show you that when I refresh the page, nothing happens. My console's not breaking. It's not complaining. I just have three divs with lorem ipsum in it. And what I want to do here is say, in this first one, class is equal to class name here. And you can see VS Code is trying to autofill that for me. And I could also do class is equal to class name here. And so instead of writing style is equal to padding is 40 pixels, color is white, background color is black. Instead of writing that twice, we wrote it once. Looks a little different. And we said class is equal to class name here, class is equal to class name here. Now, when I refresh my page, I save that and refresh the page, 
you'll see that it applies the styling to both sections for me. Now, careful with typos here because I'm using uppercase and lowercase characters here, but if you don't do it right, and I purposely typoed that one, it's not going to show up. But your console's not going to complain either. So you have to keep an eye out for that. Make sure you're typing things properly. If that means you type slower, that means you type slower. That's okay. Now the other thing with classes is we can add multiple classes. So we could add another class here, call it uppercase, and we could do text transform uppercase. Now I already know these because I write a lot of CSS in my day-to-day -day life. But VS Code is also pretty helpful here. So as soon as I typed text, you can see it's trying to give me all sorts of different options in here. There's a lot to CSS. Again, you don't need to memorize all of it if you don't really want to. Uh, you can always just figure out how to Google it. As long as you can figure out how to get the answer, that's what's important. But going back to classes. So I have a second class here. Again, class starts with a dot. That's what this means. It's a lot like saying dot is equal to, or up here, it's a lot like saying class is equal to. We just use dot as a shorthand sort of method. And then let's make one of these uppercase. And we can add uppercase to the second one. Now we need to add a space in here. If you don't add a space, it just looks like this. And your browser is going to think that the class name is called class name here uppercase. Like all one word. It's not. It's class name here, space, and then uppercase as well. And we can add more and more and more if we wanted to, as long as they actually do something. So I've got class name here, space, uppercase. And when I refresh this, we should see that this inherits the same styling, but should also be all uppercase. And look at that. It's like it's shouting at me. And that's all there is to really classes in HTML. A class is a reusable piece of code. It has this little dot here that says it's a class. It has this sort of syntax. Again, you don't need to know this part at, at this point in time. Please focus on the HTML. The HTML that we want to focus on is the attribute called class and how it works. We can have one class name, space, second class name, space, third class name, so on and so on and so on. Okay, welcome back. We have one more thing to cover when it comes to CSS, and it's this idea of an ID. And we've actually done this when we were creating internal links. So we can create a, a link that goes to bottom, or like this one, a link that goes back up to the top of the page. But we're using this ID attribute here. And we can actually style things based on an ID as well. So in the last lesson, we took a look at classes. Classes use a period. But if I scroll on back down here, you can actually see that an ID, like I'm linking here back up to the top, do, 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 do. ID is equal to top. But down here, I'm still linking to it with a number sign, number sign top. And that's going to bring me back up to ID top. Now what that is saying is basically number sign is equal to top. ID is equal to top. It's the same thing. So if we scroll on down, inside of our style attribute here, we can create an ID. Testing ID. And in here, and you'll see that it starts with a number sign. No spaces, no special characters. It's just regular text in here. So don't try to get too fancy with your class names or your ID names. In here, we could do something like border. 5 pixels solid red. Let's actually make this a lot more obnoxious and do 15 pixels solid red. Now, out of the box, this is not going to do anything because we haven't applied this particular testing ID anywhere. Let's go ahead and add it to this middle one. So we've got three divs here. We've got a top div with class name here, bottom div with class name here, and uppercase. And in the middle, we have ID is equal to, and I'll scroll up, testing ID. And you can see that these both match right here. Now the thing with IDs is they are supposed to be 100% unique. Now browsers don't always honor that, but JavaScript will always run into a problem if you have two IDs that are the same. So you don't really need to know what that means at this point in time, but what you do need to know is an ID is just like your driver's license. There should only ever be one copy of it. There should only ever be one version of it. That's your ID. So let's go back to our browser here, and when I hit refresh, we're going to see a 15 pixel red border around here. Just like that, super obnoxious. So just like classes, we can select things by IDs and then add styling to it. And that's where this ID attribute comes from. Now there's nothing to do here. Don't worry, you don't have to actually know all of this right now. You're going to get tons of experience with this in CSS and JavaScript when you go and learn those things. 
But for now, again, let's just keep focusing on HTML. It's just good to know that there's a class attribute and an ID attribute, and this is how it works. Oh, and one last thing, you don't add multiple IDs here. So like how we have class name here, and then a space and then uppercase, and that is selecting this stuff and this stuff. With an ID, we don't do that. With an ID, we just say there's one single thing in here. So we don't do testing ID and another one and another one. We don't do that. We just say there's one. So let that sink in for a couple of minutes. Feel free to meet me over in that next lesson, and we'll get back to HTML. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a look at a few different ways to format code. Format code or code formatting. The first way is this pre tag, P R E. And if we just hover over that long enough, MDN is going to tell us that the pre tag is a pre element that represents a block of pre formatted text in which structure is represented by type of blah, 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 blah. The first, the most important thing here is that it represents pre formatted text some stuff here and let's go ahead and let's just check out what this looks like at first so that's near the bottom here and look at that it actually did something weird it added a bunch of spaces so in html 101 if you remember i preached about this a lot html or not html but your browser does not care about white space however there are a couple cases where it does pre is one of those cases so the pre tag is very white sensitive. And what if we did a second line here, second line here. Now in regular HTML, we need to add a BR or some sort of block element to get onto a new line like this. But we actually don't need to do that. Not in a pre tag anyways. In a pre tag, look at that, shows up perfectly. Now the thing to keep in mind is that the pre tag cares about white space. So let's go ahead and add a bunch of spaces here. Make this just look real terrible. It also lines up our text, by the way, so it doesn't really matter what our default font is because our, our text editor is going to try to make sure that every font is mono or every letter is monospaced so that H is the same width as E is the same width as R is the same width as E is the same width as I is the same width as Z is the same width as M. Yeah, you get the point. In the pre tag, it's going to do the exact same thing. Whereas if you look at here, that R is not as wide as the F. Whereas here, the S, O, M, E, they're all the same width. Even the spaces are the same width. That is called monospacing. So that's one way to format your code. Another way to format your code is if we wanted to do something inline because pre is a block element, we could say, let's add some lorem text here, code, slash code. And this is going to be inline for us. And this is going to make it look a little more code-like, a little more like this. And look at that. It actually took lorem ipsum dolor seat. Seat? Sit? I don't know. And it formatted it a lot like this. Now, is it white space sensitive? Let's, let's explore. Let's add a bunch of spaces between lorem and ipsum. This one is not white space sensitive. Would you look at that? But pre is white space sensitive. So that's a good distinction to keep in mind. So I'm just going to undo that because that's not needed. And those are two ways in which you can format your code. So you can write some code like this. It's still going to try to render HTML inside of it. Don't forget about that. You're still going to need HTML entities. That's a thing we'll talk about in the future. Uh, but you can still format your code like this or like this. Block element, inline element, pre, code element. Okay, let's take a look at HTML entities. Now, in the last lesson, we looked at pre and code elements. And let's say I wanted to put something in here, like B, this is bold. And let's say I actually wanted to display this. I didn't necessarily want to just say, like, this is bold text. I wanted to actually show this tag. Now, we're going to run into a problem. When I hit refresh, it just bolds my text. So it's still rendering regular HTML. And that's not what we want. We actually want this tag to show up. Now we have these things called HTML elements. And an HTML element starts with an ampersand, or the and, and ends with a semicolon. And it's really just shortcuts to show less than, greater than, copyright, things like that. Now there are so many of them, I cannot possibly cover all of them, and you're going to have to do a little googling for it. But we can do less than, which is this symbol here, B, and then we can do ampersand, greater than, GT, 
And this looks really, really weird, but what this is going to do is turn it into that, and this one is going to turn it into that but only while we're displaying it. So let's go ahead and refresh our page. And we can see that this now actually shows up. Let's go ahead and copy this whole thing over to our closing B tag. And let's add a slash in here. Look at that. So our text is no longer bold and it's showing us the HTML tags. Now we can do the same thing, the exact same thing inside of our code element that we used in our last class or last lesson. Same thing. Well, we don't have to do it inside of the code element. We could do it really anywhere. It doesn't really matter. You'll see down here it says B, this is bold. So that, that's an HTML element or uh, an entity. And an entity, all it is, is taking some sort of way of regularly reading the code that your browser would try to interpret and showing it the way you want to show it in a human readable way. Now a really good example is if we were to add like a footer to our page here. So let's say this is our footer. We could say something like and copy and then we could put the year in here. So we could put like 2022 20, if that's the year. Scroll on down and there it is. A copyright. Now just for funsies, I'm going to throw in two extras here. We can do sup for super and that makes it up, so it brings it up a little bit instead of being centered. And we can also do sub, S-U-B, for subscript, superscript and subscript. And that brings it down. So I'm going to undo that. If, feel free to play with those if you like to, but they're not really necessary. I just thought I would throw them in there for fun because they're sort of working along lines of copyright. Copyright's usually that little tiny C at the top of a line. You'd use superscript for that. Okay, let's talk about forms real quickly forms. Now we are going to be spending a little bit of time on forms, but it's not actually going to be incredibly useful to us. Forms are how we send data to a server, but we don't actually have a server. Just because we've opened an HTML file in our browser does not mean it's a server. A server usually runs a programming language like Python or PHP, Java, C, some other proper format, uh, proper programming language. We're using not a programming language. HTML is not a programming language. It is a scripting language. And thus, we don't have a server. We don't need a server to run it. However, forms are important for creating contact forms, update forms, login forms, sign up forms, forgot your password forms, things like that. Now, a form typically looks like this. You have the form element. You have some sort of method. And you can actually see that it's suggesting two here, uh, well three, but really you're going to be using get or post for the most part. Uh, let's go ahead and use get, and the action is going to go to some page.html. Now just as an example here, let's go ahead and create a button, and the type is going to be submit, and we'll cover all of this individually, individually as well. Submit this form. And if I go back to my page and refresh and click submit this form, watch what it does to my URL. It goes to some page.html. So it changed the page for us, which is kind of cool. And it would try to also collect the information from the form and put it in the URL, which is not great for passwords or credit cards or things like that, but it is a good way to work with forms when you're just learning. Now let's take a look at what else we can do with a form. And again, you don't need to follow along with this. We'll cover all of this on its own. Uh, so input, we've got an input and we can do a text area. And I just let my VS Code, my editor, autofill stuff so it would show me things. This is an input field. It's one single line, like your email or your password or something like that. And this is a text area, like you're adding your address. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of this individually. What I'm going to do is just delete that because it's not going to be useful in the next lesson. All I wanted to do here was show you, hey, this is how forms work. And in the next lesson, we're going to actually get started with forms. Okay, welcome back. In the last lesson, we took a look at what a form does An action. We don't want this to go anywhere. Let's just do this. Let's make it go to the same page we're already on. So when we have certain elements like input, text area, or button, oh, there's one more actually, select, we're going to cover all of these individually. But when we have these, these should all be wrapped in a form element. 
Now this is sort of mix and match. You can do what you like. There's not a lot of rules to it. As in you don't have to have an input text area button then select. You can mix and match these in any way, shape, or form that you like. But let's start with input. So we can do input. And I'm just going to hit tab. And by default, its type is text. So just regular text. But there's lots of different types. There's button, which would look like a button. A checkbox, color, date time, date time local. Uh, date, email, file, hidden, which is nice because that one shows up not at all, but you can still put information in it. Image upload, month, number, password, radio, research, search, uh, search, submit, tell, text, time, URL, week, so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. Let's just work with one to begin with, regular text. So this is our element. This is our attribute. Type is the attribute. And this is our value. We're saying it's a text field. Then we can give it a default value and say hello world. And we can give it a placeholder as well. Placeholder is equal to enter your name. Let's go ahead and let's just take a look at what this looks like. Oh, nope. Scroll to the bottom. Thank you. This says hello world. And when I delete this, delete, 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 delete. When I delete this last one, that little text in the background, that's placeholder text. But when I refresh the page, by default, it says hello world. And that's because of the value that I gave it. Now, another example would be password. Let's go ahead and you can see that it turns it into little dots that we can't actually see what it's doing. So that's the input field. That's really all there is to it. In the next lesson, let's go ahead and take a look at our text area field. Hello and welcome back. In the last lesson, we created an input field. In this one, let's go ahead and create a text area. Now, this one is a little bit different. You'll notice that the input field was a self-closing tag. The form was not, so it wraps a bunch of stuff in here, but the input field actually takes a value in the form of an attribute called value. The text area does not. We can get rid of name and ID because we're not doing any of that stuff. Uh, we also have a little bit of a rule breaker here where we're saying, hey, this one's not actually using value, the attribute. It's not doing this. This one actually wants us to put our text in here. Now this is interesting because if I refresh this page, it says text in here. But what makes this more interesting is this is one of those rare cases where white space does matter. White space does matter in here. And the reason I'm showing you this is because I have on my first line text in here, but then on the second line, I have like 15 or what is that, 12 spaces before the word white space. Let's go ahead and see what that does to our text area. It makes it not very nice. It gives us all the extra spaces in there. So if you ever run into something like this, just go ahead and throw that to the very left of your, your document, your page, your file that you're working on. Let's go ahead and refresh, and that brings it back to the left. And that's our default value. Now this can also take a placeholder. Placeholder is equal to, wow, a placeholder. Placeholder. Okay, refresh, go ahead and let's grab all this and you can see I've got extra white space in there as well. Let's go ahead and clean that up. I'm going to grab all of this, delete, and it says, wow, a placeholder. Now we also have columns and rows, just like a table. We could say the columns, let's say instead of 30, let's say there's going to be 50. Columns go up and down, so this is going to be 30, so 50 is going to be, I'm going to guess, somewhere around here. Ah, oh, pretty close. And then we've got rows, which go up and down. We've got 10 rows here. We can say five rows. Let's make it just a little shorter. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. And then after this, the little scroll bar is going to show up for us. Six, seven, eight, nine. And you can see that scroll bar here. We can also resize these, which is pretty nice. The biggest difference between a text area and an input field is it has columns and rows. The placeholder is the exact same, but the value actually goes between the opening and closing HTML tag. At this point in time, I would like you to give this a shot, create an input, and then create a text area. Don't forget, if you get stuck, you can ask questions down below. Or alternatively, you can join the Learning to Code Facebook group, where 56,000 plus members can help you out at any given time. Okay, let's take a look at buttons. What is so important about a button? Well, if we go back to our page here, we have a password field and we've got some text area in here, but we actually don't have a way to submit this form. There's no button to submit this form. And that's what a button does. Now, a button can do one of three things. 
So let's do button. Type is equal to button and click me. So the important thing here is we're saying type, just like our input. Type is equal to password, button, type is equal to button. Now when I go here and refresh, I click this, nothing's happening. And that's because we said type is equal to button. This is largely for JavaScript, where JavaScript can actually do something with the click of a button. For us, this is completely useless. Next, we have reset. Now, reset doesn't look like it's going to be doing anything, but if I go ahead, delete that, and delete that, and do a bunch of random stuff in here, does, 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 and click me, because this is set to type is equal to reset, it's going to reset my entire form. So this is going to automatically fill with the default value, and this is going to show up with its default value. Just like that, it reset the form for us. So pretty cool, honestly, not used too often these days. The one you're going to be using most often is submit. And now if I refresh my page and refresh, click me, it actually reloaded my page. And you can see that it went to index.html, question mark, and then put me back to the bottom. Now that question mark is because we're using a method called get. And when that method is get, what we can do is here we can say name is equal to password. And the text area, we can see the name is equal to, I don't know, someone's address, for example. Let's go ahead and refresh this page. And when I submit this form once more, you can see the password is equal to hello world. That's what shows up in here. And the address is equal to text in here, a new line, white space does not matter in here. And so that put it in our URL. Now this is actually a really, really bad practice. Don't put things like your password in your URL ever. That's not really something you need to be too concerned with right now, but I am going to preach it just so that you're familiar with sort of how security works. If you ever put a password or a credit card or a social insurance number, social security number in your URL, Google can take that URL and store it on the internet. And it won't know better. It will think it's a legitimate page. Not just Google, but Bing or other search engines, bots will be able to submit the form and get that information as well. People will share the links with their password in it, things like that. You just want to avoid basically being able to share a password or a credit card number, social security number, social insurance number, anything like that. Anything that's private, you don't ever want to put in your URL. So again, I'm getting a little preachy about security here, but it's really good to know. The thing to note here, though, is... Test one, test two. Password is equal to test two, address is equal to test one, just like we said. And that form is now submitting because we have button type is equal to submit. Okay, let's go ahead and look at drop down options. Now, this one is really interesting. I really like this one. But before we do that, let's clean this up just a touch because our form is looking a little bit gross. And I'll show you what this looks like before and after. So I'm going to add a bunch of divs in here, knowing that a div is a dummy element. It does absolutely nothing. But it is a block element. So it's going to sort of put these on their own lines. And let's do this as well. Div. And this is what our form looked like at first. I'll zoom in here. This is what our form looked like at first. And when I refresh the page, that's on its own line, own line, own line. So that's a little bit better in my opinion. Let's go ahead and create one more div in here just so that we can have a select element. And this select element is pretty interesting. So what we can do is name, we can give it a name, selected underscore option. We don't need to give it an ID. And this one's interesting because it works a little differently than the input and text area. What this does is it allows us to use the option element where we can put a value and a text representation of that value in here. So value one, and we can say this is value one. We can do the same thing on a second line, value two, and this is value two. Let's go ahead and see what this looks like. This is a little drop down now. And we can do this over and over and over again. I'll just make a bunch here. Not really a good example, but an example nonetheless. And we can select one of these. Now, the reason why we add a value in here plus the text representation of that value is because if I select value one, submit this form, you can see up here it says selected option is equal to value one. And that value one matches here. So when you submit your form, your server-side programming language, like Python, 
is going to read this value. It's going to say it is value one. It's not going to look for this is value one. It's going to be looking for just value one. Now we can also make things disabled and we can also make things pre-selected. So let's go ahead and make a new option in here that's disabled by default. Option value is going to be nothing. And let's say this is disabled is equal to disabled. Disabled, just like that. Let's go ahead and maybe throw this on a new line just so it's a little more readable. And let's refresh our page. Zoom back in. We have an option here that's disabled. I cannot select it. I can select value one or two, but not disabled. Now let's say I have an option in here that I always want to be selected by default and say default is selected is the value. Selected by default is the text representation of this value. And we can say selected is equal to selected. Selected by default. And so even if I come back to this page and like clear out all this stuff as if I'm a brand new user, I scroll to the bottom of the page, selected by default, even though it's the third option, it's, it has not selected value one or value two by default, it is selected, selected by default. Now the last thing to know about these form fields is you can make them required. So let's say required and required. So the password and the address fields are required. Let's go ahead and refresh this page. Let's go ahead and clear this out and click me. It says, please fill out this field. Now where this gets interesting is we can say this isn't a password. We could say this is an email address. Let's refresh the page. And actually what I need to do is change that type to email. And I'm gonna change that name to email as well. So the default value is hello world. But if I click this, please include an at in the email address. It knows that it's looking for an email address. Hello world at something.com. Okay, so validation passed this first one. It didn't pass the second one. It wants me to fill out this field here. Once I fill that out, it will submit the page or submit the form for me. Now, this is forms in a nutshell. And forms are incredibly important. They're also quite complex. So I would highly recommend just taking a few minutes and messing around with it. Now, it's not going to be immediately applicable to you right now until you start working with a server-side programming language. Again, like Node.js. Python, C, PHP, something like that. But you can still get hands-on practice understanding that something can be required, that it has a name, that it could go in the URL if it's a get method, that the type could be email, password, text, uh, reset. This could even technically even be button if we wanted it to. Let's change that to button and see what happens there. Changes it to a button. Although I like using this form of a button, it's a little more explicit, verbosely named even. And yeah, so just give this a shot and play with it a little bit. Don't try to achieve anything in particular. Just try to break things. See what happens when you type coals is equal to 500 or 1. See if that looks any different. Or rows. Or see if you can make this selected, uh, the select element required as well. Go ahead and just play with that. There's no goal here, but I would say spend at least 10 minutes playing with this and just getting an idea of how this works because these are incredibly important down the road. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a look at embedding some sort of content. Now we do this typically with an element called an iframe. An iframe takes an SRC and a frame border. Well, it actually takes a lot of different things. But the frame border is going to be zero because we don't want a border around it. But let's let's add that border in there anyways. And let's do src is equal to https caleb.io. Let's see if this even works. <laughs> yeah, my website won't let you do that. But you can see that there's a frame border around here. And the example is frame border one versus print frame border zero. We like frame border zero these days. It just looks a little bit better. But let's go ahead and add like a, a YouTube video. So I'm just on uh, the Coding for Everybody YouTube channel. Let's go to the Web Development Fundamentals. Let's pause that. And if I go ahead and click Share, I can share on Facebook, Twitter, or I can click Embed, and it gives me an iframe, a bunch of code. And I can just copy that. And let's delete this iframe. Paste that in here. And you'll notice it's an iframe. It has a width and a height as well. Its source is the YouTube 
URL, so www.youtube.com slash embed slash J-Y-R-K-I-H-D-G-J-A. That's the unique video ID, I guess. Frame border of zero. YouTube also doesn't want us to have a frame border. And allow a bunch of other things in here, which we can get rid of. Except allow full screen. Let's keep that in there. That seems useful. And so we can go back to our page and refresh. And look at that. We have a YouTube video on our page. Just like that. And that's literally as easy as it gets. So that one's literally copy and paste. But let's see what happens when we do width of, nine, uh, width of 900, but the height stays the same at 315. Gets a little bit squishy there, doesn't it? Let's say the width is going to be 900 and the height is 100. And now it actually looks like it's getting cut off a little bit. So there are ways to control this. And I'm going to undo that because YouTube suggested the right dimensions for me. And I can just go ahead and play this. And it just works for me right out of the box. Now, what I would like you to do is go find a YouTube video, sh click that share link or that share uh, button, and then get the iframe and put it in your page. I, I want you to get a little bit of experience with this because in the next video, we're going to dive into your final project where you're going to need to use an embed such as an iframe. Okie okay, dokie, welcome back. We are finally at your final project for HTML 201. Now, here's what I want you to do is I want you to create a page layout. So I want you to have some sort of header and navigation section and a content section. And it has to have a layout and it has to use tables or a single table, multiple table. It doesn't matter. I'll leave that up to you. Your navigation should have at least one link to another existing page of yours. Your content area should have an image, a paragraph, a header, and a YouTube video. Lastly, your footer should have a copyright symbol and the year that you've created this page. So it could be like copyright 2020, copyright 2025, and then when you're done that, I would like you to take, to take a screenshot of your page and share it with the rest of the class. I think it's really useful to get some feedback. If you don't want to share it with the class, that's okay. You can always go to the Facebook Learning to Code group and share it with the group and get some feedback there as well. But feedback is absolutely vital. And don't be too nervous about feedback. Thousands of people do this every single day. It's totally okay. We can give you all sorts of positive feedback to help you uh, you know, write better code to make things look a little bit, little bit better, a little bit more modern, things like that. Uh, it's always nice to have another pair of eyes on your code. So go ahead and give this a shot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pause this video uh, for about, I don't know, five seconds or so. And then I'm going to create my version of this right in front of you. So go ahead, pause the video here. And you know what, if you get stuck, you can just watch me do mine and then you can try it on your own as well. But I highly recommend that you try it on your own first. Make your brain sweat a little bit. That's really, really important. Okay, let's go ahead and create our project page. So I'm going to go to File, New File, and let's change this from plain text to an HTML file. And the first thing I need to do is create that HTML5 structure. This document is going to be called Caleb's project. And the first thing we needed in here was to create a page layout using tables or a table. And so I'm just going to leave some room for us to work here. And we want something that's going to look a little bit like this. Do, 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 do. <laughs> this is the hardest way to draw something, by the way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we could have something like that. So we've got like our header in here. It could say like Caleb's project, Caleb's website, your website, your favorite food, your favorite pet, your favorite furniture, anything like that. We have some sort of navigation on the left over here. We've got content in the right, and then we've got some sort of footer at the bottom. That's, that's the sort of look that I'm going for. Your style might be a little bit different. Your layout might be a little bit different. But the first things first is I know I need a table. And I know I need to work with this table and see exactly what's going on. And I want the width to be 100% of this page. Next, I know I have at least one row here. So I got a table row, and I want the table heading in here. Now, it's nice that the table heading is going to bold it for me, but I don't want it to be bold. I want an H1. I want this to be 
huge and say Caleb Tallinn's project. Next, we have another row here. So let's go ahead and create another table row. This one has two cells though. So we do TD cell one, TD cell two. And let's go ahead and preview this by saving this as myproject.html. I can go to File, Open File, myproject.html. And we can see that the cells aren't really working. Now this is expected because we want this to take up the entire width, but this is saying, well, there's two cells. We have to display them somehow. What we can do here is th col span is equal to two. And this is saying there's two cells down here. Make sure this also pretends that it's two cells. And there we go. That's looking a little bit better. Now we have a navigation over here in cell one. So let's just go ahead and label this navigation and let's label this content. Okay. You can actually see that that bumps my navigation over. Let's change the width here. The width of this one is going to be something like 20%. That looks better. Lastly, what I wrote in here, which by the way, I could wrap in a pre tag is I need this bottom row in here. So let's go ahead and add this bottom row, table row, TD, footer in here. Let's see what this is shaping out to look like. Not bad, not bad, but we also want this to have a cold span of two. Let's do whole span of two. There we go, we've got some footer in here. And we want to center it, so let's not make it a TD, let's make it a TH. And let's start with the easiest thing in here. So we have our layout finished. The footer should have a copyright symbol. We know that's an HTML entity. It's that little C with a circle around it. So we could say, and copy Caleb's website as of, let's live in the future, 2030. There we go. Not bad, not bad. Uh, navigation, we know that the rules where navigation should have a link to another existing page. Let's go ahead and give ourselves some room to work here. And let's create an, uh, an unordered list. And let's change this to a HTML file. We have an unordered list. And that first link is going to be an anchor tag that goes to index.html. Index.html. Go to our HTML 201 page. Okay, okay, that's coming together. I'm going to zoom in here. So that's coming together. Uh, let's go ahead and create another li with a anchor inside of it, a list item with an anchor inside of it. And let's tell this one to go to, uh, I don't know, facebook.com. But this is an external link, so we need the https colon slash slash. And this could say go to facebook.com. There we go. We've got a couple links in there. We know this one exists because that was the page we, we were working on, or it's the page I was working on from all the other videos. Lastly, we have some content in here. What did we want to add in here? Content should have an image, a paragraph, a header, and a YouTube video. Let's go ahead and add that header first. And so you actually realize what I did there was content was just a placeholder piece of text for me. All I really wanted to do was tell me that that's where it was supposed to be so I could quickly select it and start working. So let's go ahead and add uh, some header in here. And it doesn't have to be like real content, by the way, some header in there. It just needs to check off this acceptance criteria. So the header is done. We can get rid of that. Link to another page, get rid of that. Create a page layout using tables, get rid of that. Footer should have a copyright symbol, get rid of that. So now we just have an image, a paragraph, and a YouTube video. Let's go ahead and add a paragraph in here. P. Lorem. Okay. That one is done. We no longer need the paragraph in there. We need an image. Do we have any images? Yeah, we've got a computer. So let's go ahead and add that. IMG. The source is going to be images. That's this folder here. Slash computer dot JPEG. And the alt is going to be computer, just in case the image doesn't load. Does this work for me? Yep. There it is. There's a big image in there. Let's lastly add a YouTube video. So I'm just going to boot up YouTube here, go to the Coding for Everybody channel. 
And let's go ahead and let's do, 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 let's do Python formatting. Let's go ahead and click share and let's get that embed. And all I'm doing is I'm selecting that text going to copy and down here, paste. And that width is still going to be 560. That height's still going to be 316. I'm going to leave this allow Excel, accelerometer, uh, clipboard, write, all that stuff. I'm going to leave that in there because that's what Google is suggesting. We don't need to know what that really is at this particular time because this is intermediate HTML, not advanced HTML. Let's go ahead. Let's go back to our page. And we have a title. We have some navigation in there. We have a header, a paragraph, an image. We have a YouTube video and we have a footer. The last thing I want to do is get rid of this border and this pre in here. So let's get rid of that pre-formatted text and that border can be removed. And let's see what we got. There we go. We have an HTML page with a proper layout. And that's all there is. So thank you for taking this course. My name is Caleb Tallin. Thank you for taking the time to learn HTML 201 or intermediate HTML with me today. So thank you again for taking the time to learn all of this with me. I really look forward to seeing you in an, another course. If I don't see you in another course, I hope to see you in the Facebook Learning to Code group. It's a completely free group. It's completely optional, uh, but there's about 56,000 members in there right now. Uh, everybody is willing to help you out at any moment. And if I don't see you in there, then once again, just thank you and happy coding. See you around. Bye. First things first, what is CSS? CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. They come in the file extension of .css. So unlike an HTML file where we use .html, for CSS, we use .css file extensions. HTML is the backbone of every single website, but honestly, it's pretty ugly. CSS lets us create beautiful and modern looking websites. How this works is CSS is a layer on top of HTML. So we write a regular HTML and then we make it look and act really, really nice by overwriting the defaults, the default settings that a browser gives us with HTML. We can change all of that with CSS. So CSS or cascading style sheets do not control the functionality of a website. So if you want to click a button and you want it to do something, that actually requires JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is definitely worth learning, but you should focus on learning JavaScript after you learn CSS. So you should learn HTML first, then CSS, where you currently are, this course, and then you should learn JavaScript after that. Now, if you don't know HTML, I have several HTML courses, the Ultimate HTML Developer, HTML 101, and HTML 201. So if you don't know HTML, please go back to one of those courses first, or do a little Googling and, and brush up on your HTML because we are going to be working with HTML quite a bit here because HTML and CSS work together. Lastly, CSS can be written in three different ways. Now, it all looks the same, but we can apply it three different ways. That's a better way of putting it. We have inline with the HTML style attribute. Then we have internal with the style element. And lastly, we have external.css files. We're going to tackle all of these in this course. How does CSS work? In HTML 101 and HTML 201 courses, we talked about the different browser rendering engines. So your browser does three primary things. Well, it does a lot of things, but when it comes to rendering content, it does three primary things. It renders your HTML, it renders your CSS, and it renders your JavaScript. And in this course, we're going to be using HTML and CSS, so it's going to be using the HTML and CSS engines. And just as a little recap, these engines have different rules. So your HTML looks a lot different from your CSS, and your CSS looks a lot different from JavaScript. They have different rules, so we write code differently. And this is the same right across all programming languages, and this is called syntax. We'll talk more about CSS syntax in just a little bit. So CSS is really just a layer on top of HTML. We'll always need to write HTML to make a website. So technically, CSS is optional. You don't need to know CSS in order to get a website on the internet. However, and I would argue this, if you want to make a modern looking website, CSS is not optional. You need to know it. Otherwise, your website's going to look like it's from 1997. So as a fun little 
experiment, go and Google the Space Jam website. It looks like it's from 1997, 1996, somewhere around there. Now, if you want to break into web development for a job or you want to be a contractor, make a little side money, you 100% absolutely will need to know CSS and you'll need to be pretty good at it. And this course is the perfect guide to getting started with CSS. Moving through this CSS 101 course, we will tackle the basics and most commonly used attributes. Okay, let's take a look at CSS syntax. So you should already have a text editor by now. You should have already downloaded and installed one when you were learning HTML. And so I'm going to open up my text editor called Visual Studio Code. And what I'm going to do is go to File, Open, and I'm going to open up an entire folder here. And I already have an index.html file. It's completely empty. There's nothing in it. And we can see all this did was give me a little sidebar here called Explorer. You can always go to, I believe it's View and then Explorer to turn this on if it's not there. You, you do have to open up an entire folder for this though. And I can open up this index.html file and do HTML colon five, hit tab, and it just fills everything that I need for me, which is really nice. And again, this is something we covered in HTML. So what I'm going to do is just ignore this stuff for now. And this is set to a Django template. Let's change this to HTML. And let's take a look at the CSS syntax. So there's two primary ways of writing CSS. You can write it right on an element doing the style attribute. You can say style color is equal to red. We'll talk about what color red and all that stuff is in just a little bit. Or you can, in your head section, write a style element. And in here, this is where you're going to write most of your CSS. It's going to look a lot like this anyways. So you have some sort of selector, and I'm gonna make this even bigger here. You have some sort of selector, curly brace, the property name, colon, and then whatever the value is going to be, semicolon. And then if you wanted a second one, you could do like property two, colon, value two, semicolon. And so this fella here is always your selector. And from here all the way to here, this is called a declaration. Where you have a property, a colon, a value, and then a semicolon. And always make sure you have that semicolon. And so this is what your declaration looks like. So whenever I say declaration, I'm talking about a property and a value together. So as an example, we could just go ahead and delete this and we could say body and that's going to target this body element. We'll talk about selectors and stuff a little bit later. I just want to show you what this looks like for now. Curly brace, we can put it on a new line if we wanted to, and we could say something like background color is equal to black. And let's go ahead and get rid of this, and I'm just gonna load this page up in Google Chrome by going to File, Open File, I'm going to go to my desktop here, go to CSS 101, open up that index file that we were just working on, and we're going to see this background color is all black. And usually by default, it's white. And so this is what CSS does. It lets us do little things like this. So there's nothing to do, nothing to learn. I just really wanted to show you what the syntax looks like. Really, it's just some sort of selector. You're going to select like your body element, curly brace, close and curly brace, and between it, we have a declaration. And a declaration is made of some sort of property type then it has a colon, and then some sort of value, and then a semicolon. And we could put another one on here on a second line, color is equal to red if we wanted to. And then we could put a third one here, third value, and we could do this on and on and on. So again, nothing to learn. Let's go ahead and get started with that next lesson where we actually start diving into CSS a little bit more and get a little more hands-on with this. Okay, let's take a look at inline CSS. So uh, from the last video, I just cleaned up this HTML a little bit, got rid of that old CSS. And when I refresh my page, it's a standard HTML page, literally nothing on it. It is as plain as it gets. So let's go ahead and create an H1 element. So I type H1 and then tab in VS Code and it creates an H1 element for me. And then I can say style is equal to, and then we could put some sort of elements or a property or declaration in here. And we can see there's all sorts of stuff to choose from. This is all CSS, by the way, all of this. 
We're not going to learn all of this because that's going to take forever to learn, but we're going to learn the, the most commonly used things that will get you 90% there on pretty much every single website. So I'm going to avoid putting in a style just for now and say this is an H1. And I'm going to copy this down and create another H1. Again, I'm going to give this a blank style attribute. It's not doing anything at this point. This is another H1. And so when I refresh the page, we see an H1 and another H1. Nothing is different from HTML. However, in this style attribute, we can now say something like font size is equal to 10 pixels. We'll talk about font size in its own particular lesson, uh, but I just want to show you that this is how we can write some inline CSS. So I go ahead and refresh this, and you can see that this is still an H1, and if I right-click and inspect, in here, it's still an H1. However, it differs from this one. This is a base style H1. This one is an H1, but we gave it a font size of 10. Now, we could also change other things, like let's change the color of the second H1. Let's say the color has to be blue. And remember, I'm writing a declaration here. So I write the property name, colon, space, value, semicolon. And I can save that, go back here, refresh my page, and now it's blue. And we can merge these together if we wanted to. It doesn't have to be just one change at a time. If we wanted to add multiple styles or, or multiple CSS declarations, we can do a semicolon because that semicolon tells the computer, oh, this is the end of this declaration. Look for another one. So we can say font size is equal to 20 pixels. And even though I don't have a space here, that would work, but I like adding a space and it just looks a lot nicer when you're writing massive amounts of CSS. So let's go ahead and save that, flip back to our browser, refresh, and we're going to see that this is going to be a little bit smaller, not quite as small as the first H1, but a little bit smaller, just like that, and it's still blue. And with my inspect tool open, and again, all I did there was right-click inspect, went to elements, select my H1 that I want to edit, and over here we can see we've got color, we can toggle this on and off, we can change this too, we can click blue and change this to red, and we can change the font size. And so we can toggle all of it off. This is what it looks like by default. We can toggle it back on. And this is what it looks like after our CSS. So effectively, we have written inline CSS. Now, this is a good way to get started, but it is not a best practice. So just keep that in mind. We are going to break this rule throughout this course, and that's totally OK. But in the wild, when you're writing real production style code, you're probably not going to use this too often. Okay, let's take a look at internal CSS. So in the last lesson, we wrote internal CSS, and that's just style is equal to, and then we wrote our regular CSS. We can actually pull this out and put it into internal CSS. So let's do this. In our head, let's write style. And then remember from, I think it was two lessons ago, we had a selector, curly brace, then we wrote the property and then some sort of value. So this is a property, color is a property, 10 pixels is a value, blue is a value. So if we wanted to select all the H1s in this page, we can do that. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna get rid of this and I'm gonna get rid of this and I wanna show you the before and after. So I just save that, head on over to my browser, hit refresh and we can see it's back to normal. Now what I can do here is I can change the selector to like an H1 and this matches the element name. So I can select the body or I can select an H1 or a paragraph or a bold or a div. I can do anything like that. Now we changed the color of one of them. We can say color is equal to or, or colon space, which is a lot like saying it's equal to. And then that value could be blue semicolon, space, and then a closing curly bracket. And that whole thing here, this is styling all H1s on the page. So this is going to select every H1, this one and this one, and it's going to say change the color from black to blue. So if we save that and refresh our page here, we're going to see that this turns blue just like that. Now we can add another one in here. 
we could say, let's target the body this time, and that's going to be our entire HTML element. We could say the body, and just for funsies, let's put this on a different line. We could say the background color is going to be black. And so we can see here that it does work on multiple lines. It's totally okay to have it on multiple lines. You don't actually need the spaces, although I would argue put spaces in there because it makes your code a lot more readable. And we're going to change all of the H1s to have a font color of blue. And then we're going to change the entire page, the entire body, to have a background color of black. And so we don't add a comma after this. We don't do anything fancy. The only way your browser tells or can tell that this is an H1 selector is this closing curly brace. Same thing with your body. It's going to say, oh, there's a body. Okay. Open it. Apply your styling. Close it. And so let's go ahead and see what this looks like now. Now, within just a few minutes, we have actually started making style changes to our page. And this is internal CSS. Internal CSS is when you use the style element. Inline CSS is when you use the style attribute, like we did in the last lesson. What I would like you to do is give this a shot. Go ahead and change your body background color. You don't necessarily need to know too much about this. Feel free to pause this video and just copy this text right into your into your document and then open it up in your browser and see that it actually made a difference. Just get used to writing this particular syntax here where you have a selector, an opening curly brace, your declaration, a closing curly brace. Okay, welcome back. In this lesson, we are going to be talking about selectors. Let's talk about selectors. I keep saying this word, selectors. So what I'm going to do is just from that last lesson, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete this and save that page and just refresh and we can see that it undid everything. This is a base HTML page now. Now a selector lets us select different elements. So in here we've got two H1 elements. We could have a div in here that says this is a div. We could have a paragraph in here. This is a paragraph. And if you're just joining me now, uh, the way I made that little shortcut there was I type P and as soon as you see this Emmet abbreviation pop up, you can hit tab and it creates your opening and closing tags for you, your HTML tags. Uh, let's go down here and let's create a bold element. Actually, let's use the proper version. Let's use strong. And this is bolded text. This is normal text. And so when I refresh a page, we're going to see we have a standard HTML page. Nothing extraordinary is happening yet. But let's say we want to target just this one div or just this one paragraph, or we wanted to target all of the H1 elements on a page. We can do this with CSS. So we would use an internal style here. And let's say we want to select all of our H1s. So we have two on the page. We would say H1, opening and closing curly brace. And let's change that color to blue. Save, head on over back to our browser, hit refresh and it changes it to blue. Now let's say I wanted to select just this paragraph and make it real ugly. We could do that too. We could say, select the paragraph, and you notice that these match the HTML element. So this H1 is literally the H1 element, and this P is literally the paragraph element. And let's throw this on just one line this time. We can say, make the paragraph background color, and what color do we want to change this to? Let's change this to, what do we have here? <laughs> Dark magenta. Make sure you have that semicolon. Make sure you have that closing curly brace. Save. And let's go refresh. And we can see that this text is going to change. Hopefully, that is a visual change that we can see in this video. Yeah, there we go. So we have something that's actually working here. Now, this is a selector. A selector is the ability to select just particular elements. Now we can select it by an element, we can select it by a class, we can select it by an ID, we can select elements by their attributes if we wanted to, but we're not going to get into that just yet. We're going to tackle these one by one. So what I would like you to do in this video is make an H1, make a div, and then just target that H1 and change the color of it. I do not want you to change the color of the div. Let's talk about class selectors. In the last lesson, we were able to select all the H1s on a page and we were able to change them. We change the styling, change how they appear. 
In this lesson, we're going to take a look at how we can how we can select multiple elements using a class. So let's say we have an h1, select me. And below this, we have a div, select me too. And we also have a paragraph, don't select me. Now there are several ways we can select both the div and the h1. But in this lesson, we're going to look at the class attribute. So if I go into my h1 here, type class, then this is just HTML. We can change this color to blue. And we can also say in the div, blue. And so you see that how they both have blue in common, they're both a class. In our CSS, we can't type h1 and div, although we can do this, this is a different type of selector, we'll talk about this later. We just want to be able to select the h1 and the div, but we want to select it by the fact that they have this common attribute, they have this common class called blue, and we can do that with dot blue. And so I just made a selector here dot blue, and you can think of class as dot. Now, if you ever watch the TV show called reboot, you can think of dot is a classy character. Because classes are dots in CSS. It's just a shorthand method of, of writing this out. So now we have dot blue selected. It's going to select our h1 and our div. And in here we could say color is equal to blue. Save and refresh this page. And we can see that it says select me is blue, select me two is blue, don't select me is still default black. Now what if I wanted to make this a little more complicated? Let's add a paragraph in here with some lorem. So I hit lorem or I type lorem, hit tab, and it creates some lorem ipsum text. And if we preview, it's a regular paragraph. Let's go ahead and select this, but let's make, let's make this h1 and the paragraph uppercase. So we can change this by adding a class, class is equal to, and let's call this uppercase. And this name is not super important, but I'm just going to call it something simple like uppercase. And let's also add a second class selector onto our h1. So we use space, upper, case. And you notice how these two now have something in common. We can go back up to our CSS. And we can say class, upper, case. Open our syntax there. We can do text transform and then we have all these different options here let's go with uppercase and let's save that let's go back to our page and we're going to see that select me and this class this element so we can see that the h1 select me and this paragraph is going to be uppercase just like that so now we've selected this one and we've selected this one but we have not selected the uh, select me two, the second one or the last one so this is a good example of how elements can share something in common and we can apply styling based on that, that thing that they have in common. We also looked at how we can have two classes or more. You can have more and more and more in here if you wanted to. And the way we separate these is with a space. So we said the first class is going to be blue. The second class is going to be uppercase. So it made our first element here, blue and uppercase. The second element only has blue, so we go up here. It only changes the text color to blue. And then in a paragraph, we're saying only uppercase. And it's only changing that to uppercase. It's not changing it to blue. Lastly, we have an element down here, don't select me. And there are no classes. There are no selectors for the P element to change all P elements. So this is just default, whatever the browser is going to give us. Oh, and one last thing here is these are case sensitive. So dot uppercase is not the same as uppercase with a U. Make sure they are spelt the exact same. I see a lot of people throughout the years. I've seen them do something like this where it's uppercase and then this one is lowercase, uh, lowercase U and this one is an uppercase U. And they say, oh, it doesn't work for me. Why is it broken? It's, it's actually not. It's just very case sensitive. So uppercase uh, or even like blue and uppercase B is different. This is saying select blue with an uppercase B. So it is different. So just keep an eye on that. All right, let's take a look at ID selectors. An ID selector is a way to select something based on another HTML attribute called ID. And so we can say in this one here, let's make some space here. We can say the ID for select me is going to be 
the title. And we do this, we select this one with a number sign. And so in CSS, we can go back to our style element here. I'll just move that up a bit. We can do ID, the title, and this is case sensitive as well. And we can change this to have, let's say, text decoration of underline. So in the last lesson, what we did was we selected this element, this element, and this element, and we applied different styling to it. In this lesson, we're going to select Select Me by its ID, and we're going to give this an underline. So let's go ahead and refresh, and it's now underlined. And the reason that's not blue is because in the last lesson, I was telling you how this is super case sensitive. That was the case here. Let's go ahead and refresh this. Now it's blue, it's underlined, and it's uppercased. And we're using multiple selectors here. So this H1 element has the blue styling, has uppercase styling, and it has an ID called the title. And once again, that ID just starts with the number sign. The rest of the syntax is identical to an element selector, like what we saw originally, a class selector, like what we saw in the last video, and all it is is that curly brace, your declaration, and then a closing curly brace. Now, one thing to note about IDs is they should be completely unique. So you can, in theory, write ID is equal to the title, just like we have up here. And this is going to select both of these because they're identical. And we should only ever have one ID. It's like your driver's license or your government ID, like your passport. It should only, there only should ever be the one document in existence. And just like an ID here, there should only ever be one. But we're saying that, hey, there is one selector but it's being applied twice. Let's see what happens here. So you can see that our browser did not honor the rule. It actually made this underlined as well. Now that is, I guess that's fine, but please don't do this. What we should be doing is the title, and this could be like the subtitle. IDs should always be unique. Now why this is important is because after CSS, you're going to be learning JavaScript, and JavaScript has the ability to grab an element by its ID. And if there are two of them, it's only going to grab the first one. And you might possibly want the second one. And that could really mess up your coding and cause hours of frustration. You don't want that. So always make sure your IDs are completely unique. Let's talk about grouping selectors together. So what I'm going to do is from that last lesson, I'm just going to go ahead and delete this code. And I'm going to delete the styling that we have here. Now, let's say there is a circumstance where you have an H1 on your page. This is an H1. You have a div on your page. This is a div. And you have a paragraph on your page. This is a paragraph. And let's say you wanted to select the H1 and the paragraph, and you wanted to change the color to blue. So currently, the way we know how to do that is we can add a class to both of these. So I can click here. And then in VS Code on Mac, I can do command click or on Windows, I think it's either alt or control click. And you can type in two places at the same time, which is really, really useful. And then we can do class is equal to blue. And that's what we did in the last couple of lessons. But we might not always have access to the class attribute. We might not be able to add anything to this. And there will be circumstances in the future where that's just not possible. So let's say we want to select this H1 and this paragraph. Well, currently we do h1 color is equal to blue. And then on a new line, we do paragraph color is equal to blue. And this does do the job. If we flip back here and refresh from what we previously saw, changes our h1 to blue and changes the paragraph to blue. Okay, cool. That works. There's a better way to do this because you see how we have to write this twice. What if down the road, you have a CSS file or some styling, and it's like a thousand lines long, and there's tons of selectors in there. What if you wanted to change all those colors from blue to red? Well, we'd have to go here, type red. If we forget one, oh no, now we have to go back and check. One's red, one's blue. We have to then find this one. Go over here, change that one to red as well. Go back, refresh our page. You can see how this can just get a little bit monotonous. Instead, what we can do is let's put this on multiple lines just for readability. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete that. And instead, I'm going to group these selectors together with a comma. 
So I say select the H1, all the H1s on the page. Also, select all the paragraphs on the page. And we do that with, again, select the H1s, comma, space, then a paragraph. And if we wanted to select more, we could do comma, div. We could select all of them. Or we could do just the bold elements, or just the strong elements, or just the italic elements. We could do that. So what we want here is h1, comma, space, paragraph, or whatever element you want to select, space, and then a bracket. Don't make it end in a comma, though. You don't want it to end in a comma. You can actually see that my, <laughs> my, uh, my editor here has sort of ran into errors. You see those little squiggly lines underneath there? Yeah, it's running into some sort of errors. And so that error is just because I've got that comma there. So let's go ahead and save this, and when I refresh, we should see actually nothing has changed from this. Beautiful. Nothing has changed. So this is red, and this is red as well. So what I would like you to do is create three different elements on your page. Feel free to copy my experiment as well. Uh, create three different elements, like an h1, a div, and a paragraph. Select two of them, and then change the declaration, and then change the font color and make sure that third one is not selected let's take a look at nested selectors so there's a way to select certain elements that live inside of other certain elements so i'm just deleting this code here and what i'm going to do is create an example i'm going to create a div and in that div i'm going to have a paragraph so i type p emmet abbreviation shows up i can now hit tab let's throw some lorem ipsum in here and I'm going to also create another part that says this is bold. And I'm going to make this bold as well. So B. Hmm. So strong. Let's go ahead, select that. Cut. Move to the end of the line. Paste. And let's make something in here bold as well. Strong. Go to the end of the line. Cut. And let's go down here. Paste. And what this looks like is this. We have a paragraph with some bold text, and then we've got some text outside of a paragraph. Look at this code real quick. This stuff is outside of a paragraph. It's inside the div, but it's outside of the paragraph. So we've got a paragraph here with an inline strong. Now let's say we just wanted to target me. Let's change this to target me. Well, currently, we know a few different ways of doing this. We could select all of the strong elements. We could give it a class. We could give it a class called selected if we wanted to. Or we could add an ID of selected. Or maybe not the same one, not the same name as a class name. That gets a little confusing. Uh, select me. Now, we could add a class or an ID to this element. But when you work with frameworks in the future, such as Django, you, you, know, you might not have access to this right away. And so an easier way is to select it by selecting the div, and then the paragraph, and then this particular element. And so maybe let's just put this on a new line as well, make this a little more readable. And let's get rid of this stuff in here. So let's look at nested selectors. So currently we can select all of our strong elements. And we can say the color is going to be blue. And this is great, but it selected this one. Maybe we don't want that one to be selected. Maybe we want just this one to be selected. How do we do that? We can do that without a class. We can do that without an ID. We cannot do that by selecting just the element because there are two different elements here. So what we can do is we can say target all paragraphs and then all the strong elements inside of a paragraph. And we do that by saying p space strong. So we have a p element here, paragraph, that matches right there on line 12. Space, not a comma, not a dash, nothing like that, just a space, then strong. And what's really cool about this in VS Code is you can just put your mouse in here, click, and if you look up here, it says strong p div body HTML. It tells you exactly where this element is living. So we just want to select all the paragraphs. So we're going to select every paragraph on the page. And then we're going to select every strong element inside of each of those paragraphs and turn it blue. And so when we save this, 
and refresh our page, we're going to see that this one will turn black and this one will stay blue. Just like that. Now that is called nesting selectors, and we can go as deep as we want as well. So if we wanted to target just the ME here, we could say this is italics. And if we wanted to target just this one, we could say select all the paragraphs on the page, select all the strong elements inside of each paragraph, and then select all the I elements inside of each strong element. And so again, if I put my mouse there and I click I strong P in reverse order, that's P strong I. And you can see that it matches up here. And so let's go ahead and give this a shot. And now only this is blue. And it inherits the italics that our browser tries to apply by default. So that is nesting. I really want you to give this a shot. So go ahead and create something like this, where we have a div and a paragraph make this blue, and then have a paragraph outside of your div, don't target this. This should not be blue. So I want you to target this one, but not this one. Don't use a class, don't use an ID, use a nested selector. Let's look at commenting code. In CSS, there's uh, a good way to comment code, but it's a little bit different from HTML. So in HTML, and I'm just leaving off from the last lesson here, that's where I got this code from. In HTML, we have less than exclamation mark dash dash. And in here, we have an HTML comment. In CSS, it's kind of similar, kind of different. Same, same, but different, you know? Uh, so in here, in our style element, we do slash asterisk and you can see it turned everything below here gray and then we can say this is a css comment and to close it we do asterisk and then that same slash so we just do it backwards so this is the forward this is the opening one and this is the closing one and this is a css comment and so you can write what your css is doing you can comment out your code like this uh, i'm going to do a shortcut way on vs code i can do command it's command plus slash on windows is going to be control plus slash and so i just go to this line here and i hit command or control slash and it comments it out so in the last lesson what we did was we were targeting this this little me here but because i commented that code out my browser is now going to say, oh, okay, I know that there's code here, but it's in a comment, so don't execute it, don't do anything with it, don't even think about it, just pretend it doesn't exist. And when I hit refresh, we're going, we're going to see that this changes back to black, and it's still going to be italicized, but it's not going to be blue anymore. Just like that. And so code comments are really good for leaving your thoughts, your ideas, your to-dos, if you, I like, Let's say you're working for two hours tonight and then it's bedtime and you want to pick it up in the morning. You're going to see this a lot to do a thing in here, something like that. Or if you're just testing out code and you want to comment or uncomment, you can always just test it out like this. And all I'm doing is commenting and uncommenting with command slash or control slash. Let's take a look at text colors now. Now we've been working with this a lot. I think we're pretty familiar with how this works. But just leaving off from that last lesson, we're selecting P strong I, which is going to be down here, P strong and then I. We're going to target that ME. And let's make this really obnoxious so we can really see what we're working with here. Font size is going to be 50 pixels. And we're going to change that color to blue. So if I go back here, this is going to be a big ME. It's going to be blue. It's going to be italicized. We're going to see it just like that. But we've been typing names like blue or red, and we can see that if we type in color and then hit a colon, that VS Code is nice enough to give us all sorts of options in here. Now, these are nice, but when you're working with a designer, they're not going to be using these perfect colors. They're going to be using different styles. And, or not styles, but, you know, very, very particular colors. So if we wanted to, we could have, like, black. Let's scroll up here. We have black. What about gray? How many different colors of gray are there? 
look at that. There's light gray. There's probably something like a medium gray. There's all sorts of different types of gray in here. But we don't have to stick with just a name. We can stick with a hex as well. And so this is called a hex, and it's usually six characters or three characters. So it's like FFF, FFF. And you're going to see that VS Code has said, oh yeah, okay, that's white. We can do 000, 000, 000, and that's going to be black. Now, if the last three characters are repeating from the first three characters, we can shortcut it and just say 000, or FFF. Or if we wanted an eggshell white, we could do something like F5, F5, F5. These are two very common ways to add colors. Now, as you're learning CSS, it's totally okay to use like red, blue, black, gray, green, yellow, orange, you know, whatever color you want to actually type out. But when you actually start working with a real design, it's going to be very specific. So it's not just going to be FF0000. So that's red. It's not going to be the perfect color red all the time because that's an obnoxious color red. Maybe it's going to be a darker red, slightly lighter red, maybe just an off shade of red. Your designer is going to be making that choice for you. And so you're going to want to make sure that whatever they're using, you can use. And so that's where hexes come in, hex colors. There's nothing to do in this lesson. I just wanted to show you that this is how these work. And you can have, again, a color, like a named color, or instead of black, you can have number sign 000 which is the same as 000. Okay, let's take a look at different color types. In the last lesson, we looked at named colors and hexes, but there's another one. Actually, there's a few of them. Uh, but the three you're going to be using for the most part, most part are named colors, hex colors, and RGB slash RGBA. And I'm going to show you what RGB and RGBA are in this lesson. So first things first, I just have a blank document here. Let's go ahead and create an H1 just because it's nice large text. And it's going to say change my color. And when I refresh my page, it just says change my color. So nothing fancy. Now I can select this H1. And I can say color is equal to blue. And it changes it to blue. Or I can say red. Changes it to red. Or I can say change it to F, F, zero, 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 that's enough, yep. And so that changes it to red. Again, nothing changes. Now there's also another way to do this. We can do RGBA, so RGB or RGBA. So RGB is red, green, blue, and RGBA is red, green, blue, alpha. Now let's do RGB first. So let's change this color to... 125, that's red, 125 blue, and 125 green. Uh, I did that backwards. Red, green, blue, nailed it. And so let's see what 125 is. Now the highest number you can go to is 255, so make sure it's between 0 and 255. Let's go ahead and see what this looks like now. It's a shade of gray. It's about 50% gray. You're going to see this a lot as well, mostly when you're dealing with base colors like black, for instance. So 000, black is the absence of color in science, and that means 0 red, 0 green, 0 blue. Changes it back to black. Now, if we wanted to make this transparent a little bit, we could do RGBA, and as that fourth parameter here, we could say comma, and then instead of like 50%, we use a decimal. And so let's do 0 0.5. And that's 50%. And this is just like grade 7 mathematics, something like that, where 1 is equal to 100%, 0 is equal to 0%, 0 0.5 is equal to 50%. So this is going to be black, but it's going to be 50% see-through. So it's going to look gray, just like that. Now let's go ahead and change that background color of the body. We can say body, background color, and let's change this to red. And we're going to see that this probably isn't going to look gray anymore. It kind of looks a little bit see-through. So it kind of looks like a darker red just because it's, it's black, 
but it's 50% see-through, and so it takes on the color that's behind it. Now again, when you're working with designers in the future, they're going to be using RGBA a lot, just because that alpha, that transparency, is really, really nice to work with. What I would like you to do is give this a shot, use RGB and then RGBA. You might have to Google a couple of different colors. You can Google like, what is the color yellow in RGB? And then you can change the alpha with RGBA. Let's talk about links. Links are pretty ugly by default. They're usually blue if they're not clicked and then purple if they are clicked. So I'm just gonna clean this code up from the last lesson here. Do do do. Give us some room to work. And so let's say we have some lorem ipsum in here and we wanted to make a link. We could do this. A H R E F is equal to H T T P S Caleb. .io. And let's turn this into a link and some extra white space. And so, because we know in HTML, white space doesn't matter, let's refresh our page and we can see we have all of this in one line and there's a link. Now, this link is purple by default because I've already gone to Caleb.io. Uh, if you haven't gone there, it's going to be blue. But let's go ahead and change this. So we can select this link with an A element because it's the only link on the page. So we can select it and it's totally fine. We don't have to worry about multiple links with multiple styles. And we can say the color of this is going to be red. And when we refresh our page, it's red. Now that doesn't look very good. Let's start making things look a little nicer. Let's say that color has to be black. It has to fit in with the rest of the text here. Okay, so that looks a little bit better. But what happens when I click and hold? Depending on your browser, that can actually change. What we want to do here is we want to be able to change these, these states, these link states. So now what we can say is A, and you can see when I do one colon after the A selector, it gives me all sorts of things to choose from. Some of these are pseudo selectors, some of these are just regular selectors. Let's go ahead and use hover. What happens when we put our mouse over the link? And so the syntax for this is our selector and then our state. And when we hover over this, let's change the color to blue. So I just save that. And when I go back to the page, you can actually see nothing happens. When I refresh, however, I'll put my mouse over it and it's going to turn blue, just like that. So now we have some sort of interactivity using just CSS. There's also an active state. So A, active, and that's when you click and hold. So when you do uh, click and hold, let's change that color to red. So let's save that, refresh our page. When I hover over, it turns blue. When I click and hold, it turns red. So these are the different states of a link. We're saying by default, make it black. When you hover over it with an action with your mouse, make it blue. And when you click it, make it red. The last one we have here is visited. So we could say any link that has been visited, change the color of that. Let's change this one to something that's going to be really hard to see, but very noticeable, yellow. And because I've already clicked this link, right, I click it, takes me here, I go back. Because I visited this link already, it's now yellow. And these are the different link states. So go ahead and give this a shot. I want you to create a link on your page, change the default color change the hover color, change the active color, and change the visited color. I want you to experiment with these and get a, a little bit of experience with it because you're going to be using this probably every single day as a front-end web developer. All right, let's take a look at font sizes. So font sizing, we've actually worked with this a little bit. All I'm going to do here is create an H1 and put some lorem ipsum in there. And when I show you the page, yep, that is pretty obnoxious. But we can change this. And let's give this a class of small. That's just what we're going to call it. And so we can say select all the H1s on the page with a class of small. And this is new. This is a new selector. We haven't seen this yet. So we're going to select every H1 and then make sure we only select the H1s out of that group that have the class of small. And we can do font size and let's make this like super tiny, like three pixels. So I'm going to save that, refresh, and it's super tiny. I'm zoomed in quite a bit too. I'm at 200%. If I zoom out to 100%, you 
yeah, you can't even see that whatsoever. 200%, you can barely even see that. So that's how we change the font size. And that's the font size declaration. So it's font-size, colon, space, and then your measurement. Now we don't use a measurement like three because three is not going to do anything. If I do this, refresh, it's almost like nothing happened. And what I can do here is comment this line out. So it's as if it doesn't exist. Refresh the page and we can see that nothing is happening. And that's because I gave it an improper measurement type. So I said three, or I could say three pixels. And that's actually going to do something. Let's go ahead and change that to like 30 pixels. Okay, it's a little bit smaller. What happens if we said 75 pixels? This is going to be huge just like that. So that's the font size. There's not really much to do here. You've probably already worked with font size uh, in one of the previous examples already, uh, just because I was using it as a way to example other things. Uh, but if you haven't used the font size declaration yet, go ahead and give us a shot. Don't forget to use pixels. Uh, there are other measurements, but we're going to talk about measurements in the next lesson. Okay, welcome back. Let's talk about measurements. So in most CSS, not all, but most, we are going to be using measurements such as pixels, ems, rems, things like that. Uh, so these are all different types of measurement uh, styles, uh, but for the most part in this course, we're going to be sticking with pixels, just because it's the easiest to wrap our head around. Uh, for funsies, if you really want to level up your CSS game right now, you can always go off and Google what an em is, an m. And you can always go and Google what an REM is, REM. But throughout the rest of this course, we are going to be sticking with pixels just because it's a little more absolute and easier for us to understand at the very beginning. And again, this is a CSS 101 basics course, so we want to stick with just the basics for now. But even when you're working with a designer, a design is going to come in and it's going to say that something has, for example, a height of exactly 50 pixels. And so you might want to be using pixels for the most part anyways, instead of M's or REM's, just because it is a lot more absolute. So there's nothing wrong with using pixels. We're going to be using pixels moving forward. But if you want to level up your game, you can always Google what an M is and what a REM is. Background colors. Okay, let's save this page. This is a blank page. And when I refresh my page here, we see absolutely nothing. Now we've worked with background colors a little bit, but let's go ahead and start making our page look a little nicer. Let's actually start working with some stuff that we can keep. So I'm going to select my body element, and I want to give this a background dash color, and then a particular color. Now I know I want off white, and this might be a little bit hard to see at first, but hopefully when I do the transition, it shows up in the video. So this is just regular white, and if I refresh, you can see it's a little bit off now. Now what I can do is I can always right click, inspect, click my body, and you can see the background color is F5, F5, F5. What if I want to change that to red, F00, or black, 000, or default white, doesn't do anything. F5, 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 and this is what it's going to look like when I toggle this on and off. So white, off white, white, off-white, something like that, just so it's not as hard on the user's eyes. We could also do something a little darker, F0, 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 and we can toggle this on and off as well. So now we have a very light gray color. So that's a background color. You can use a hex color, you can use a name color, you can use an RGB or an RGBA if you wanted to. We learned about color types already, so feel free to use any color type you are familiar with. Background images. Let's go ahead and add a background image to our page. Now a background image has slightly different syntax. We can say back ground image and we do I-M-A-G-E. In HTML it's I-M-G. In CSS we actually type it out. It's image. And this one isn't just like website.com slash I-M-G.jpg. Not quite like that. It's very similar but not quite. Instead what we do is URL braces or parentheses and then we put the link in here. Now this can be a relative link, this can be an image that's in your same folder, or it can be an absolute link. And we learned about those in HTML, so you should be familiar with pathing and absolute and relative links by now. Now I don't currently have an image, so let's go ahead and grab an image. I'm gonna go to unsplash.com. 
And let's go ahead and grab this cool image because this is pretty nice looking. Let's grab that original size. That's going to be a big image, but let's grab it. And I just put that image into my CSS folder. So it's right beside my index.html. It's called background.jpg. And you can see in VS Code it shows up here. And when I click it, we can actually see what it looks like. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and in the URL, I'm going to say background. I'm going to have to make this just a touch smaller. Background.jpg. And that's going to link, and VS Code is actually smart enough to use this one, uh, but it's going to link to this one over here. And this is a relative link. So let's go ahead, go back to our page, and even though we have a background color, the background image is going to take precedence. So let's go ahead and refresh. And, well, we don't see anything because that image was far too big. So let's go ahead and try to contain this image now. We can do background size, and VS Code is going to give us options there, like we saw. Contain or cover. Let's go with contain and see what the difference is between contain and cover. So save that. Refresh. And it looks like the image is showing up over and over and over again. And in fact, you know what, this might have actually been too big of an image. So what we can do here is let's just go back to Unsplash. Let's grab a different image, something that's going to be a little bit, I want it to look cool, but I also want it to be smaller. So let's grab, oh, let's grab this photo of Chewy here. Let's download a smaller image, a small one. So now I have two background images. I've got background.jpg. I've also got chewy.jpg. Let's open up VS Code. We can see it in here. This is Chewy. I, I purposely downloaded a smaller image. And let's go ahead, comment this out. Let's just backtrack a bit. And let's type in chewy.jpg. That matches the name over here. And with a standard background. There we go. That's better. And we can actually see it's repeating over here a little bit. Let's get rid of this. And that's totally okay. So now let's see what the background size contain does. It makes this image contained in the body element over and over and over and over and over again. What about cover? Cover, make sure that the image takes the entire width, the entire spacing of the entire body element. Now, what's cool about this is we can say div stuff here, and we can change this from a body to a div. So let's select our only div on the page and refresh. And we can see that it's sort of starting to show up there. Let's go ahead and give this a height as well. Just for funsies, let's do 300 pixels. There we go. We can also give us a background color of something darker. Let's do 000. Uh, but we have to move this onto the body. So now we're getting into a little bit of refactoring. This is completely normal. You're going to be doing a lot of refactoring as you start to write more and more code as well. So now we've got a background color of black. We can see the image in here. And it's going to take up as much space as it can from this element. So if we change this height from 300 pixels to 100 pixels, we only see basically the sky. Let's do 200 pixels. And we can see just their heads. Let's change that background size from cover. Let's change it back to contain. And so what this is going to do is try to take this whole image and it's going to contain it in here. Now it's repeating because we want to see the whole image, but it also wants to by default take up as much width as possible. So let's go ahead and change that background repeating. We can do background. Nope, not color. Repeat. And then we can repeat on the x-axis, y-axis, or no repeat. So let's say repeat on the... No, it's already repeating on the x-axis. Let's go ahead and say no repeat. And now we have an image on a page using a div. And this is a common practice. You're going to see this a lot. There is no image element. It's just the background. Now let's see what happens when we go in here and we change this to our old one, background.jpg. We can see that shows up in there as well. And let's just go ahead and undo that. And so this is background images in a nutshell. You have your background image, your URL to whatever resource. You have a background size contain. You have background repeat. There's also things like background positioning. So we could do background position and this is going to take oh look at all these different measurements 
CH, CM, EM, EX, FR, IM, uh, all sorts of things in here. But these ones, we actually want to use the named ones. Let's go ahead and say center on the left axis, or the X axis, left and right, and then center on the Y axis. That's top and bottom. And now we have an image that is perfectly centered. And what you can't see over here is our text still shows up, but we've just centered that image. Now, what I would like you to do is go to unsplash.com, grab an image, any image, uh, change the background size, change how it repeats, change its positioning as well. And if you need a little bit of help with that on a div instead of on a body, you can always just set the height to like 200 pixels and you can make sure that the image actually works on your page because it's all about positioning. That's really what background images are about. It's about specialized positioning. Let's look at the inspect tool. We did this in our HTML 101, HTML 201 courses as well. We can always right click on the page and go to inspect. And this is really important because we can click on an element like a body and we can see the styling. So I clicked on right click, inspect, make sure you're in the elements tab. And then in the sub tab, you want styles, not computed or event listeners. You want styles. And then I just select the body and it's got a background color. I can toggle this on and off or I can change it if I wanted to. I could change it to red, make it really obnoxious. Uh, I could even go in here into the body itself and I could say, color is equal to white and let's change that background color back to black and all i'm doing is clicking around here so i click in here it lets me create a new declaration new property and value or i can go in here and i can just click white edit it or i can go in here and change the color from color to background color and overwrite it background color and to toggle these on and off all we have to do is click that checkbox on and off now where this gets really handy is in that last lesson, we set a background image on this div. Now, what if you don't know all the values? And because CSS has a lot of properties, it also has a lot of values. And a lot of this comes down to sort of memorization and understanding where you can get your answers from. So you have a background size here. I'm just gonna click on contain, it selects it for me, delete. And now I can go to auto, contain, cover and I'm just toggling through these I'm just hitting my down arrow and we can see what these look like so we have three main ones here so auto is the same as initial as revert and unset but contain and cover are different so we can see what we're looking for here now why this is important is because if we go back to contain and we want to change the height we can do this we can make that height bigger and bigger and bigger and we're actually not going to see too much here uh, but we can make it smaller, and that's just because my inspect tool was in the way. And there we go. I don't know why it made height a second time for 201 pixels, but all I did was click on the original 200 and go up or down. I'm hitting the up arrow or the down arrow. You can also change this to something massive like 3,000 pixels, which is going to be huge. Or we can change the height to 300 pixels. And if we want to experiment, that's cool. We can, we can absolutely do that. We can toggle it on and off, see what the default is. We can do all sorts of things. And if you're ever like, ooh, you know what, what else is there? You can always just type in background and you can see all these different things. There's background attachment, blend mode, clip, color, image, origin, position, position X, and position Y, repeat, re you know, it goes on and on and on and on. There's all sorts of stuff in here. And so if you're ever like, oh, I want to learn more about background images, for example, you can absolutely do that by going into your browser. And the nice thing about this is you don't actually need internet for this whatsoever. You don't need to be able to Google it. You don't need to be able to Bing search it or look for an answer on Stack Overflow. You can do all of this right in your browser. Now, the last thing to note is I'm going to change a few of these things. So let's say I get rid of centering and I change it to be this. If I hit refresh, it's going to go back to the default value. And that's because we didn't actually change anything in our file here. This file is untouched. What our browser essentially does is takes a copy of our index.html file and renders it and then says, oh, this is the stuff that was rendered. Here, you can play with it. It's, an, it's a sandbox. It's a playground. So when I hit refresh, it's going to go back to the normal page and I'm going to lose my progress. So usually what I do is I'll change something in there and then I'll take all this, copy it, copy, and then I'll just throw it in here and paste. And then I'll just fix up sort of the syntax here to make it a little more readable.
And you can see that it's exactly what we have written already. So that's, that's how I make changes in the browser and then copy it into what I actually want to keep. Moving forward, we're going to be using the inspect tool a lot. And moving forward, you're going to want to rely on the inspect tool to see everything that you can possibly see. Let's take a look at text alignment. So let's say we have an H1 on our page. Hi, my name is Caleb. We can select this H1 and let's do this with an ID. So we've got an ID of intro and we can say select the H1 with an ID of intro. And in here, by default, this is going to be aligned to the left. So let's refresh our page from what we were working with and it's aligned to the left. Now let's say we wanted it to be centered or to the right. We can absolutely do that. All we do is text align and we can say center, justify, left, right, start, inherit, initial, or unset. We want center. And so when we save this and refresh our page, it's centered. Now, a cool thing we can do here is we can just go up to our element, right click, inspect. Make sure you've selected, you've selected that H1. And where it says text align center, we can change this. So this is what center looks like. End, initial, inherit, justify, left, revert, right? There's all sorts of stuff in here. The ones that you're probably going to work with uh, is going to be left, right, and justify when there's enough text. And we're not going to get into that one. And center. So left, right, center, and maybe justify. In this lesson, what I want you to do is create some text, use like an H1, and change that text alignment to be centered. Then open up your inspect tool and change it to be right like that. Now, if you are writing HTML and you've been writing the center element, no longer use that. You can rely on CSS instead. It's better to use CSS than to use the center element. If you have not been using the center element, please ignore that. You saw nothing. Once you are done that, let's head on over to that next lesson. Let's take a look at borders. So borders are really, really important. They are the primary way that we separate our content from other sections of content. It's how we make things stick out sometimes too. So let's go ahead and create a new div. This has a border. And let's give this a class of red border. And so let's go up here and we can select all of our divs. And when we select all of our divs, let's make sure we also select the divs that only have a red border class. Now we can give this a lot of different border value or properties. We can see there's tons of them in here, but we're really only going to be working with three of them. We're going to be working with border width. So border width of some value. Uh, we're going to be working with the border style of some value. And we're going to be working with the border color of, st of some particular value. So let's say the width is going to be five pixels. The style, we have lots of styles to choose from, so it can be like solid or let's see what we have here. Solid, dash, dotted, double, groove, uh, hidden, none, outset, and ridge. Let's go with dashed. And the border color is going to be red. Or if we want to use a hex, it's F00. Let's go ahead and refresh our page and what normally wouldn't have a border now has a border. Now this is really nice for two reasons. A, you now have some styling around here. Granted, this is kind of ugly styling, but we do have some styling. And the second nice thing is we can see that this border takes up all this space. So we know for a fact that this is a block element. We learned about block elements in HTML 101 as well. Now there's a shorthand way to do this. We can also say border. We can give it a width then the style, then the color. So we can say border is one pixel, solid black. And because programs read things from top to bottom, it's going to say set that width, set the color, set the style. Oh, but actually, not because it's shorthand, just because we've basically rewritten this a second time down here as shorthand, it's going to accept this one. So it writes this to your page, but it's so fast when it gets a new rule, it says, okay, overwrite that. So now when I refresh the page, this is going to have a one pixel border black. All right, continuing from that last video, 
what I did here was a border width of five pixels, border style of solid, and border color of red. So it's this ugly red border. Let's go ahead and make this really atrocious. Let's, let's see if we can really make this obnoxious. 50 pixel width border. Yeah, that's pretty gross. That's honestly too gross. Let's do 15. That's a little better. So in this lesson, we're going to be talking about border radius. And we can do border radius as the property. And then it takes some sort of value. Now, typically, you're going to be working with either pixels or percents. So let's do a 10 pixel border radius. And what this is going to do when I refresh a page is it's going to make a nice little angle here, a nice little radius, just like that. Now we can apply this to images, not just borders. We can apply it to anything, any element out there, as long as it has some sort of hard edge. Well, luckily, every element in HTML is made of some shape of rectangle. So they all have hard corners and you can apply a border radius to everything. Now, what if we didn't want the border radius to be 10 pixels? What if we wanted it to be as round as it could possibly be? Let's do 50%. That's looking pretty gross. And, you know, it's good to know that we can do things like this as well, because there is a place and time for this. And I'm going to show you right now how this sort of works. Now, this looks disgusting, but what if we said this element has a width of 200 pixels and a height of 200 pixels? Now it's going to be perfectly square. I'm going to comment this out. And this is going to be perfectly square like this. Let's move that down. And we have a red square. Now if I uncomment the border radius, we can see it's a perfect circle. So now there is a place and time for a border radius that is super obnoxious, like 50%. Now what I would like you to do is create a new div on your page, give it a border, some kind of border, Give it a border radius of 50% or 5 pixels or 10 pixels or 1 pixel if you want to be like really, really elegant about it. Uh, give it a width and a height so that you have a perfect square uh, and then just fiddle around with it. So give that a shot. Pause the video here. And when you're done, hit resume and we will learn a little bit more about border radius. Okay, so this is border radius. And what this does is it applies the radius to the left, the top left, the top right, bottom right, bottom left corners, all equally. And I commented that out, so we're not going to see that anymore. Now what we can do is we can specify an individual corner. So we can say border top left radius is going to be, let's say, five pixels. Border top right radius, let's make this one obnoxious, let's make this 50, and let's do border bottom right radius. Let's do this one as five pixels. And the border bottom left radius. And now we have something that looks a little bit like a leaf. So now we're starting to make shapes, which is really interesting because all this is is a border. And what I find to be kind of peculiar is if I right click on this element, go to inspect and hover over this, you can actually see it's still a square. Your browser thinks this is a square, but the CSS engine then renders it to not be perfectly square. So what I would like you to do now is try to fiddle around with the border top left radius, uh, top right, bottom right, and bottom left radius. Now, if you're feeling really spicy and you want to go one step further, we can always do border radius, five pixels, 50 pixels, 50%, uh, five pixels, 50%. And what this is going to do is top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. And that's going here, 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 and then down here. And that's going to go in a clockwise order. Go ahead and have some fun with this. Uh, this can really spice up like your own profile, your portfolio page, if you will. Let's look at display. So in HTML 101 and HTML 201, we learned about different block types. And so in H1, this is a block element. And a span, this is an inline element with more text beside it. And if we do with more text beside it, we're going to see something very interesting. So when I load up my page here, this is a block element this h1 and you can see it's taking up all this extra space over here 
It's a block element. It's selfish. It wants to use as much possible space even if it doesn't need it. And you can tell that it's a block element because even though this is a block element and we wrote with more text beside it, it kicked it down into its own line. Whereas the span is an inline element and it said, you know what, I'm only going to take up the amount of space that I actually need. And yes, other elements and other text can live beside me. I'm totally cool with that because I'm not selfish. But block elements are kind of selfish and they take up all the space that they possibly can. Now with CSS, we can overwrite this. And this is really important because you're going to see one element over and over and over again. And that's the div. The div element, this is a block element. The div element is a block element. And it's going to be selfish. It's going to take up as much space as it possibly can. And so let's say we have these two block elements and we want these to be side by side. We can do this. We can overwrite this now with CSS. We can say select both divs on the page and we can say display and its default behavior is block. But we could say display inline. Let's also give this a border. One pixel solid red so both of them have a border and we can see where we're working. In fact, actually, let's, let's back that up just one sec. Let's change this. Let's comment this out. These are block elements. It's taking up all the space that they possibly can from left to right. Let's change the display type to inline, go back to our page and hit refresh. And they work side by side. Now, why this is important? Well, there are probably a thousand different use cases, but the most popular use case that you're going to see is div. Divs are block elements, but they're also dummy elements. They don't actually mean anything. So you're going to be overwriting display block from a div to display inline or inline block. Now. Now, here's the difference between inline and inline block. Okay, this is a very important thing to distinguish. Is on our div here, if we said the width was supposed to be 200 pixels each and the height was supposed to be 200 pixels each. And actually, this is really cool. I didn't know that VS Code does this, but this tells me here that the property is ignored due to the display. With display inline, the width, height, margin, top, margin, bottom, and float properties have no effect. So now we're getting into internal rules of CSS. So when we go back to our page, it has absolutely no effect. Now to get around this, we simply say display inline block. And when I refresh the page, we can see that they turn into proper squares. So what I would like you to do is fiddle with this because this is vital, 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 vital for working with CSS. I want you to create two divs and then I want you to make them side by side. Use display inline and then inline block and set a width and a height on both of them. Make sure that they can be side by side and that they are two squares, just like I did in this video. Give that a shot. Once you're done, let's head on over to that next lesson. Let's talk about width here. So let's go ahead and create a new element. I'm gonna style it first and then I'm going to give it an element. So let's select a div that has a class of half width. And here we can say the width is going to be 50%. And I can actually read this and create something out of this. Now watch this. This is really cool. In VS Code, I can do div dot half width and then hit tab and it wrote my class out for me. So basically I just wrote CSS, hit tab, and it wrote out the HTML for me. That's really cool. That's called an Emmet abbreviation. This is half width. And so when I refresh the page from the last lesson, doesn't look like much is happening, but in my inspect tools here, my developer tools, you can see that it's actually taking up half the width here. And if I scroll all the way down, I can select that inside here, and it's only taking up 50%. I can change that too. Let's go ahead, change it to 90%. And now you can see it's taking up 90%. Now I find that hard to work with, so what I like to do is add a border. So I do border one pixel solid red, and this just shows me what I'm working with here. So when I refresh a page, it went back from 90% to 50 because I was just fiddling around in the developer tools and it doesn't save your work there. Uh, so I changed that width back to 50%, gave it a border, and we can see what we're working with here. Now we can also give this a width of something a little more solidified. So 50% is 50% of your browser. So if you shrink your browser down, and I'll show you what I did there. Let's go back, right click, inspect, and I'm using Google Chrome for this. Click this little icon, toggle device toolbar, and we can see when we toggle this, 
that the width is always 50% of the page. It's never ever going to change. It's always going to be 50% of the page, even if that page is super tiny. And this is 300 pixels wide, so this is a very small mobile device. Or we can say, let's say 500 pixels. And when I refresh this, and this is pretty hard to see, I apologize for that, is it's always 500 pixels here. Always, always, always. And so when I do this, we can see it's always 500 pixels. And when I do this, the box itself actually isn't getting smaller. My viewport is getting smaller. But watch this. When I get small enough, it bumps on over. So that's really hard to see. Uh, kind of a terrible example, but there are two different ways to specify a width. Now, the thing to know about width is you need to have display inline block or display block set. One of the two. It's important that you have one of the two set because if you said display inline and you set a width, VS Code is already complaining here. Let's go ahead and get rid of that view. Inline is only going to take up the minimum amount of width that it possibly needs. It's not going to understand that you want a width of 500 pixels. So to get around that, we do inline block. That works. We can check this out. We can see that it only takes up 502 pixels on my screen. Or we can do block. Same thing, 502 pixels on my screen, but it also takes up this extra white space there. Now we can do the same thing without a div. We can change this to a span. Let's get rid of display block so it's its normal thing. And let's go ahead and change this to a span. So span, half width, 500 pixels, one pixel solid red border. Well, a span is an inline element. We can tell it's an inline element because the width is not being set here. We can also tell that it's an inline element because if we go here and just hover, it's using the minimum amount of space possible. But we can overwrite that. We can say display inline block or display block, and this will now accept width. Height. Let's talk about height. So we, we talked about width in the last lesson and how it works with inline, uh, inline block and block elements, or how it doesn't work with inline elements, rather. Uh, so I'm not going to go over that again. If that was sort of beyond your understanding when I just said this about 10 seconds ago, definitely go back to the lesson on width where I talk about the different display types. So let's go ahead and give this a height of 500 pixels as well. Height. 500 pixels. And you can see that this is actually getting easier for us. We've spent a little bit of time together. We know that this is a property, this is a value, this is a selector. We can have multiple declarations in here. And so width 500 pixels, height 500 pixels. We don't really need to go over like what height actually is in like the English language. We know what it is already. And we know that width works one way, so height should probably work the similar way. So we're, we're speeding up how fast we can learn CSS here, which is really nice. So let's go ahead and refresh this page and get rid of that. And we have this big square. Now that might be too big. What I'm going to do here is select that 500 pixels, go to selection, add next occurrence. And now I can type in two places. Let's do 250 pixels each. Save that. Now we have a square. Now as a quick recap, width and height are only going to work if you have display inline block or display block set. It's not going to work with inline, because I'll show you, it just doesn't work with inline. Inline is supposed to be side by side, takes up the least amount of space, it's very very polite, whereas inline block and block are a little more selfish and they take up as much space as they possibly can, or as much space as you tell them to. Box shadows, okay this is a really really cool one, so let's go ahead and create a new box here, and I'm going to actually get rid of all of this and let's delete that and delete that, and let's create a new element on our page with the ID of box. So B-O-X, and I hit tab because it shows Emmet abbreviation, shows me what it's going to be. And that's all I'm going to do. Now I've got a div, we know it's a block element, and I can select that ID with box, and I can say the width of this box is going to be 200 pixels, the height of this box is going to be 200 pixels, and the border is going to be one pixel solid black. And let's not make it one pixel, let's make it two pixels. And we're just going to see a black box on our page, just like that. Now what I can do here, uh, and we're going to start using a lot of components together, is I can add a background image. 
and let's add the URL. And let's add Chewy in there. Let's say the background position has to be center and center. And let's say background size needs to be cover. Let's see what this looks like now. Okay, so we filled it with a background image. That's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and add a border radius of zero on the top, 50% on the top right. The bottom right is going to be zero and the bottom left is going to be 50% as well. So it's going to look somewhat like a leaf, like that. And I think I might have said that backwards. So this is top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. Now with a box shadow, we can say box shadow. And this, this is a very interesting one. So we want the x-axis, the y-axis, and the color. So on the x-axis, let's move this over 10 pixels. On the y-axis, let's move this over 10 pixels. And the color, let's make this red, just so it's obnoxious. And we have some sort of box shadow. Now, that's not bad. I don't mind that. But let's say, you know, we didn't want such a hard line there. Let's say we wanted to blur it a little bit. We can say x, y, and then as a blur value, we can say, let's say, 5 pixels of blur, and then change it to red. And we can see that it gets a little blurry there. We can actually make this significantly blurrier too. Let's do 15 pixels. There we go. Now, that sort of suggests that there's like some sort of light over here. Let's go ahead and change that X to like 2 pixels. So it's going to move right 2 pixels, and then it's going to move down 2 pixels, the Y axis. And we have some sort of glow back here. So that's looking pretty good. Now there's one other thing we can do. Let's go ahead and get rid of that blur. And that's what our border looks like. We can also say inset. So give it a box shadow on the inside. So it looks like it's a little bit hollow. Look at that. So that's not bad. Now that's red. Let's go ahead and add 444, 444, so a dark-ish color. And let's change these two pixels and go to selection, add next occurrence. Let's make these six pixels each, inset, and a dark gray color. There we go. That's working on the inside. And we can also blur this. So before inset, we can say five pixels. So we can say, move it on the x-axis, 6 pixels, y-axis, 6 pixels, blur every pixel by 5 pixels, inset means the box shadow is going to be on the inside, and then we set the color. And let's go ahead and refresh, and we can see now there's some form of a blur in there. Let's go ahead and make that blurrier. There we go. And so now we're sort of working with all of these individual components, or these declarations, and we're making it bigger into this bigger image component called a box. And it's called a box because I gave it the ID of box. It doesn't have to be called box. We could call it leaf. And we'll see nothing changed. So again, your box shadow goes X, Y, blur, if it's inset or not, and then the color. What I would like you to do is give this a shot. Create a square. You don't have to do all of this stuff, but create a square. Let's say 100 pixels by 100 pixels. Go ahead, give that a box shadow. Set your x axis, your y axis, your blur value. Make it inset and not inset. So toggle them on and off, and then add a color. All right, let's talk about padding and margin. Padding and margin are two things of the same coin. They're two sides of the same coin, but they do different things for a different reason. So let's go ahead and start off by creating a box. And this box is going to have a width of 100, not 100%. That's way too much. Let's do 200 pixels. A uh, height of 200 pixels. And a border of one pixel solid, nope, dash, blue, something like that. And all I want here is some sort of box to show up. And so in here I can type div box and it creates a box for me. And look at that. 
standard box, nothing fancy. Now, when I right click on here and go to inspect, I can actually see that A, this is a block element, it's taking up all this extra width over here. But if I scroll down in my styles area, so I clicked on elements, and clicked on my element, the box, click on styles, and scroll all the way down, we can see that there's padding, margin, and border. And so this is our element here, it's 200 by 200, it's exactly what we set it to be. Then there's padding, that's spacing on the inside of the border. Then there's the border itself, and then the margin around it. So let's talk about padding. Padding is going to be on the inside. So we can do a nice example like this. So example of text, that is a weird way of saying that. Refresh this page, and it says example of text. Now if I wanted to add some padding so that my text doesn't hug that border, we need some sort of spacing on the inside, and that, that is called padding. So we do padding, and let's add 10 pixels, and that just sort of widens it. It widens the gap between the content and the border. And if we scroll on down, we can see that our inner content is still 200 by 200. The padding is 10 pixels on either side, on all four sides. We have a one pixel border, and there's no margin. Now, a lot like with our border radius, and I'm going to add that padding in here, padding 10 pixels. A lot like our border radius, we have top, right, bottom, and left. And we can actually see that in here. We have top, right, bottom, left. And there's a shorthand way of writing 10 pixels, 15, 20, 30. We could change all of that. So we could say, let's first of all comment this out. We could say padding, 10 pixels, that's the top. Then let's do this. Top, right, bottom, left. It goes in clockwise direction. So 10 pixels on the top. 15 pixels on the right, 20 pixels on the bottom, 25 pixels on the left. Refresh our page and we can see that, yep, it definitely did something over here. And when I click this and go over here, we can see top is 10, right is 15, bottom is 20, left is 25. And so that's how we add spacing on the inside of an element. This is very, very, very important. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk about margin, which is Essentially the exact same thing, but the spacing doesn't live within the border. It lives just outside of the border. Let's take a look at margin. Margin is a lot like padding. However, padding is inside of a border and margin is on the outside of a border. So carrying on from our last video, our last lesson, let's go ahead and add a margin of 30 pixels. And when I go back to my page and hit refresh, this isn't going to say dash, this is going to say 30, 30, 30, and 30. So refresh, and there we go. It's 30 all the way around, and it gives us 30 pixels all the way around. Now, we're going to see something weird here. Is It's also saying the margin is also all this area. That's because it's a block element. Let's go ahead and change this to display inline block. And you're going to see that it actually respects the margin 30 pixels all the way around. Let's go ahead, scroll to the bottom. So we can see that it's taking effect on the bottom as well. And again, where it says styles here, you can just scroll on down and it will show you what it is. And just like padding, it doesn't have to be just margin 30 all the way across. What we could say is let's copy this. And I just copied that whole line. Margin. So we've got top right, bottom, and left. And now we can see 10, 15, 20, 25. That's exactly what we told it to do. Now a really cool thing, if you ever want to center an element, is we can do margin, let's say we wanted margin auto. And what this is going to do is automatically center this for us. And actually I forgot a thing, uh, it needs to be a block element. So this one needs to be a block element. And that's why it reserves that extra space all the way over here. That block element is reserving that space in case it needs to move around a little bit. So when I hit refresh, we have now centered our block element. And if you want to uh, give it a top and bottom margin, we can always say margin dash top 50 pixels, margin bottom 50 pixels. And there's a shortcut way to do this as well. We could also, or alternatively say, margin top, 50 pixels, right, auto, bottom, 50 pixels, 
left auto. And we can comment this out as well. Go back to our page and refresh. And that top margin has been applied, but it's still centered in the middle of our page. Okay, let's talk about max width. We have been working with width quite a bit. Let's go ahead and use max width. Now, max width is not necessarily going to be used on every single element, but it is going to be used on, let's say, an inline element. So let's say we have some sort of element with an ID called inline. And it's going to have a, not a width, uh, a display inline block. Let's go ahead and create this element. Inline, hit tab, and some text here. And let's also give that a border so we can see this. Border, one pixel, solid red. And so we see this text here. Now we can say because it's an inline block element that it should only ever reach a maximum width before the text breaks onto a new line or overflows. So when we say give something a width of let's say 500 pixels, it's going to give us a width of 500 pixels. But let's say we wanted it to be flexible. So it can start off this small and it can get up until this size. We would use a max width. So let's go ahead and add a max dash width. And we're going to see that the width actually changes back down to the minimum size. And in our tool here, our developer tools, we can right click inspect. And let's add a bunch of text. So I'm just going to copy all this stuff in here and we're going to see something very interesting. This doesn't take up the entire width. This takes up 500 pixels, 502 pixels actually, because there's a border on the left and a border on the right. They're both one pixel. So uh, 502 pixels in total. And what we can do is because we've selected this element, we can say that max width, let's click on that and let's go. See, we're making it bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually the text is going to start getting a little bit shorter and wider on the page. That's what max width is. So a width is a hard set value. So we're saying the width has to be like 500 pixels, but a max width can be anything between zero and 500 pixels or, or whatever you set that value to be. It doesn't have to be 500. It could be any value. Now you're likely not going to use this too much in your project, but it is good to know about. Uh, so there's nothing to do in this particular lesson. In the next lesson, let's go ahead and get started with opacity. Opacity? Opacity. All right, let's talk about making things see-through with opacity. Or is it called opacity? I don't know. I've heard people say it either way. Uh, so for this, we sort of need to start layering our page. So in our body, what I want to do is add a background image. And I'm going to set the URL to be chewy. Let's go ahead and refresh our page here. And we have this image of Chewy. I don't really care that it's repeating right now. We could totally touch that up if we wanted to. We know how, uh, but I want to create a box somewhere on the page and be able to see through it. So let's go ahead and create a new CSS element. Let's give it an ID of box. And it's going to be display block width 200 pixels height. 200 pixels. So now we have a perfect square. We could do margin. Uh, we know how to do this. Like we know how to make this centered. So we could do margin auto and that will center it for us. Or we could say margin top is going to be 50 pixels. The right is going to be automatic. So it's going to center it for us. And because I only have two values in here, it's going to repeat these two values. So it's going to be top, right, bottom, left. Let's go ahead and add a background color of black and make that text color white and text align center. And you can see we're starting to really piece all of these things together. And I'm going pretty fast with this. Uh, let's add a padding of 25 pixels as well. And so what we should see here is in the middle of this page, we're going to see a 200 by 200 block with some white text, uh, black background box. Uh, but before we do that, we actually have to add the box to the page. There we go. So <laughs> it looks like I'm censoring the dog. Uh, that's funny. Did not mean for that to happen, but that's still funny. Uh, so what we can do here is we can actually make this transparent. Now there's no text in here. Let's go ahead and talk about Chewy real quickly. Hi, this is Chewy. He's an amazing doggo. 
white text, padding's kicking in, text is centered, things are looking good. But let's say we actually wanted to see the dog and we didn't want to censor him. What we could say is opacity. And instead of saying like 100% or 50% or 10%, we use a decimal. And so 100 is always equal to 1. And 0 is equal to 0. And 50 is equal to 0 0.5. So a quick little math lesson there. So let's say we want this to be 50% see-through. We could do 0 0.5. And now we can actually see through it. Now, what we can't see is this text is also transparent. Now, this is one way of doing opacity, and this is going to change this entire box to be uh, not transparent, but translucent. It's going to be 50% see-through. Now, we could do this a different way and make that text make sure that it's not see-through. So, uh, ooh, a good example here would be color is equal to red. And that's not really red. That's pink, and it's because it's 50% see-through. Let's go ahead and comment out that opacity, opacity, and let's change that background color to RGBA. So we're going to do 0, 0, 0, and 0 0.5 for 50%. And this is going to change a background color, but that text color is not going to change. It's not going to be 50% transparent because we said, hey, the whole element has 100% transparency, but the background color, just this one declaration, has 50% see through rate. And there we go, that text is a little more bold, but that background didn't change. So there's two ways of doing opacity here. You can use RGBA, which a lot of people are going to do because opacity is going to change the entire thing to be translucent. Or you can change the entire thing to be translucent using opacity. Now what I would like you to do is experiment with this. You can even use this exact same code that I've written here. But I want you to experiment with this using RGBA and opacity. And remember, because we're using translucency or transparency, we're making it see-through anyways, uh, we want to use a decimal, not a percent. All right, let's take a look at external CSS. This is very, very important. So, so far we've been writing all of our styles inside of a style element. What we can do is we can throw all of this into an external file. So we create a new HTML file, uh, not an HTML file, an HTML element called link. So I just typed link, hit tab, and it created a rel style sheet. And this is the relationship of the linked document. So we're saying, hey, browser, there's going to be an, another file that you need to go and fetch for us. But just so you know, it's going to be a style sheet. And then the href is going to be the name of the style. So we do style.css. Now, just taking off from that last lesson, if I right click inspect and go to console and then refresh my page, we're going to see 404 error file not pound, uh, found. Style.css does not exist. And that's because we don't have a file called style.css yet. So what we can do here is new file, style.css, and it's empty. There's nothing in it. So if I go refresh my page, that error doesn't show up. So my browser now knows that there is an external file being pulled in, and it's being pulled in properly. Now there's nothing in there, but what we can do is we can say, grab all this stuff and cut. We can get rid of our style here. And we can go to our style.css and paste. And we can get rid of that comment. That's not needed. And just save that file. So we save both files here. And now we've cleaned up our index.html file. All of our CSS is in its own .css file. Refresh the page, and everything works perfectly. Now, if I were to delete everything out of this page, this page would be pretty boring. But if I were to put everything back into this page, it has a little bit of life, a little pizzazz now. Now, at first, you're probably thinking, well, why on earth would I do that? What's really nice is you can create another index file or another file. We'll call this second.html. And some other text in CSS 101. Let's change this to second page. And so now we have two index or two HTML files. We've got index.html and second.html. If I go back here, index.html works. And if I go to second.html, this works as well. Actually, that changed my zooming level. There we go. So when I flip between the two pages, 
I get all the same styling, all the same goodies, but I can change my text, I can change my content. Now again, where this gets really, really powerful is if you have 100 HTML files, you don't want to be writing style and then going in there and being like box, yada, 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 and copying and pasting that 100 times. That will drive you nuts. And that is no way to live your life as a web developer. Instead, we throw everything into an external file and then we link to it. And now I can change. Let's say I can get rid of the background image on style.css, and it's going to take effect on both index and second.html. So let's go back to our browser, and I'm going to hit refresh. This is on second.html. We can see that up here. I got rid of the background. And if I go back to index.html, I got rid of that background as well. And all I did was commented out in one place instead of two places. And so it's a lot more efficient to write your code like this. Now there's another benefit is when you are serving your website, your browser can actually cache this entire CSS file. So it doesn't have to download it every single time you view a page and it's actually significantly faster. So it's good for your users as well. So the preferred way to write CSS is in a CSS file. I just called it style.css. You can call it literally anything you want.css as long as it has that .css in there. Now, I really, really need you to give this one a shot. This is very, very important. This is, again, a, a super vital part of CSS and HTML and how they link together. So in your index.html file or whatever file you're creating, I want you to add a link. Take all of that styling, throw it in your style.css. Notice how there is no style element in here. There's no style element whatsoever. And then take your insides, the inside of this element. So you had a bunch of stuff in here. Take your selectors, cut them, and put them into your style.css file. So make sure that works with an external file. And then after that, I want you to level that up, copy this file into like another one called second.html and make sure that your CSS file loads on both pages at the same time. All right, let's take a look at floating elements. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to comment out this box and I'm going to keep my external style sheet linked to my page. So I'm going to write code in style.css, but I'm not going to delete this. I want to keep this because maybe I want to use it some other time, but I'm going to leave uh, or make some extra space to work here. And what I want to do is demonstrate floating elements. And so a floating element is very, this is very interesting. So we can have a paragraph and we can put lorem in here and we could copy this paragraph over and over and over again. Let's go ahead and copy this over and over and over. Actually, nope, that was wrong. Let's back that up. Let's add a line break. Let's do this this way. Do, 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 do. We're going to have a lot of text in here. And let's refresh our page. And so you can see that style.css is still working for us. Actually, let's go ahead and comment that out because that's going to be counterintuitive to this lesson. There we go. And so we have all this text in here. And now the idea of floating is when you have an image, you can put an image somewhere in here and you can either make it float to the left or float to the right. And that's going to make your text wrap around everything. So let's go ahead and add an image and I'll show you what a normal image looks like inside of a big paragraph like this. We could do, let's say the BR here, we could say IMG SRC is equal to chewy.jpg. And let's give it a width of 200 pixels or 200 pixels. And the height is going to be automatically inherited. So whatever the aspect ratio is for a width of 200, it's going to have the proper height. And that didn't work because I spelled Chewy wrong. Okay, so we've got this image over here and like it's close, but it doesn't really look like a like a news website or or like a newspaper would do it we actually want the text to wrap around here so what we can do is we can say style is equal to float and then we can say float right and what this is going to do is boom move that image all the way to the right and have text flow around it which is really really nice we can also say float left and it does the exact same thing now we can also add some margin around here margin 10 pixels, just so that we have some spacing around there. We could do border, 
one pixel solid black, and I'm doing internal CSS here. And then I could say, give this a box shadow, X axis, zero, Y axis zero. Let's make it blur by five pixels and make this black. And now we have some sort of image that actually sticks out. Now this is all internal CSS, and this is probably the most frowned way of writing CSS. So I'm gonna grab that, cut, delete it, and I'm gonna give this a class of floating image. And then if I go over to style.css, I can select that image with image dot floating image. Alternatively, this would work as well. And I can just paste that in there. And so new line, new line, move over there, new line. And if I did that right and I refresh this, nothing should change. Beautiful. And if I wanted to change that float, I could change that to right. Just like that. And so that's how we sort of make images and content float side by side. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I have two images floating side by side like this? Well, let's take a look. They float side by side. They literally try to get as close to each other as possible. Now, there's a little bit of text in here, and so it's going to offset things as well, which is very, very interesting. So you might not get the exact outcome that you're looking for, uh, but it can be very, very close. Now, the nice thing about this is floating image is going to be floating to the right. We can overwrite this with internal CSS, and this is a good case for internal CSS. We can say float left. There we go. That looks a little bit better. Now, I really want you to give this a shot. You're going to be using floats quite a bit until you get into significantly more advanced CSS. Uh, floats are very, very important at this point in time in your development career, or your development path, so make sure you are somewhat familiar with them. Uh, what you can do as another um, sort of fun example or something to play with is you can do an ordered list or an unordered list, an li, and you can put them all side by side. Or you can have div.float, and you can put these all side by side, make them float side by side. Go ahead, give that a shot. Don't feel like you need to master this one, uh, but give it a shot, have some fun with it, and just sort of get some hands-on experience with how this one works. It's, it's a little bit weird to get a hang of at first, but it's really good to tinker around with it and just, you know, experiment. Okay, let's talk about your project. So your project here is going to be to go to rocketman.learnwagtail.com and I want you to recreate the navigation and the hero section using what we've learned. This. I want you to recreate this. Now you can always go to that website and you can right click inspect and see how I did all these different things and that's going to get you pretty far but it's not going to get you all the way. This particular page uses a different type of styling, uses a framework, it uses things like Flexbox, which we didn't necessarily learn, but there are ways around that. I'm gonna, and I'm going to leave that up to you to figure out how to get around more complex things by using simpler methods. And that's actually a really good thing to learn in web development. Always keep things as simple as possible. Now, this is not an easy project. And I'll just flip back here. This is not an easy project, but it's really, really good practice. And it uses everything we have learned in this course. So once again, this is not an easy project, but it is perfect practice. And the reason I say that is because one day a designer is going to hand you a design and it's going to look something like this. And they're going to say, okay, now you have to code it and you have to figure that out on your own. Now you can always go to rocketman.learnwagtail.com and you can see that right up here. But yeah, a designer is going to say, here's a design, make it happen. And you're going to have to try to make it happen. And you're not going to have very much guidance or support. And you're going to have to figure that out on your own. So this is really, really, really good practice. This is real life practice here. So go ahead, go to rocketman.learnwagtail.com, recreate the navigation and hero section using what we've learned. If you're like, oh, I don't have access to this particular image or this logo, that's okay. You can use your own logo. You can just Google something. You can throw any image in there that you want. Uh, it doesn't also have to be based on rockets. This is just a fun little website I made once upon a time. You can make it about coding, your favorite food, your favorite family member, your favorite hobby. It could be really anything, but recreate this layout and feel free to swap out the content, so the text that you see on here, or feel free to swap out the images or both. With that said, go ahead and give that a shot. Reference anything you need. Feel free to Google 
as much as you possibly need in order to get to the answers that you're looking for. And a lot of questions will come up and that's totally normal, but feel free to Google your questions so that you can find the answers. And again, that's a big part of web development as well. If you took CSS 101, you should already know three display types, inline, inline block, and block. In this video, let's go ahead and demo the difference between all three of them because this is vital to know for the rest of this course. So I have my editor open here. And I went to File, Open, and then I opened a folder called Lesson Files. I'm going to create a new file in here called index.html. And in here, let's do HTML colon 5, hit Tab, and it creates our page for us. And let's call this working document CSS 201. Now, there are three different display types in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a div. And I'm going to actually create three divs and show you the differences between them. So div, this is the first copy that line, this is the second, copy that line. And all I'm doing here in VS Code is control C, control V, and it seems to copy the whole line down one for me. And then this is the third. Now I'm going to go over to my browser and I'm going to go to file open. And I'm going to open index.html. And okay, we see a boring, 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 boring page. But what we can do here is just demo this quickly. And again, this is super vital to know. So we have three divs here. Let's go ahead and create a new selector. Let's go ahead. And all I did there was right click, inspect, and clicked on one of these divs. It doesn't matter which one. And click this little button over here that says new style rule. I'm going to make this bigger as well. Click this button. It's going to automatically give me a div. And we could change the display type. Now we can't change this one because that one comes default with our browser, but we can overwrite it. And we can say display block is what it currently is. Let's give this a border though. Border one pixel solid red. And this is what display block looks like. And this is in vast contrast to display inline, where all the elements are side by side. And then we can do inline block, which doesn't really look like it did a whole lot. It is moving it down just a, just a, a touch there. And what inline block allows us to do is padding 10 pixels, and we could do margin 5 pixels if we wanted to. 5 pixels. Now we can do uh, a margin. We can add a margin. We can add a padding with a block element as well. And we can toggle these on and off if we wanted to. Now, one thing to note is inline looks a little bit different from inline block. So we can do inline, inline block. I'm just moving this up and down. I'm just toggling this with my up and down arrow keys. And so this is inline, this is inline block. And it's important to notice those differences because we're going to be using inline block a lot in this course. And this is block. We're also going to be using this. So these are the three uh, display types that we're going to get started with in this course. And it is absolutely vital that you know these because we're going to be working with things like flex block, flex box, and grid. And those are not easy to sort of wrap our heads around. So we need to be pretty familiar with that. And we covered that in CSS 101. Uh, if you're in that course, definitely feel free to go back to the display lesson in CSS 101 where we cover this a little more in depth. Okay, let's take a look at the box model. This is something we didn't cover in CSS 101, which I really wanted to, but I think it was slightly too advanced. So the box model is this idea that you have a box and you can have padding and margin, and it depends on your browser's rules on how to calculate the width of that element. So if we create a div here, and let's just call it div class box, and that's all we're going to do. I'm going to save that. Come on over to this page, and I already pre-opened this before I recorded this lesson. So if I go to inspect, I'm going to see that in my body I have box, and I can add a class here for dot box, and let's add some styling. So border one pixel solid red. Let's give this a height of 300 pixels, a width of 300 pixels. And let's change that border instead of one pixel. Let's do like five pixels. And now when I come down here, when I scroll all the way down, we can see that it's 300 by 300. Okay, cool. Now if I wanted to, I could add a padding here. I could say padding 
30 pixels. And you notice how when I toggle this on and off, it makes my box bigger. And that's not necessarily what I want because when I add padding 30 pixels, this box is no longer 300 pixels. It's 370 pixels wide. It has five pixels on either side for 10, five on the left, five on the right, 300 pixels on the inside, and then 30 pixels of padding on the left and the right. So if we add this up, we have five, 30, 300, 30 over here, and another five. And if we scroll on down, we can actually see all these numbers here. Border of five, padding 30, inside of 300. Now, sometimes that's what we want, but for the most part, that's not what we want. What we want is to say, make the whole thing 300 pixels wide or 300 pixels tall, and that includes the padding. So by default, the box model, what we're looking at here, our box model here, does not include having padding, does not include having margin. So what we can say is box sizing, and by default, it's content box, but we want border box. And you can see that it makes it bigger or smaller here. And we're changing the default behavior of a browser. Typically, we want border box. What border box does is says, add that border, add that padding, and make sure all of that together is a width of 300. So now when I hover over this, we can see that that box is a little bit smaller. And when I scroll on down, none of these digits actually change, but the box itself is smaller. It's saying the entire thing is 300 pixels. That's the difference between border box and content box. Now what I would like you to do is give this a shot, create a 300 by 300 box on your page. It does not need to look good. Uh, add some padding to it and then change the box sizing and just notice what the difference is. And this is really, really important for us moving through this course because we're going to be using content box a lot. Okay, let's take a look at outline. Outline is the border that goes around everything. It's honestly the border around a border. You can add an outline and you can tell it to have an offset. Uh, we use the outline offset to give some space between the element and your outline. We'll demonstrate that in just a second. But basically outline is like having two borders and it's really nice for visual improvement. Now, most of the time outlines are actually super important for accessibility. So whenever you hover over an element or when you tab over, like when you use a keyboard and you hit tab over and over on your page, sometimes a button will have like a yellow outline around it or a red outline or a black outline. And it's not the border, it's just this outline and it tells screen readers and people with visually uh, impaired handicaps, people who can't see very well, what is actually selected. It also, for those keyboard warriors out there who like to use a keyboard instead of a mouse, it helps them a lot. And there's a lot of them out there. So it's, it's really, really important. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to save this as a new file called outline. And what I want here is I still have this box. And what I would like to do is add an outline around it. So if I go here, and this is just leaving off from the last lesson. I'm using the exact same file. It's okay because I'm just in the editor here in the inspect tool and our developer tools. I can add an outline, and let's make this just a wee bit smaller. I can add an outline, and it's a lot like a border. So I can say 5 pixels, solid, black. And you can see that it's actually on the outside of all of it. Now, if we look down at our box model, it doesn't even show up in here. We have an inside, we have a padding, we have a border, we have margin on the outside, but it doesn't actually really show us anything about the outline. And so that's the difference between a border and an outline. A border is actually calculated, an outline is not. And you can see this, it doesn't actually make our box move at all, it just literally adds an outline around it. Now there's a way to add an offset. We can say outline dash offset, and we can give this a pixel value as well. So let's say, not four, let's give this a 10 pixel offset. And we're gonna wanna add some margin in here. So let's do margin 30 pixels. And what this offset does is it just moves that outline outwards. Now, what I would like you to do for this particular lesson is create an element and give it a border, then give it an outline. It doesn't really matter what your color is. Uh, you can just give it some sort of outline. I just did something boring, five pixel solid black, uh, and then add an offset to it to demonstrate that this can be moved outwards. Text shadow is a lot like a box shadow. The only difference really here is that a box shadow can have like an inside shadow called an inset and text does not. 
All right, so what I'm going to start doing here is I'm going to write internal CSS. Not external CSS, not inline CSS, but CSS, but internal CSS, so that when you download these project files, you can actually have access to all this CSS. Uh, so I have a box in here. Cool, 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 cool. And let's go ahead and add some text in here. And this text is going to say, hello world. And when I load this up in my browser, it just says, hello world. We can make this significantly bigger. We can change the font size if we wanted to a little bit later, which actually maybe we'll do as well, just so that we can really dive into CSS. So let's select that box by our class. We learned about this selector in CSS 101. And so all this is saying is select this element by this class name. Give us a font size of maybe like 40 pixels. Let's save and refresh. There we go, that's bigger. And now what we can do is we can add a text shadow. So text shadow, and this takes an X, a Y, a blur value, and the color. So let's go ahead and change that X value. We want to move this to the right, let's say 10 pixels. Then the Y value is also going to be 10 pixels. That's going to move it downwards. A blur, let's say it's not going to blur at all. So it's going to be an exact copy, exact outline of our text. And the color here is going to be red. Just something obnoxious that we can really see what's going on. Now we have a text, a text shadow that moves this down 10 pixels and moves it to the right 10 pixels. Now if we wanted something a little more elegant, we could do something like 2 pixels. And by the way, to select this, all I did was select my 10 pixels, or it's now 2 pixels, but I selected that 10 pixels. And if you go to Selection, Add Next Occurrence, for me that's Command D. It's going to be different for you probably, I can imagine. Uh, you can just type in two places at the same time, which is really, really useful. It's a good shortcut to remember. Let's go ahead and save that. Let's refresh, and that looks a little bit better. Now, we can also add a blur value. This blur value currently is zero, which is the same as not having it whatsoever. By default, it's not blurring at all. Let's go ahead and add a blur value of five pixels. And all this is going to do is say, for every pixel that's back there, every red pixel blurred out five pixels. And so we have a nice little blur there. It actually looks like this is coming off of the page a little bit. Now what we can do is we can actually change the body background color. So body background color is going to be black. It's going to be the same color as our text. And let's go ahead and refresh this. And now it looks a little spookier. Now I'm recording this around Halloween, so this is really, really, uh, well, this is applicable because this is kind of spooky. Uh, but we can't see that text anymore, which is really nice. We could also try to, instead of doing that, we could do a color, RGBA, and it doesn't really matter what color we fill. Let's, color, let's fill it with black but let's also make it completely see-through with a zero alpha in there. And now we just have the blurred text. So that is text shadow. What I would like you to do is write some text on your page. It could just say, hello world, uh, and then add a text shadow. Add your X axis, your Y axis, or your horizontal and your vertical alignment. Uh, add a blur and then add a color. You don't have to do the RGBA. We learned about that in CSS 101 as well. So if you need to, uh, go back to CSS 101 and quickly learn what RGBA is. But really, it's just a color mode. It's saying red, green, blue, alpha. Alpha is your transparency. So we said 0, 0, 0. That's black. Make it completely see-through. All right, so this is minimum width. We are going to be talking about what that is. Now, in CSS 101, we learned about maximum width. We learned about regular width. If you don't know about max width, honestly, it's the exact same as minimum width. However, it's the opposite. So it's same, same, but different. Now, maximum width says a, an element can only have a maximum width, uh, and it will try to go from the smallest size to that maximum width before breaking your text onto a new line. Minimum width is sort of the same, but opposite. So I can select this box here, and I can give this a border, four pixels, solid, blue. And let's go in here and throw some lorem ipsum in here. Lorem, and then in VS Code, I just hit tab, and that's because I have Django template selected here. This should be an HTML. Let's undo that. Lorem tab. There we go. And when I load up this page, we can see all this text. Now, this is actually sort of a bad example. I'm going to just delete everything except this one line so that we have this width in here. 
Let's go ahead and delete all of that. Save and refresh. Okay, so now this is not actually going to do anything because this is a block element. And remember that first lesson I said block element display is really, really important. So let's go ahead and trim this. We want to make this not take up the entire width. So we can say display inline block, and this will allow us to use the width element with it. However, it's also going to take up a minimum width here, which is really nice. So this element here is 365 pixels wide. So we want a minimum width of something just a little bit bigger. Let's give this a min width. And let's say that minimum width has to be 450 pixels. And so what this is going to do is sort of move this out to somewhere over here. A oh, pretty good game. <laughs> that was a pretty good guess. So it's going to move it over here. And if I write more text, it's going to then expand. And we can actually see this by going in here. Uh, and I'm just going to copy this line a couple of times. And you can see that it expanded all the way over. So it has that minimum width. And all, all I'm doing here is undoing and redoing. But it has that minimum width. So it doesn't matter if there's extra space or not. It's going to take up that minimum width. And then once it has more content, possibly too much content, what it's going to do is then move this to be a hundred percent width. Now we can we can marry this with max width as well. So we can say the max width can only be somewhere out here. So let's go ahead and combine these. We can say a max width of let's say five hundred pixels. Refresh. It looks like nothing changed. But what this is going to do is say somewhere about here probably uh, is the maximum width. So before this blue border was taking up this entire width. This one no longer will. So I'm going to double click in here and paste that a few times. And we can see that it only takes up up to here now. And our box element, if we go down here, 450 pixels wide is what it is by default. Up here, it's 508 pixels. And that's because it's taking up four pixels on either side. So 500 pixels on the inside, 400 pixels, uh, four pixels on either side, rather. And we can change that box sizing. And let's do border box and you can actually see it's making that little eight pixel difference border box. And if we go back over here, we can see the whole element is 500 pixels. So now we're already using the display uh, stuff that we learned from our display lesson. We're also learning and using box sizing from the box sizing or the box model lesson. So this is min width. The idea again here is just that it's going to be a minimum width. And if you have more content, it can grow to be larger. Positioning is how we move elements around a page. There are a few ways to do this. We can do absolute positions. We can write a relative position, a fixed position, or a sticky position. There's also another one called static, which everything is by default. But the idea is that if you want to make a pixel perfect website, something that really matches the design, sometimes you're going to have to move elements around. And in the next few lessons, we are going to be talking about relative positioning, absolute positioning, fixed positioning, and sticky positioning. And this is what's going to make your site start and start to really act more like an app, especially when it comes to sticky positioning. Uh, but it's also going to help you move things around so that we can create new dynamic components that can layer on top of each other. Relative positioning is the idea of taking an element and moving it from one place where it naturally sits on your page to another place uh, just slightly off. So it takes your position where you're sitting or standing right now. And it's like moving you one inch to the left or one inch to the right. So I have a new document here for relative positioning. And what we want to do is create a box and then just sort of move it a little bit. So let's go ahead and grab that box class. Let's give it a width. 300 pixels height, 300 pixels border, 10 pixels solid black. And when I open this up in the browser, it's just a regular box. We've seen this a few times already throughout this course. So what I want to do here now is I can say position, and there's a bunch of them in here, but let's go position relative. And it looks like nothing has changed. And that's actually right. Nothing should have changed. But now we can use top left, right, or bottom selectors, or not selectors, but properties. So we could say move this from the top, move it downwards. Let's move this down 10 pixels. Okay, so that wasn't very much. Let's move this down 30 pixels. And let's move this to the left or from the left, 30 pixels as well. And when we toggle these on and off, we can actually see that this is in fact moving. 
It's moving the entire element for us. And so again, what relative positioning does is it says, okay, so this is where your element sits by default on your page, but let's change that position to relative. So relative to where it usually sits, sits. from the top, move it down 30 pixels. From the left, move it to the right 30 pixels. So let's say instead of top, we can say bottom. And you can see that I actually moved it out of my viewport, the viewport being this big white section here. And we can toggle that on and off as well. And instead of left, we can say right. And this does the exact opposite. And let's toggle these on and off as well. And so that's relative positioning. Now, where this comes in really, really handy is when you have to move something just slightly off of where it naturally sits. Maybe you're already using your padding, you're already using your margin, you're using negative padding or negative margin and you need to sort of move this away just a little bit just to make it perfect this is where relative positioning really comes into play now relative positioning has another sort of superpower uh, and that's when it comes to child elements that use position absolute which we're going to talk about next absolute positioning lets us move an element based on its parent element but the trick here is that the parent element has to be position relative so taking over from that last lesson, what I have here is just a regular box. And if I go back to my editor here, let's go ahead and change this position to not absolute, but relative. And that's this box in here. And let's make some space to work. And this really does nothing from that last lesson. Now where this gets powerful, where absolute positioning comes in, is let's say I have a second box. So let's do second dash box. And this is an Emmet abbreviation. So if you're just joining this course now, you haven't taken CSS 101 or HTML 101 or HTML 201, where I talk about Emmet abbreviations. All I'm doing here is writing a little bit of CSS. And as soon as you see this Emmet abbreviation, you can hit tab and it creates a div for you by default with a class of second box, just like writing CSS. And then you just hit tab. And let's say this needs to be in the top right. So let's go back to our page here and refresh. And this just says top right. Now we can add some styling to this and let's say it needs to be a box in the top right quadrant. What we can do is now select this box and we can say second box, position, absolute. Let's also give this a border, a border of three pixels, solid, blue, just so we know where we're working. And when we do position absolute, literally nothing changes. It just added a border around here. I'm going to zoom in even more here. Now, what I would like to do is for this to move into this top right quadrant, as if I was making a graph with an X and Y axis, and it has a negative X and a negative Y axis. What I can do is because this is position absolute, I can now say, let's stick this to the top. And that's going to say zero. It's already there by default, but in case your element isn't, what this is going to do is move this to the top of the page. And as an example, let's do bottom. So bottom zero is going to say that position absolute around this relative element is going to stick to the bottom. And then we could say right zero. And now that moves it to the bottom right. Now to move this back up, all we have to do is change that bottom to top. So we set position absolute, top is zero, right is zero. And all this is going to do is move this to the top right. Now that is what we wanted, but we want it to take up like this full quadrant here. So what we can do is we can say a width of 50% and let's try a height of 50%. And now we have a box in that top right quadrant. And that's what position absolute allows us to do. It allows us to do something like this. Now, this is sort of an ugly example, but if we wanted to, we could give this a background of black. And let's go ahead and get rid of this border. And now it looks like we've carved out a chunk of this. Now, if we want to get even fancier, we're often not going to be working with borders all the time. So let's go ahead and get rid of this black border on our parent element, the box, the relative element. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. And now we've moved this box somewhere where it doesn't live naturally. So there's this 300 by 300 box. You can see it here. And we've said, out of that 300 by 300 box, take 50% of the width, 50% of the height for 150 by 150, move it to the top right. 
Now I'm just going to quickly undo that and I'm going to show you what happens when I take position relative away from the parent element. So I'm working on the box here. And if I get rid of position relative, it goes straight to the entire page. It takes up 50% of the page's width and it takes up 50% of the page's height or the viewport actually, not the entire page, but just the viewport here, uh, which could very well be the same thing depending on your page. Uh, so yeah, if you ever want an element to sort of be absolutely positioned, you have to make sure your parent element is using position relative. Now it's not doing any harm. You'll notice that when I toggle this on and off, that box on the left here doesn't change whatsoever. It just changes the behavior of its child elements. And this is a really important concept to understand in CSS because when we get to the end of this course, we're going to be working with a lot of child elements. Let's take a look at fixed, fixed positioning. That's a hard one to say with a microphone. Fixed positioning. Fixed positioning sticks an element to a certain part of your viewport and it lets you slide down the page as the page moves down. That was actually a terrible example. You know when you're on a website and there's a header and it's got like navigation and a logo and stuff and as you slide down the page, it slides down the page with you? This is fixed positioning. Now I just reset my page to have a style and a box. Let's select this box and add some styling. So this box, let's say is going to have a border, one pixel, solid, red, and a background color of, let's make this look a little more elegant, F5, 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 and let's not do border one pixel solid red. Let's do border bottom two pixels solid CCC, and you can see those colors show up here. So it's an off-white and a light gray. And let's just change this. Okay, there's no content in there, but let's add some content. Let's say this is a header. Okay, let's zoom that in the opposite direction that I'm going. And okay, so this doesn't look great. Let's actually clean this up a little bit. Let's get rid of that body mar margin. Let's do this. Body, or is it padding? I can't ever remember. But let's do margin zero. Let's just reset this and padding zero. So that these corners of this header actually touch the sides. Perfect. And in that header, let's go ahead and give this a padding of 40 pixels. Nope, that's far too obnoxious for <laughs> this demonstration. Let's do 20 pixels. Okay, that's not looking too bad. We can live with that. Now, let's say we want to scroll down the page. Now, I don't have enough content to scroll down the page here, but what I can do is say that body needs to have a minimum height or a fixed height of, let's say, 3,000 pixels. And all this is going to do is let me scroll all the way down as if I had more content. Now, what if I wanted to scroll down and I wanted this to stay with me? We can do that. And all we say here is position fixed. Now, this might be a little bit janky depending on the browser you're using, depending on the version of the browser you're using. And you can actually see it is a little bit janky. This is sort of like an inline element, an inline block element, and it didn't take up the entire width. What we need to do is set a value, top, right, bottom, or left value. And what we can do is we can say, stick this to the top of the page, make it stick to the left of the page like it currently is, but also give this a width of 100% of the page. And I'll just move that up a bit. And there we go. Now I'm scrolling down the page and you can actually see my sidebar over here. As I scroll, it's staying sticky. Now this is a very bad example. A better example would be if I have a paragraph in here and I throw some lorem and I just copy this over and 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 over again. And so we're going to be able to see that this page can actually scroll. So I save that refresh and at the top of my page I've got my lorem ipsum but as I scroll down it now stays with me. This is fixed positioning. This makes it sort of sticky to the top of the page. Now, sticky positioning is a different type of positioning. We're going to talk we're going to tackle that one next. However, fixed positioning is really really nice because it's going to layer on top of your entire page. So, you know when you're on a website and it got it has that annoying little thing at the bottom right and it's like message us for support or whatever and it's on like 50% of all websites these days. It's kind of irritating to be honest. Uh, but it sticks with you no matter where you are on the page and it layers on top of everything. That's what position fixed does for you. 
Now, what I would like you to do is give this a shot, create a fixed header like what I have, throw a bunch of content in here. You're going to need enough so that your page can actually scroll and then scroll down your page and make sure that it just layers on top of everything. Sticky positioning is relatively new to CSS. It allows us to have a header to stick to its parent element. So in the last lesson, we looked at fixed positioning where it was fixed to the entire page, your entire viewport actually. And we just made a header that scrolled all the way down the page with us. And it looked a lot like this. Actually, it looked exactly like this because this is what we wrote. Now, sticky can do essentially the same thing. So fixed, we can say this is sticky. And you can see as I scroll up and down the page, it stays with me as well. However, the difference between sticky and fixed is fixed is going to be here no matter what. And even if I scroll down the page where there's no extra content, it's going to stay there. Whereas with sticky, it's going to be sticky to its parent element. So let's go ahead and create an example here. We have this box and let's select that box and let's do display sticky. Okay, so I just wrote a bunch of stuff here from that last lesson. I gave the body a margin of zero, padding of zero, default height of 3000. Actually, we don't need that either. And the box is positioned sticky, background colors the same as the last lesson border bottom as a little bit of padding. Let's go ahead and get rid of that one. And when I refresh the page, we just have this bar here. Now let's go ahead and throw this inside of a parent element. So we have this box and then we can have a paragraph with lorem in here. Copy, paste, 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 paste. And if I zoom this in, we're gonna see that it's no longer sticky. And so yeah, it's not sticky, but we can make the sticky. This actually requires another property here. So because it's position sticky, it also needs to have top, right, bottom, left. Usually it's just top. We give this a top property here. And let's say zero. And that just tells it where to be sticky. Otherwise it doesn't know. And so now when I scroll down the page, it stays sticky. Now that's part one of two. The second part is to make it sticky only for this particular section where there's all this stuff in here. So let's go ahead and add a style on here. Style to have a background color of red and a color of white. And refresh a page. And we're going to see, oh, I forgot to make that sticky by adding top zero. So stick to the top. There we go. So now it's sticky. Let's add another section underneath this blue and let's change that header as well. So let's go ahead and basically copy this entire thing, and I just collapsed that with a little arrow here. And let's go underneath, and this one's going to be background color of blue. And let's change what's in here. So let's say section two of our box. Now we're using, we're reusing CSS, and in the top one here, let's do section one. Okay, let's scroll back up to the top of the page, refresh. Oh, we can't see that color very well. Color is equal to black. That's better. So this is section one, and as I scroll down, it's going to stay there. And section two, woo, gets bumped out of the way. And then there's section two. And as I scroll up, woo, section one comes back into play. I really like this part. That's really nice. That used to be really hard for us to do, but it comes default with CSS3 these days, which is really, really nice. So that is what sticky is. Now in summary, you need position sticky, you need a top value. So we've got a top value of zero. And all we did here was we have a parent element. I have some inline CSS here, not the greatest way to do things, but it really drove the whole example home. Uh, so we have a parent container here. And then inside of it, we have position sticky, and it's going to be sticky around all of this content because it's sticky to its parent element. Now, what I would like you to do is give this a shot because this is really important for making websites look and act really, really nice on mobile devices, which is part of responsive web development, and that's part of more advanced CSS. So knowing position sticky is going to be very, very helpful for you. So please give this a shot. If you get stuck, don't forget you can always ask questions in the Learning to Code Facebook group. Overflow is when you can constrict an element's width and height, but then you sort of run the risk of your content sort of like overflowing to the outside of it. In this lesson, I'm going to provide an example and how you can sort of create like a, a scroll bar inside of your boxes. 
Now we have a few different options. We can choose to hide the overflow. We can let the user scroll either left and right, up and down, or just up and down. More often than not, we really just want the user to scroll inside of a box up and down. So let's go ahead and add some content to this box. Now I just have this regular box. We've been working with this throughout the rest of this course, or up until this part of the course anyways. Let's add some lorem ipsum in here and let's add another line and another line. And let's just make this really long. And the idea here is that this box is supposed to be 300 pixels wide by 300 pixels tall. And this is going to be more content than that box can contain. So if I refresh this page and zoom in, oh, it's actually not quite enough. Let's go ahead and copy this just a couple more times. Here we go. And the idea here is if I zoom out, we have this box and our content is breaking out of it. Now the reason this happens is because we have set a width and a height. We said specifically with this one, the height of this box is 300 pixels. And it needs to be 300 pixels because maybe that's what our designer said. Our designer said it has to be 300 pixels, cannot be any bigger. It's not allowed to grow, otherwise it's going to look a little weird. So what we can do is add this little scroll bar to the right side here. And we do this quite easily. So on our box class, all we have to do is say overflow. And let's change this to an HTML document again. I write a lot of Django, so my HTML files automatically default to a Django template. Uh, yours should automatically default to HTML by default as soon as you have the .html extension in your file name. So overflow, we have a few different options here. And this is really great. All I did was move my mouse there and it says syntax, visible, hidden, clip, scroll, auto. Uh, let's do, uh, let's do hidden first. And so if we wanted to hide that content, hidden will hide that extra content. There is actually more content down here. And we can actually see when I hover over this text that this text takes up that entire section, but it's being hidden. We can also say visible, and that's just the default. That's what we saw originally. And then we can do auto. And this is the one you're going to want more often than not is scroll back here or flip back here. Overflow auto. And when I refresh, it allows me to scroll up and down just like that. Now, this is going to be really important if you're creating an area like uh, a product feature list and you don't want it to take up the entire page and make your user scroll forever. They can choose on a mobile device to just scroll within this box. Or if you have a frequently asked question section, same thing. You don't want it to take up the entire page. If there's like 100 questions, you might just want it to take up like 300 pixels and they can scroll through the answers in here. So that is overflowing. Go ahead, give us a shot. Remember, you need to set a height. Uh, you need to have more content than what your elements can currently hold with that height. And then set the overflow to auto. And that will just give you this little bar like that. To horizontally center an element, we need to use the block element so that it can reserve the entire width of its sort of section uh, and it tries to reserve like the entire width I guess I'll demonstrate this in just a second and then we can use margin left auto margin right auto and so all I have here is a block and I don't want this to be inline block I want this to be block uh, which is the default so I don't actually need that for a div and so I've got four pixel solid blue min width and max width let's just change that to a width and a height I copied the wrong file and that's okay. It's easy enough to change. So width of 400 pixels and a height of 400 pixels. And when I open this, el this element or this, this page in my browser, we can see that I have this box. Now let's say I wanted it to, it to be right in the center. What I can do is I can say down here, and I'll make this a bit bigger, margin left auto, and that's going to automatically apply all of the margin it can so we actually moved it to the right. That's kind of cool. But if we wanted it to be in the center, we do margin right auto. And this balances it on either side. And a shortcut you're often going to see me do is something like margin. Let's say the top is going to be 50 pixels and left and right are going to be auto. This is top. This is right. This is bottom. This is left. And so we can toggle these off because they're not being used whatsoever. And now we have margin all the way around and our element is centered. Now why this is important? Because eventually you're going to need to be able to center an element based on its margin. 
not just the text, you want to center it based on its margin, so it's always centered. Now, it's at this point you're probably wondering, wow, okay, this is cool, we're doing all these things, but it doesn't really look very nice. And the problem with learning CSS is you need to learn these smaller components, these little tips and tricks, before we can actually start making something really beautiful. We need to know how all these small components work together. And so this is how we center something in the center of our page. And let's just do, 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 do. There we go. It's in the center of our page using margins. Go ahead, give that a shot when you're ready. Let's head on over to the next lesson. All right, let's take a look at advanced selectors. We have a few different selectors we can work with. We uh, actually, there's a ton of selectors in CSS, but we're going to be working with descendant selectors, child selectors, adjacent selectors, and general sibling selectors. So let's go ahead and create a bunch of boxes here. And I'm going to put this in a parent with an ID called parent. And let's just move that up. And let's create all these boxes. And let's style these boxes as well. So we have dot box, and we're going to give this a height of 20 pixels and a border of one pixel solid blue. And that's just going to create a bunch of these stacked on top of each other. And this is what we see on our page. This is not the nicest thing ever, but this is a selector lesson. We don't need it to look good. We don't need it to do too much other than select what we currently want it to select. So what we could do is as a, a general descendant selector, we just use a space. And we learned about this in CSS 101. So we could say parent, that's the parent ID, that's going to match this. And then all of the box children in here. And we do this with a space. And so when I save this, go back here, and I refresh, we, we're going to see that nothing changes. And that's expected. But all we're saying is, if there was a box outside of this, let's do this, box, this isn't a blue bordered box. We can see that this box, even if we right click and inspect, has the class of box, but it's not being styled. And so that's a descendant selector. Likewise, we can also do just child selectors. So instead of explicitly, explicitly saying descendant selector, we could say child selector, use the greater than sign. So this is your parent, this is your child selector, and this is your child. And in fact, we can actually see that when we go here in VS Code, it uses the same symboling here. Uh, so we have div.box, that's our class and our element. And then we have that greater than sign that goes to our parent, and that's going to do the exact same thing as a descendant selector. And when I refresh, yeah, you see nothing changes. Now we can do this thing where uh, we select adjacent selectors. So we can now say parent, and then I want to select all of the boxes plus more boxes. And we can say background color is equal to red. And so this one here is our adjacent selector. And it's just going to select elements that are, I guess, adjacent to it. And so it doesn't select that first one, but it selects the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, all the way down. And so that is an adjacent selector. It's not going to select the first one. It's going to select the next ones. And then we have this general sibling selector. So we can select everything in our parent, select our boxes, and then we have this tilde. And so on my keyboard, it's right beside the number one at the top left of my keyboard. It might be different depending on if you have an international keyboard, but a generic English keyboard is right beside the number one, and it's this tilde. It's, well, I guess that's a tilde? I can't actually remember. It's a squiggly line anyways. Uh, and then we can say dot box, and let's change the background color of this. Background color. No, not background attachment, background color to black. And this isn't going to work because I spelled parent. It's supposed to be parent. Save, refresh, and it selects all the similar ones. And the idea here is that in my inspect tool, in our developer tools, it's going to select that first one. And then it says, oh, actually, plus all the other ones down the road. So it's kind of two different ways of doing the same thing. Now, what I would like you to do is go ahead and give this a shot. Uh, one thing you're going to want to be careful of is I am selecting the parent, then the child box to style all of these with a blue element. 
You notice how this box down here is not being selected whatsoever. What I can also do is go ahead and get rid of parent. And when I refresh, you can see that my blue box, or my non-bordered box, now has a blue border, but it doesn't have any of the black background. Or if I comment this out, they're now red. So I'm just going to undo that. But one thing to be careful of is this thing called specificity. So if you're saying select the parent ID and then select the child elements here called box and give it a height of 20 pixels and a border of one pixel solid blue, then your next selector to select these exact same boxes needs to be exactly this specific. Otherwise, watch this. And this is a crash course on specificity and how it can be a nightmare in CSS. So that background is now black, but if I go ahead and get rid of this, it's going to effectively ignore this because this is more specific. Refresh the page, it ignored the black background, and it went with the specific one. So it matches. It's saying select the parent ID, then the box classes, parent ID, box classes. There's no parent ID, it's just saying any box with another box beside it. So go ahead, give this a shot, play around with this. Uh, feel free to experiment with specificity as well. Uh, if you get a little bit lost with specificity, um, honestly, you don't need to know it right now. But if you're a keener and you really want to know about specificity, uh, you can always go and Google that a little bit as well. That could be some additional supplementary homework if you're really feeling like you want to learn CSS at 150%. Pseudo classes are a way to link states. We can control the CSS styling when you hover over an element. We learned about that in CSS 101, and that is a pseudo selector, or pseudo class, I believe it's actually called. But with other pseudo selectors, we can also select uh, elements that should not have a particular class, or we can even select the exact element on a page using the nth child selector. So in the next lesson, we're going to take a look at hover, nth child, and the not selector. Pseudo selectors. Let's talk about not, nth child, and hover. So a couple of lessons ago, we made all of these boxes. Let's go ahead and mostly get rid of this. And when I load up this page, it's just a bunch of blue lines. So it's just a bunch of divs, and we can see all of these divs in here. And so I've got a parent element. It has an ID called parent, so we know it's the parent. And a bunch of boxes. Now a pseudo selector will use the just a regular colon to use this, or to activate the selector. There's a lot of them, um, but in this lesson we're really only going to work on not, nth child, and hover. And it looks like this. Dot box, colon, and then your pseudo class name. So this one is called hover. And we can change this background color to gray if we wanted to. And Let's zoom in here, and when I hover over these, it changes the background color. Now, it doesn't just have to be the background color we can change. We can change the border color, we can change the font size, we can change the font family, we can change literally everything. It works the exact same way, but all we're saying here is select all the classes of box, so all of these in here, and then when you put your mouse over it, when you hover over it, what is it going to do? That is a pseudo selector. Now, we learned about this in CSS 101 real quick. Let's go ahead and use something a little more advanced. So we can now say box. Uh, let's use the not. And actually, you see there's a lot of them in here. We're not going to go through all of these. There are just so many. Uh, and frankly, most of them aren't, aren't typically used. Uh, but they are supported. So let's do box colon not. And then what we do in here is we, we give it another selector. What should it not be selecting? So don't select me. Let's go ahead and copy that and throw that into like, I don't know, the third one. And let's finish this off. Let's do a background color of blue. So these should all now have a blue border, a blue background. When you hover over it, they're all going to turn gray. However, the box not, don't select me, that's this one, is not going to have a blue background color. So let's go ahead and refresh, and you can see it selects this one right in the middle. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that CSS, like most programming languages, works from the top to the bottom. So we said, give it a background color of gray when we hover. But then we said, if the box is not, 
don't select me class, doesn't have this one, then change that background color to blue. And when we go back here, we're going to see that nothing is actually happening except this one. In order to fix this, we just select that and just move it above. Save, refresh, and now it works for us the way we want it to work. Beautiful. Beauty, beauty, beauty. Okay, let's say we wanted to select a particular one. Now, there's going to be a time in the future, at some point when you're working on a website, that you have all of this HTML, and you're not going to be able to edit that HTML. Maybe you're working with a framework like Django, and you need to be able to just work with straight HTML. This is very, very important. This is one of the key skills in CSS, is you need to be able to not touch your HTML and still select what you need to select. So let's go ahead and select like this box here. Let's say select me. And let's change that color to white on all boxes. Color is going to be white so we can read it. There we go. We want this one to be selected and then we don't want any of the other ones to be selected. Now the problem is this one is the same as this one, is the same as this one, is the same as this one, and the bottom three. They're all identical. They all live inside of the parent. There's nothing unique about them. How do we select this? Now we can select this with the nth child selector. And so what we can say is select all of our boxes, then do nth child, and it takes curly braces, not curly braces, but parentheses. And this nth child takes a number. And so which one do we want to select? One, two, three, four, five. So we throw the number five in there. And let's change this background color. Uh, it's already blue, that's not going to do anything. Let's change this background color to yellow. And let's change this color to black, the text color to black. And when we refresh our page, it selects just this one. So we know that there are a set amount of boxes. And we said, oh, we just need to select this one, but we can't touch the HTML. We can say, Skip one, two, three, four, select number five with the nth child selector, and then apply our styling. Now this is really important because this gets into advanced selectors, and this is going to help you out immensely in the future at some point when you're working with a designer, most likely. Uh, so when you're working with your web designer, your web designer is going to say, here's a bunch of stuff. You might be working with a backend dev. Backend dev says, okay, we're gonna make this work in Django and it's gonna have a bunch of checkboxes, for example. But we want the third one, the third item in the checkbox to have a border around it so it really sticks out so people are more likely to click that one. We could do that with nth child. Uh, we can make sure that when you hover over something, things change. We can make sure that you don't select certain elements. You can select all of them except certain ones. Pseudo elements are similar in syntax to pseudo classes or selectors, what we learned in that last lesson. The difference is how it acts. So it looks very similar, but it is slightly different. So in this particular lesson, uh, we're going to be using two colons. So we could select a box, use two colons, and then whatever the selector is called, or not in this lesson, but in the next couple of lessons, uh, we're going to be learning about these pseudo selectors. They're not pseudo selectors. These are actually pseudo elements. Uh, so what we did before was a pseudo class or a pseudo selector of hover. This time we're going to say select the box and then we could do before or dot box colon colon after. And this is going to do different things for us. Now, before and after is what we're going to be learning about first. These are really, really interesting elements uh, because what it does is, and we'll go more in depth about this uh, in the particular lessons, but it's actually going to create elements. It's going to do certain things that HTML should be doing. So CSS is sort of stepping over its, its boundary here and getting into the world of HTML. Now, another difference is these don't really have actions. Whereas like hover is, you know, you're hovering over something. You're actually doing something. It's going to take some sort of uh, hover event. You put your mouse over it and it can change. Whereas like before and after, these aren't really designed to do that, although you, you can absolutely do that. Uh, but these are going to be basically adding HTML elements to your page. So let's go ahead and jump into before and after. Before and after pseudo elements are a lot like inline HTML elements, uh, but we don't have to write any HTML for these. So we can target certain things on our page and we can basically add more HTML 
or at least add fake HTML and then add a bunch of styling to it so we don't actually have to modify our HTML at all. So a good example of this is a box. And if I go back to my browser, this is what the box looks like. It's center of the page that has a black border. It's just a 300 by 300 pixel box. Now, what we can say is select that box and then before we can do all sorts of stuff to it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want some, to add some content. This uses the content property and typically we just add an, an empty space in there and that just tells the browser, hey, look, there's supposed to be an element in here uh, and you know like when you write an empty div, it doesn't show up on your page. Same thing, but we're going to add a space and that makes sure it does show up on the page. Then we can do a display. So we can say display block and then we can give a border of 10 pixels, solid, red and let's see what this looks like so far this is not going to be perfect but it's going to be pretty close and at this point actually as soon as i refresh this page we're going to see yep so we have something in there that's cool and we can actually go into our inspect element here and select it we can do all sorts of stuff with it we can now actually edit this css right in our developer tools let's go ahead and give this a width of 100 percent let's see what this does and at this point, we're just going to experiment. You can see that it gives it a width of 100%. And it's bulging out because of the borders. The black borders, that is. Let's say we want to give it a height. 100%. Let's see if this is honored as well. Okay. Not bad, not bad. Uh, let's say we wanted to move this. So let's get into some positioning. Let's do position relative on the entire box itself. Uh, but then in the before pseudo element, this fake element that doesn't actually exist on the page, there's no HTML here, we can't edit the HTML. We can say let's move this. So let's move this to the top right. And so we can say position absolute. And we know that this is going to work because its parent selector is using position relative, its parent element is using position relative. We do position absolute. Let's do top minus 10 pixels and let's do left minus 10 pixels. And we're going to see this sort of bumps up here. Oh, actually, that's because we have borders in there. <laughs> yep, 10 pixels, solid red border. So we just overlapped it. Let's go ahead and do 30 instead. There we go. Now you can actually see that this before is on top of this black border. And a better example of this is if I do background color is equal to black on the box, not the pseudo element before. We can see that the red is outlined on top of it. Now, if we wanted to change that, we absolutely could. We could do, and this is part of positioning, we could say Z index minus one. And that layers it behind. Now, likewise, we can do the same thing, but with after so every element can have a before and after we can do box colon colon after and we're going to select this box but we're going to create an after element instead of a before element let's go ahead and copy most of this stuff it's going to be very very similar we could actually group these selectors together if we wanted to uh, let's change this from solid red to solid blue and instead of top let's do bottom and right, and let's see how this turns out for us. It's not going to be exactly what you expect, but it's going to it's going to show something, and we can adjust from there. Okay, cool, cool. So we have these on top, uh, these before and after elements, and they're behind. Let's go ahead and get rid of that Z index, or we can make it a positive Z index of like one or let's say ten. And that just layers it on top. So now we have this nice little layering. What happens if we get rid of bottom and right? Okay. So right after the element, it's, it's going to be right inside. You can actually see that there's this border here, this black border, that 10 pixel border. It's right on the inside. What if we said top and left are the same? as the before, it moves it exactly where we expect it to go. So now as one more example, let's go ahead and get rid of this top left. Let's go get rid of this top left. 
and these are going to be the exact same. We can't actually see these anymore, but we can select them. So we have a before, and we can say before is going to be top minus 30 pixels, and left, and I'll just move that up in the video here, minus 30 pixels. Okay, and we can select the after, and we can do the same thing, but different. Bottom, minus 30 pixels, right, minus 30 pixels. And that just gives us this nice little layering effect. Now let's look at a real world example. This is really, really cool, but this is not really a real world example. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an HR in here, just a horizontal rule, and I'm going to create a new link. So an A element, it's not going to go anywhere, and give this a border. Let's go ahead and put some lorem in here as well, and throw this right in the center. And so that undid my stuff up there, that's totally okay. And when I zoom in here, I'm going to zoom in real, real good here. I'm going to zoom in at 200%. Let's say we want to give this a border. Let's get rid of this default styling and let's give this a proper border. And when you hover over it, it's, the border gets bigger. So what we can do is we can select our A element, say text decoration, none. Let's do just nothing in there. Let's change the color to black. And let's see what this looks like. Okay, cool. It fits in. You see it's a link. It fits in. We can't tell it's a link until we hover over it. What we can do now is we can say, hey, A element, before, let's do content with a space, width is equal to 100%. Height is equal to, let's say, 4 pixels. This gives us a background color. And I'll just move that up into the center of the video. The background color is going to be blue, and let's see what this looks like. Nothing yet. Why is that? Well, we need to give this a position. So let's do, on our main element here, position relative, and then on the before, let's do position absolute, bottom zero, left zero, has a width of 100%, so this should now show up for us. There we go. So that doesn't actually look very good at all. And that's not really the point here. The point is to show you that we can give this a border. Now this is no different than border bottom, what did we say here? Four pixels, solid blue. But now on hover, we can start to match, uh, mix and match these. We can say a hover before, and let's change that height to 14 pixels. Give that a refresh. And look at that. Now it covers the text. You can't actually see the text in there anymore. And instead what we can do is say, always be below the text, be underneath it. Like we're, like we're layering a piece of paper on top of another piece of paper. So we can say index is going to be minus one. By default, all Z indexes or Z indexes are at zero. We're gonna say, throw this just behind this text. And now, bam. Well, we still can't really see that. So let's change that from blue to yellow. There we go. That's looking a little better. That's still very hard to see in the video. Let's do red. That's a lot better. And so now we have this pseudo element using a hover state, and we're actually modifying this element itself. So if we go in here and expand our A, we can see that there's a before. And another cool thing we can do is we can click that dot 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 that ellipsis, and we can do for state hover. And that hovers this state for us as if we put our mouse over it permanently and then we can click this before and we can see what's going on in here including the a selector using a hover pseudo class using a before pseudo element now what i would like you to do is give this a shot this is very very important because this is part of advanced css we are getting into the meaty parts of css so give this a shot try creating a link try creating boxes with before and after elements with a pseudo element selector, we can target the first letter of an element. We can also target the first line of an element. So let's go ahead and create a paragraph in here with a bunch of lorem. And we're going to put a lot of lorem in here. And it's all going to be in a single paragraph. And I'm going to put it on multiple lines just to keep my code clean, but it's going to look like one paragraph on the page. So if we go here, okay. 
too small. Let's zoom in. And let's say this is like, we, we're writing a, a website or we're coding a website for a newspaper or some sort of magazine. And we want that first letter to be huge. We can target that. We can say in our styling here, target the P element. And we can do first letter. And then we can do font size of, uh, let's do something big. Let's do like 50 pixels. And this is going to make this L, just the very first L, not the other ones, just this very first one really big. Let's go ahead. Okay, looks all right, it's bigger. But we want the text to sort of wrap around it. And we know we can do wrap around things with float. Float left. And this is very, very important uh, to know. Uh, but it's also something we learned in CSS 101. So if you're not familiar with float, you might want to get familiar with float. It's very useful in certain cases like this. And so uh, that L is still a little too big. But what we can do is we can select this P, go down to the bottom. Uh, nope, it's not in there because it's not an element. Uh, da, 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 pseudo, there we go, first letter element. Let's go ahead and change that font size. And I'll just adjust this to, uh, I don't know. Let's just keep making this smaller till it looks, you know, half decent. Yeah, something like that. And then we can also add a margin of like 50 pixels if we wanted it to really stick out. We can add a margin of five pixels to make it a little more smooth looking. And I'll just move this up. And this is the first letter selector. So let's go ahead and add that margin in there as well. Margin, five pixels. Now we can also select the first line and it's not going to be necessarily this line of code. It's going to be this line. And that's going to depend on your browser. So we're getting into something a little more responsive here. And so let's go ahead and say P. First line and let's do font weight of bold. And let's save, refresh, and now it's bold. Now, the nice thing about this is it's always going to be that first line. You can see it's just the first four letters here. That's really hard to see. I apologize about that. But if I do this, it's always that first line, no matter how much text there is. It's always that first line. So that is your first letter and your first line pseudo element selectors or pseudo selector. And honestly, you're not going to use this too often, but it is good to know that it is possible to do. So I'm not going to give you homework for this one. Uh, but just tuck this in your back pocket, save it for later. Know that this is completely possible in case you're ever working with a client who has an article style website like a magazine or a newspaper. Using selection, we can tell our browser what text should look like when the user selects it. So like when you hover over and then you click and drag, like you can see that changes mine in VS Code a little bit, we can change that in the browser as well. So let's open this up in Chrome. Opening in Chrome, and we have lorem ipsum. Nothing major here. And when we select, it's just the default browser. So, you know, honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you wanted to make it a little more interesting, especially if you have an article website like Medium, where I believe if you hover over, it changes the background color to green and the color to white. So let's actually go and do that exact example. So what we can do here is we can say, and this doesn't even need a particular element. We can just say anytime you do any sort of selection, change that background color to green and change the color to white. And now when I save, we're going to see this is what it was before. Refresh. This is what it is now. And that is selection. I personally like that. I like that when I'm on a page and I want to copy some text that I know exactly where I'm, I'm selecting this. It tells me that the front end developer who made this website actually put the thought and time and effort into doing this. Let's take a look at transitions. Transitions let us smoothly make adjustments. So like, you know, when you hover over an element and you move it up like 10 pixels, well, currently it looks a little janky. It's very abrupt. And instead with a transition, we can make it be smooth. So it smoothly moves up and we can tell it to listen for a certain type of change, such as like a width or a margin or position, any sort of thing. We can really transition a lot of things here. Uh, but in this example, we should transition a link. So let's make a link into a button. So let's do a button and there's going to be nothing in it. And this is going to say, click me. And so let's target this link. 
and let's give it a background color of FFF, so it's going to be white. It's already going to look white, but let's give it white anyways, and we can transition that later. We can say display is inline block, and we can say padding on the top and bottom is going to be 5 pixels, and on the right and left is going to be 15 pixels. Let's also give this a color, an explicit color. This is going to help with our transitions. So color is not actually going to be white, it's going to be black, 0, 0, 0. And let's just see what this looks like. Okay, no, not quite. Text, decoration, none. And let's give it a border. Border is one pixel, solid, black. And let's go ahead and make this bigger. Zoom, 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 zoom in. I'm at 500%. So this is the button. And when you hover over it, nothing happens. Let's add a hover. We can say A, hover. And so when we hover over this, let's change like the background color to be black. Or we could do a hex color, 0, 0, 0. And let's change the color to be white, or FFF. -F. Let's go ahead and save that. And OK, so we have a hover state. It's a little janky. Not really great for epileptics, to be honest. But we can make this a lot smoother by saying transition. And what do we want to transition here? We could transition everything, and we could say take 0 0.2 seconds to do it. So we say transition all as the first parameter. That's what we want it to transition. Second parameter is how long it should take. And when we refresh the page, you can see it fades in and fades out now. That's a lot better. Now we could actually make this significantly more accurate. And honestly, this is not super performant because your browser is now looking for every single change. It's going to look for like display, padding, color, text, decoration, border, uh, and background color on the hover state. Maybe we don't want that. Maybe we only ever wanted to change the background color. We could say change that background color. Instead of all, we change it to background color. Matches this exact property name up here. And it's going to take 0 0.2 seconds. Now this is going to change that background color. Uh, it's going to fade. And we can, that's actually kind of hard to see. So let's do like 2.2 seconds. And you can see this background color when I refresh the page up here. This background color is going to take a little while to fade in. But that color is going to be instant. See that? Looks kind of cool, I guess, if you like that kind of effect. We could also say, comma, and I like to put this on another line, color, let's, ch let's change that transition length to something really long. Let's say like five seconds. And when I go up here, hit refresh, come on down, fading in and out. So nice and slow. Now, typically your transitions are not that slow. Typically your transitions are like 0.2 seconds, and this one could be. 0.5 seconds. Let's go ahead and refresh. Something like that. And so that just makes it a little nicer. Now we can also change things like padding. But watch this. When I say hover, padding, let's change that padding from 5 pixels and 15 pixels. Let's change that to double. So top and bottom are going to be 10 pixels. Left and right are going to be 30 pixels. This is going to look a little janky. See that? We don't really want that. We want it to be nice and smooth. So what we can say here is comma, 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 chameleon, uh, padding, and we could say 0 0.4 seconds. Or because it's so much bigger, we could actually make this like one second. Like that. Now that's, again, not the nicest example ever, but it is a good example. And this is really good for like when you have a site, like let's go to rocketman.learnwagtail.com. And you can kind of see that this hover has a little bit of an effect there. Or if you were to hover over this, this is called a card. You could change the background color. You can make it fade in, fade out. You could make this move. You could do all sorts of stuff with a transition. So it doesn't look so janky. So that is a transition. What I would like you to do for this lesson is to create a link, make it a button, just like what I did, and then change the background color when you hover. You don't need to do all the other ones, but just change the background color when you hover and make sure you add that transition to your main element, not your pseudo selector, not your pseudo class, your main element. Okay, let's talk about gradients. There are two primary types of gradients. There's linear and radial. A linear gradient goes from side to side and a radial gradient 
uh, sort of emerges from the center. Now, we're, we're only going to work with linear because it looks a lot better. And honestly, I don't think I've ever seen a case where a radial gradient actually looks good. Uh, but if you wanted to, if you wanted to learn a little bit beyond what I'm going to teach you in the scope of this course, you can look up radial gradients. We're probably going to see an example of it anyways. Uh, but we're going to be working with linear gradients just because, you know, for the most part, they look better, at least at least during this decade in web design, it looks good. Maybe maybe old styles will come back and it'll look good to have radial sort of gradients, but linear is where it's at these days. So let's go ahead and add a box. Let's do box. And in this box, we're going to have some sort of gradient. So let's not call it box. Let's call it gradient. And in our CSS, we can do dot gradient, select that element. And we could say the background, back ground image is going to be a linear gradient and this is going to take a direction so a direction color one color two and so this actually isn't going to do anything uh, but i'm going to leave this here just for a second just leave that on the screen and let's do a height of 500 pixels and we don't need to set a width because it's a block element but you know for good measures let's do width 100 percent and so this linear gradient here, what is that direction going to be? Let's say the direction is going to be to right. So it's going to go from left to right. It's going to start off with a color of black, and then it's going to go into yellow. And so let's go ahead and load up this page in Google Chrome. And now we have this nice little gradient. Now what's cool about this is this is going from left to right, but we don't need to tell it left to right. We can give it an angle. We can say, something like 45 DEG for degrees. And that changes it. That changes it from black in this corner to yellow in this corner. Instead of left to right, it's from corner to corner. Now I'm going to be honest here, most people actually don't memorize this. This is a real keener thing. Um, pe people don't use gradients enough to always be memorable, and it's also sort of hard to figure out exactly what kind of angle you want. Uh, so usually we use some sort of CSS uh, gradient tool. And so what I'm going to do is just hop on over to Google and I'm going to type in CSS gradient generator. And so there's CSS gradient.io, colorzilla. This is a popular one. This one has been popular for a number of years now. Uh, but I'm going to just select that first one because I have in other courses given this one enough attention. Uh, let's go with CSS gradient.io. And so the idea here is you have a gradient and we can do Ah, oh, we can do radial here. So let's go ahead, grab this. And I just dragged that down and that got rid of it. And so let's do radial. And this is what radial looks like. It starts from the inside and goes to the outside. So there is a case where it looks okay. In this case, it looks all right. Now, what we were doing was over here, this color was black. And then this color over here, we just select that one is white and so that's radial that's linear we can change the angle and stuff by going down here changing this angle like that there's no angle when it comes to radial though and now the nice thing about this is typically these will give you exactly the css you're looking for and so this is actually really nice this is telling us this is a radial gradient it's a circle uh, linear is going to be zero degrees. Let's go ahead and change that to like 68 degrees. RGB, zero, 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 that's black. RGBA, that has the alpha in here, that's a one, so it's completely visible. And zero percent, and then again, RGBA, 255, uh, 255, 255, 255, that's white. 100% uh, transparency, or maybe that's the wrong wording. Either way, you can completely see it, uh, and it's going to go to 100%. So it starts at zero and goes to 100. And we can change that. That's what that 0 and 100% means. Let's, you can see that that number is changing there. And what this looks like is we can make this nice and tight if we wanted to. Something like that. And then you could have text on the left. You could have an image on the right if you wanted to, if you wanted to make this one see-through. Just like that. You can have an image, a background image, just like that. So most of us don't actually remember all of this uh, just because we use it so infrequently. Uh, they are nice to have, 
but usually we just use some sort of tool that's going to help us. Now, what's really nice is we can do this, go in here, click right in the middle, and let's make this green. And we can do all sorts of stuff with this. And we don't have to figure it out through code. There are tools that help us do that. I would suggest using a tool for something like this. What I would like you to do is go ahead and Google CSS Gradient Generator. Use this tool, use another tool, it doesn't really matter. They all sort of do the same thing. And just experiment, and then look at the code that it gives you, copy that code, and then put it into your page. You can change the entire gradient uh, background of like your body element. Don't forget to give it a height of 100% if you select the body element. or a class or a, a div element like what I did, and I selected the gradient and then I just applied it to there. So just go ahead and give that a shot. It's really, really fun. It adds a nice little spice to your website as well. Tagging along from that last lesson, we can create a background image so it appears darker without actually having to do very much work. Now there are a couple different ways to achieve this. One is using a filter, which we haven't learned yet, or another is using a gradient to layer on top. And in this lesson, we're going to use the gradient on top, uh, just because sometimes you want a gradient on top. And you're going to see this all over the place. Once you see this, you can see it like all over Facebook, you can see it all over Twitter. There's gradients everywhere, and they're nice and elegant as well. So first things first, let's go ahead and select the body element. And I'm going to give this, no, not just body, I'm going to select the body and the HTML elements. I'm going to give this a height of 100%. And let's get rid of the margin and the padding. And then I want to select just the body element. And in here what I can do is I can say the background image is going to be a linear gradient. Uh, let's give us like 180 degrees. And let's say this is going to go from black to black but different, uh, different opacity. So RGBA 0, 0, 0. And then the alpha is going to be 0. And that's going to start at 0%. And then it's going to go to RGBA, 0, 0, 0. That's black again. And that's going to go to, um, well, we could say 0. So that's actually not going to do anything. That's not going to gradient at all. But we can say 0 0.6 to begin with, 60% see-through black. And then 2. And this is just so hard to read. Let's go ahead and put this on new lines, something like this. There we go. And this is actually sort of getting into programming because that's what these parentheses means. It means this is a function. We'll talk about that in JavaScript. Uh, once, once we're done with CSS, we'll learn more about that in JavaScript. Um, but what we're saying here is we've got a linear gradient, 180 degrees. Start with black. It's 60% see-through. Uh, go to 80% and it's going to end at 100% down the road. So let's just see what this looks like in Google Chrome. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice little gradient. Uh, let's go ahead and actually make this a little more. Yeah, there we go. So it's lighter on the top, darker on the bottom. Now, if we wanted to add an image to this, we absolutely could. But first, we need an image. So let's go to unsplash.com and let's take a look at this image. Rocket, this one. And I'm going to right click and copy image address. And I'm going to hot link straight to this. Uh, to that image. And what we can do here is comma. And let's, let's maybe actually put this back on its original line there. And I like making these line up so it looks nice. And then we could say URL, like a regular background image. Paste that URL in there. Semicolon. And let's go ahead and take a look at this. That looks pretty good. Now let's go ahead and delete this linear gradient. Let's just cut that out for a sec. This is what the image looks like normally with that linear gradient on top of it. This is what it looks like now. Now the nice thing about this is we can add some text. Uh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and add colors is going to be white. Font size is going to be something huge like 90 pixels. And text align is going to be center. And so in our body, we can now say, this is a rocket. Save. This is a rocket. And so this text is a little more visible versus 
this. If I go ahead and just delete that. You know, it's it's not bad. We can still see it. Let's let's even do this. Let's do padding top 200 pixels. No, let's go further. Let's go 500 pixels. So we can't even see all of that now. That's just the nature of this image. We can't necessarily change the image all the time, but what we can do is we can throw that linear gradient back in here. And now we can read it perfectly fine. Now, a case in point is if you took the CSS 101 class, uh, if you go to rocketman.learnwagtail.com, that's exactly what's going on here. It's even the exact same image. Now, I would like you to give that a shot. Don't forget, you have access to this file. Uh, also, you can ask questions in the Learning to Code Facebook group if you ever have questions or you're curious about something or you just want to get feedback. We can load custom web fonts into our site. So the way fonts work is it will try to access the font on your computer. And we, we've seen this sort of before in CSS 101 where it's like font family and then it has like the first font and then like some sort of fallback that most people have like Arial. And then it's going to say something like a serif font, a serif font. And so it's going to try this one. If it doesn't exist, it's going to try this one. And if it doesn't exist, it's going to, it's going to let your computer choose. But let's say this one doesn't exist. How do we make it exist? Now, a nice thing we can do is basically import it from somewhere else. So we can go to fonts.google.com and let's go ahead and just grab a cool looking font that we can find something that really sticks out. That's going to be a little bit different. <laughs> None of these are pretty wild. Ah. There's that one. Uh, no. Let's do this one. Pacifico. And so I just click that, select this style, and I can add different font variations if I wanted to. I'm not going to. I'm just going to click embed up here. And we can import either through directly through our CSS, which is pretty cool, or through our HTML. I'm going to do the HTML way. So take all of that copy. I apologize that's small to see, but if you follow along, it'll be easier on your computer to see it. And then above our style, just paste that in there. Now, we don't know what this name is yet. We think it's Pacifico, but it could be lowercase, uppercase, could have a different name. We, we never know. So what we do is go back here and it says CSS rules to apply font families, font family, Pacifico, or cursive. Let's go ahead and change that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment that out and we're going to see some lorem ipsum in here. Lorem ipsum. And let's go ahead and change that font size again to something bigger, something like 45 pixels. And this is what we see. This is our standard font. If I uncomment Pacifico, it changes it. Now, here's the thing is if I don't add this line in here, if I just cut that out of my code, it goes to cursive. This is what my computer uses when it's told to use cursive. Uh, so it's saying, hey, Caleb's computer, use Pacifico. But if it doesn't have Pacifico, use cursive. Well, Pacifico doesn't exist. And so we said, make it exist. This HTML element is going to say, hey, go in here, download this file called Pacifico. In that file, we know it's called Pacifico. So we can now have access to it and use it. Boom, just like that. What I would like you to do is give this a shot. Go to fonts.google.com. Pick a font that's free. They do have some on here that are paid. Do not pay for a font at this point, please. Just find a free font like Roboto. Roboto is a good one. Uh, you can choose all different styles if you want. These are different font weights as well. Uh, so we could say like select like that, select like that, select like that, select like that. And we can use these different font families in here. Go ahead, give that a shot. Try using a custom font. Okay, let's talk about transformations. A transformation is a way that we can rotate, skew, scale, or move an element away from its natural spot. Now, in this example, I just have a regular box on my page. And when I just open this up, it's a regular box. In fact, let's, let's add a margin to this. Let's do margin 50 pixels and auto, and that's going to center align that for me. Now, Let's go ahead and go through some of these transformations. Now, transformations aren't hard. We can mix and match them if we wanted to, but let's just go one at a time. So let's first start with translate. This one is interesting. Translate, I think, 
personally, is not the, the proper name. Uh, the property is called transform, transform, and the key or, uh, you know, the full declaration is going to be transform translate, and then it takes parentheses. And we can move this on the x-axis and y-axis. So we can say move this on the x-axis, 100 pixels, comma, on the y-axis, 100 pixels. And when we go back to our page, refresh, we can see it actually moved. So that's what translate does. It just moves it. It translates where it naturally sits on the page. We've done this with position relative, position absolute, position fixed, position sticky. We've done all sorts of movements like that. We can also use margin uh, on the top and the left to sort of push the element around, but translate is another way to do this, which is really, really nice. Let's take a look at the next one. So I'm going to comment this out, and I'm going to comment this using proper CSS. We could also do rotate. Let's see what rotate does. So we want to do transform, transform, rotate. Let's do 45 degrees, DEF for degrees. And that just rotates it for us. And we can do any sort of degrees we want. We could do like rotate it 68 degrees or 91 degrees, which is sort of the same as like rotating it one degree or 10 degrees. You know, we can rotate this as much as we want. Uh, if you do rotate it perfectly 90, it's going to look like nothing happened just because this is a square. So that's 90 degrees. Okay, let's take a look at animations. Animations let us move things in a smooth and controlled way. It's a lot like a transition, but we don't necessarily need some sort of event to trigger it. Like, you know when you hover over a link and that transition sort of changes? Well, that's because you hovered your mouse over it. But what if we just wanted something to move on the page without some sort of trigger? We can do that with an animation. And the nice thing about that is we can tell the animation to start right away, we can give it some sort of delay, we can do all sorts of stuff with animations. For example, we could make things wiggle, we can make things rotate, we can make things jump out or bounce if we wanted to, or really anything that we can do with CSS, we can animate. So what I'm going to do here is I have a box, um, and let's go ahead and just show this box, and let's do border radius. 50% and this is going to be a box, but it's also going to be a circle. It's going to display as a circle. So here we go. I've got this circle. Nothing fancy. It's completely static. So first things first, when we're creating an animation, we need to give it an animation name. So let's go ahead and create a new animation. We use the at symbol, keyframes, and then a name. So I'm going to call this slide me. And it's going to take a from and it's going to take a to. Now I want to make sure that this is movable. So let's say this position of this element is going to be absolute, absolute. It's going to be at the top of my page and the top left of my page. And when I refresh the page, it just hugs that top, that top wall here and that left wall there. So what I can now say is from top is equal to zero. And let's say left is equal to zero. And where I want it to go is left is 100%. So let's just move it left all the way across the page. And when I refresh this page, nothing's going to happen because we created an animation, but we didn't set the animation to be applicable to our element. So what we do in our element is we say animation name is equal to slide me. And this is case sensitive. So I've got a capital M in there. Make sure you have a capital M in yours if you're using a capital M. So it has to be the exact same. When we save this and refresh, we actually saw that it doesn't work. Let's go ahead and give this an animation duration. It doesn't know how long to, to slide for. Let's say it's going to slide for four seconds. Now let's go back. And as soon as we give it a duration, it's going to move all the way across the page and then off of it. And then it starts over. Now, if we wanted it to do this forever, we could say animation iteration count. Iteration count. Nailed it. And we would say infinity. Infinite. And it's going to go to the end and start again. And start again. Just like that. Now if we wanted it to move to the left and then come back, we could give it an animation direction. Animation direction. And we could say alternate. 
And so, hold on, I'll refresh this, and it'll go to the left, and then it's going to slide, or it went all the way left, and then it's going to slide back left, and it's going to move back right, and then slide left. Now that is a simple animation. We can make these significantly more complicated if we wanted to. We could, let's just comment this out entirely, and let's create a new animation. So I commented that out, and it's like it doesn't even exist. So we can do keyframes, slide me, so this is going to be the exact same name as this one here. Just happens to be that this one's commented out. And then we could say something like at 0% do something, then at 50% do something else, and then at 100%, nope, not there, then at 100% do something else. So at 0%, what do we want this to do? We want this to be at the top 0, left 0. At 50%, let's change the background color to blue, and let's actually set the background color to black by default. Background color is equal to black. And then at 100%, let's change that background color again. Background color is equal to yellow. And let's go ahead and see what this looks like. Oh, actually, we need 100% to be uh, left 100%. And so what this is going to do is say at 0%, this is where the CSS should be applied. This kind of CSS should be applied at 0%. At 50% of whatever that animation is, that animation duration is four seconds. So at 50% or two seconds, change that background color to blue. It should be completely blue at that point, And it's going to try to be nice and smooth. And then at 100%, at four seconds, that background color is going to be fully yellow and the position is going to be left 100%. Let's go ahead and give this a shot and let's see what this looks like. Just like that. And then goes from yellow to blue to black. Now, what I would like you to do is I want you to create an animation that does something like this. However, I want you to make a... Uh, a box or a circle or something. You can even animate an image if you wanted to, just like a little div with an image in it. I want you to make yours go from the top left to the top right to the bottom right to the bottom left and then back up to the top left. So I want yours to go all the way around the frame of your page. Don't forget you're going to need to use position absolute for this. Position absolute. You're going to want to set the initial state on your element before you get into the keyframes. So this says top is zero, left is zero. Even though I'm redeclaring it here, that is A-OK. -okay. It's nice and explicit. And then you want to give it an animation name that needs to match your keyframes name down here. Give it a duration, otherwise it's not going to work. And then for your task for this, you're going to be using four percentages. So zero, 25%. 50% and 70% or 75% rather uh, and then maybe possibly 100% I'm going to leave that up to you see how that works out for you go ahead give that a shot if you get stuck don't forget you can ask questions in the learning to code Facebook group we're here to help okay let's talk about table layouts or not table layouts but page layouts so up until this point you've probably been using display inline block you've probably been using tables or floating to move your elements across your page but there is a better way there's two better ways to do this actually and the first one is flexbox so i'm going to teach you flexbox it's important that you get familiar with flexbox i'm going to teach you the the basis of flexbox uh, and then i want you to go and maybe explore flexbox a little bit further now the thing with flex and what we're going to be learning after grid is these are very big css modules and you do not need to know all of it you, like you don't need to memorize all of it honestly you need to remember sort of like how certain things work um, but then you just need to be able to google your answers later because honestly i've been writing css for a long time and i still don't remember every single way to apply flexbox off the top of my head um, and that's just the nature of the beast there's a lot to learn in css and there's no possible way you can learn all of it and remember all of it. You just need to be able to remember how to get your answers. And again, that's about 50% of web development these days is knowing how to find your answers. So let's talk about Flexbox. Flexbox is a layout module that makes it easier to design flexible, responsive layout structures without using float or positions or tables and things like that. So let's go ahead and create a div and I'm going to call this the, no, I'm going to call this a container. And in here, let's say I have two elements and I want them side by side. So I've got a div here, 
going to call this left, and I've got a div here, I'm going to call this right. And when I boot this up in my page, and this is just from the last lesson there, it says left and right. Now, what if we want them actually to be left and right? Well, we can float them, we can position them, we can do all sorts of things, but there's a better way, and that's Flexbox. So the nice thing about this is it's quite simple to get started, and it can get really, really hairy down the line because there's a lot to learn, uh, but to get started is really easy. So let's go ahead and select our container, and we're going to say display, this is a new display type, is flex. Let's save that, refresh our page, and now it's left and right. Now let's go ahead and select those containers, container elements, or container items, and let's give this a border, one pixel, solid red. Cool, okay, so we have something that sits side by side. Let's go ahead and make each of these items be, uh, let's say, 50%. So we say flex basis, and we want this to be 50%. Now this is flexible, so we don't use the word width because width is implying a hard-coded value. This flex basis is going to say start at 50%, but you know what? If the right column takes up more space than the left column, the left column is allowed to shrink. Or vice versa, the right column is allowed to shrink, or the right column is allowed to grow. So what we can do here is we can say class is equal to right, and then we can say, you know, if there's, uh, let's get fancy with our selectors here, container div dot right, we can say that this flex basis needs to be 75%. Let's go ahead and refresh our page, and we see that it now takes up 75%, and that left was actually shrunken down a little bit. And we can do a really drastic example here of saying like 95%. And it's shrinking as much as it possibly can here. Now we can say that, hey, by the way, these are not allowed to shrink, these are not allowed to grow either. So we can say flex shrink is equal to zero, and flex grow is also zero. And what this is going to say is this flex basis, this left column, will always be at least 50%. Now what you don't see is I can scroll over here is that right is 90% of the viewport width. It just happens to be going onto uh, the part of the page that we can't see by default. Now I'm going to get rid of that right in there uh, just because I think that's going to make this a little too complicated, but that was a fun little example. And now we can't scroll left and right and we have 50% here and 50% there. Now, what happens if we wanted to add another container we could, or another item? We could say this one should be center. So we've got left, center, and then way over here we have right. And again, this is taking up 50% of my viewport, 50% of my viewport, and then right is taking up 50% of my viewport for a total width of 150%. And this can get really, really frustrating. There's a way around this. On our container, we can say flex wrap wrap the page. So what this is going to do is say, this is 50%, this is 50%, but if anything goes over 100%, just bump it down onto a new line. And these actually do go onto their own lines because this is 50% plus one pixel on either side. Let's go ahead and change everything on our page to box sizing border box so that our boxes also include the width of the border and boom. We're working with layouts now. Now we can just keep adding elements too. We can just keep adding them and they'll just keep stacking the way we want them to stack, just like this. Now we can change at flex basis. Let's change at flex basis to something like 20%. And now we have 10 cells, all sort of side by side, nice and tight together, and they are flexible. Meaning we no longer need to use tables. We no longer need to use floating or position absolute with relative and things like that. We can use Flexbox to put things side by side. Now, this is not the greatest example. A better example is going to be if we do this. Let's create in our container div, and this is going to be called navigation. So let's give this a class of navigation. And we're going to create another one called content. Content in here. And so what I can say is, let's keep the box sizing, let's keep our container to be display flex and flex wrap, so it wraps onto a new line if we want it to. Let's go ahead and get rid of this, this stuff in here, except the border, and we're going to effectively restart. Okay, 
So we don't have a flex basis or a flex box. Width is a way you can think of it. We need to set that width now. Now, we don't want to necessarily set the flex basis on both of these. This is selecting the container and both divs. We want to select it on the navigation and content. So let's go ahead and type navigation. Let's give this a flex basis of 20%. And is it allowed to grow? Flex grow. N nope. Is it allowed to shrink though? Flex shrink. Yeah, we're going to say it's allowed to shrink if it needs to. Okay, so that's 20% of my viewport width. That's this entire white section that we're looking at here. And for content, let's do dot content flex basis is equal to 80%, the remainder of 100% minus 20%. And let's do the same thing here where we say flex grow and shrink. But the content is more important. So is it allowed to grow? Yeah. Is it allowed to shrink? Let's say no. Now we have some content in there. And we can get rid of all that in there. And we can do all sorts of stuff. We can say h1, hello world, paragraph with a lorem. Uh, we could do another h2, another heading, hello world again. We could do another paragraph with some lorem in there. And boom, we have navigation. We have content. We have a page layout. We can even, if we wanted to, put a header in here. We can do dot header. And let's go ahead and style our dot header. Let's say dot header. Flex basis is 100%. Can it grow? No, we don't want it to be more than 100%. Can it shrink? Flex shrink. No, it needs to be 100% all the time. Let's say the header needs to have a background color of FFF. Nope. Let's do CCC. Let's say the color needs to be 555. Border bottom, two pixels, solid black. Okay, that almost worked. We just need some actual content in there. So header. Look at that. Okay, that looks kind of terrible. I mean, <laughs> I can't live with that in good consciousness. Uh, so let's do background colors equal to F5, F5, F5. Color is going to be black. Padding is going to be 20 pixels. There we go. And if we go ahead and get rid of that border, and because it's the only thing in there, we can get rid of all of it, but let's just comment that out so you can access this code later if you wanted to. We have some sort of table layout, or not a table layout, but in CSS 101, we did this with a table. In CSS 201, please don't use tables anymore. We don't need tables for layouts. We can now use flex. And this is the way you should be creating page layouts in the future. Flex or grid. We'll talk about grid in the next lesson. Now, what I would like you to do is spend probably 20 minutes, maybe even more. Uh, you're going to want to set display flex on a parent element. So we have our parent element. All the child elements will be flex items. That's what they're called, flex items. So we've got navigation, content, and header item. And then I want you to set the flex basis of them. See if you can get flex wrap to work, flex grow and shrink. Mess around with that. See, see if you can get that to work for you or not work for you and get a feel for how it's supposed to work. And I want you to, before moving on to grid, create something that looks a little bit like this. Now, it doesn't need to look beautiful. We're focusing on the layout here, where we have a left column here. We have a right column here, and we have a row on the top called header. Go ahead and give that a shot. Remember, if you get stuck, ask questions down below. Ask questions in the Learning to Code Facebook group. There are a lot of us who know a lot about Flexbox. We can help you at a moment's glance. Grid is an even better way to create a page layout. It's more advanced than Flexbox, and it's specifically designed to be good at making page layouts. So while Flexbox has its purpose, like being able to vertically align things, which is nice, we didn't cover that. Uh, that's something you might want to go and Google on your own time, though, as a little extra homework. Uh, grid is not designed to do that. Grid is literally for a template layout. So when it comes to grid, there are a few things we need to know. There are columns, rows, and gutters. And these gutters, we call them gaps. Uh, in frameworks like Bootstrap, you're going to see them called gutter. We don't call them gutters technically. In CSS, they're called gaps. 
Uh, so we've got columns, rows, and gaps between the columns and rows. And like an HTML table, we can make each cell span one or more columns or rows. So let's dive into this. So let's go ahead and create our first grid. Let's create an ID in here. And I got to change that from Django template back to HTML. Let's go ahead and create a container element called grid. And it has an ID of grid. And let's give this an item. And let's just call this one. And, and I just made nine items in here. Now, if we refresh our page, we're going to see one through nine on their own lines. This is completely expected because currently these, this is not using a grid. This is using basic default display block. And these are all divs. So what we can do here is we can select our grid. We can say grid display and a new display type here. We can say grid. And this is just going to turn it into a grid. So if we take a look now, nothing happens. We need to say this has a grid template, grid template columns. And how many columns do we want? Well, we have nine sections. So let's do three by three. So let's do auto, auto, auto. So these are columns. This is going to be column one, two, and three. Let's go ahead and see what this does. Okay, we're getting somewhere. They're all side by side. That's really nice. Let's go ahead and select every item in here. Let's do item and let's give this a border one pixel solid red. And this just allows us to see what we're working with here. Now, let's say we want to create some sort of gaps between these. We can do this with a grid column gap or grid row gap. A grid column gap is going to look like this. So grid column gap. And that's going to be, let's say, 20 pixels. And so it creates a little gap between our columns. Or we could do grid row gap. And that creates spacing between our rows. And we can actually have both at the same time. So column gap and row gap of 20 pixels. And now we have a nice looking grid here. But this is not that great for page templates. Page templates usually have some sort of header, some sort of navigation, some sort of footer. So let's go ahead and create that. Let's create uh, item one. Let's make it span through one, two, and three. And then we'll get rid of two and three. And this is a lot like working with a table, but it's using CSS. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy all those. Copy, paste, and just give these item names in here. So these are all going to share the styling of one, one pixel solid red border. But let's select item one, item one. And we can say the grid column is going to start at item number one and is going to end grid column end at item number three. And so what we're saying here is start at column one right over here two, three, and it's going to take over all of this. And I actually did that wrong. Uh, it should be it starts at one here, two there, three there, and then four there. Let's change that to four. And item one is now going to be a header. And it displaced, it dislodged number two and three. So if we wanted to, we could get rid of those if we wanted to. We don't need to. Uh, let's go ahead and actually get rid of two and three. So item two and three. There we go. Now let's merge six and nine together. And we can do that with grid row start and grid row end. And we want to work with item six here. So let's do item six, grid row start. Where is this going to start? One, two, three, four. So let's say this starts at two. And let's do grid row end and one, two, three, four. Let's do four. And occasionally I actually get these mixed up. Uh, yeah, there we go. Did that right. And so now we dislodged the ones that were just after it. So let's go ahead and try to touch this up. Now, sometimes when you're learning this, it's a little bit of a guesswork. Uh, but we now have row six. And so we've got one, four, five, and six. Let's go ahead and get rid of, I don't know, Let's just get rid of nine. Let's get rid of nine. Okay, that's nice. Uh, let's go ahead and merge four and five together. So we want item four and five together. So let's do item four. And we're merging columns together. So we want to do grid column start. And this is one over here, two over here, three, four. So we want two to four. 
and we can do this. Okay, that works. Now let's do the same with five and seven because uh, da, 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 da. let's yeah, let's see what happens when we do five and seven. We can do the same thing, item five, and this is just applying the same sort of styling. And now we can see that this is all dislodged. It's, it's looking pretty good. Uh, let's go ahead and merge seven and eight together. And let's get rid of eight. And so we want seven to look like item number one up here. And we can actually start to reuse things because item one and item seven are going to have the exact same layout in the sense that I want item seven here to take up this whole width. And item one is going to take up the whole width. So we might as well reuse this styling. Now, we have something to work with here. We have a header up here. We have a footer down here. We have perfect spacing. We have a navigation section or maybe an advertisement section. We've got some content for the top content, maybe like a summary section and the content of the page. And so that's how you make a page layout using grid. And so grid gets vastly more complex than this as well. But this is a really, really good start to learning how to use grid. Now, when you're creating a page in the future, try to use grid as your page layout module. You can use Flexbox. You can technically use tables and floats, display in line, block. You can do all sorts of stuff. But try to use grid from now on. Or if you don't want to use grid, you can always use Flexbox. Both are completely acceptable from here on out. But what I would like you to do is I want you to try and create a layout like this. Now, what I want you to do is make your brain sweat. Don't reference my code, although you have access to it. Don't reference my code. I want you to try and remember how to do this. And if you don't remember, I want you to go and get some practice Googling how to do this. Remember, just the terms are what you need to know. Go ahead, give that a shot. If you get really stuck or you want to join a community, you can always join the Learning to Code Facebook group. We're here to help. Your final project is going to be find a really nice website design and replicate it as much as you possibly can. You're going to run into a plethora of hurdles. It's going to be really hard. It's going to be really good practice. I would say just do the best that you possibly can uh, and just have some fun with it. If, if you can't make it perfect, that's totally fine. So what I would like you to do Open up your favorite browser, go to Pinterest.com, and just type in web design or web design inspiration, web design layout, anything like that. Uh, let's do web design inspiration. And create a nice looking site. You know all the pieces, and don't forget to break things down into smaller components. Don't try to look at a page and be like, oh, I don't know how to do all that. Break it down into small components. So a good one would be like this one. And this is a Squarespace website template, apparently. But what you can do is you now know how to make this navigation up here. You know how to make things center. You know how to select these, the center element for your logo. You know how to make a hero. You know about padding and margin. So you have this section covered already. Down here, we have uh, like a little card. You have that section covered already. So just style. It doesn't need to be functional. It doesn't need to be an actual carousel and slide and everything. Uh, but you do want to make sure that it does have like a background color, that the layout's nice. You can try adding in arrows and things like that. Uh, this section here would also use a grid. This is a really good candidate for grid. And then you just use background images. So you can go ahead and get started with something like that. If you don't want to do that particular site, that's totally okay. You don't need to find that one either. Uh, you can go and you know, if you're feeling really spicy, you can try to do something like this with all the angles. Uh, you can use uh, transform to skew things, to rotate things, to use like uh, this section here would actually be a square. And then it would just be rotated a little bit and so that it meets right in the middle. Um, yeah, give that a shot. Don't forget to break things down. Like this could be flexbox. This would be flexbox, not necessarily grid, but flexbox. And this one would just have a margin top of an extra like 50 pixels. So what I would like you to do is go ahead and give this a shot uh, and just try to break it down piece by piece. Don't, don't try to tackle all of it all at once. Maybe tonight you try to do like the navigation and tomorrow you try to do the hero section and the next day you try to do the next section. Take your time with it. Have some fun with it. Uh, and really try to get into the nitty gritty of CSS. Everything you've learned in this course is applicable to these style of designs. These designs are pretty wild, actually. Uh, and to be totally honest, this is a very, very advanced design. Um, so maybe, you know, if you're not feeling comfortable, don't start with that one. But you can start with something like this. This is a really good one. 
It has your navigation, it has a header, it's got a button in there. Uh, it's got different font sizes, different font types. Uh, you've got different styles in here. So this could be Flexbox as well, or floating or position relative or position absolute. Um, you can try anything like that. I would say try one of these. If you want to start with something easier, I would say go to rocketman.learnwagtail.com and just try to recreate this site. Just this page, not all of it, not all the pages on here, uh, just this page. So you've got navigation in here, it's nice and simple. You've got background image with a uh, gradient on top. You've got a button, you've got different text, you've got different fonts, so custom web fonts. And here we have Flexbox, we have two cards side by side. Uh, in here we would have two cards side by side, but this one's using position relative and position absolute to sort of bump it over just a little bit so it's layered on top using a Z index. Uh, same thing with this, just the opposite way. Instead of moving left, this section is moving right. And in here we could use grid or flexbox. I would suggest flexbox for this one. And then you could use grid down here. Go ahead and give that a shot. Uh, I know it's a lot to take in, but honestly, and I cannot stress this enough, start small. Start with just a navigation. Start with just the header. Take your time on it. Google a lot. Ask a lot of questions. I'm here for you. The Learning to Code Facebook uh, community. They're all here for you. Go ahead and give this a shot and feel free to share your progress along the way.